Section thirty of Tom Jones. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kalinda. Tom Jones by Henry Fielding. Chapter seven. Containing better reasons than any which have yet appeared for the conduct of Partridge, an apology for the weakness of Jones, and some further anecdotes concerning my landlady. Though Partridge was one of the most superstitious of men, he would hardly perhaps have desired to accompany Jones on his expedition merely from the omens of the joint-stool and the white mare, if his prospect had been no better than to have shared the plunder gained in the field of battle. In fact, when Partridge came to ruminate on the relation he had heard from Jones, he could not so reconcile to himself that Mr. Allworthy should turn his son, for so he most firmly believed him to be, out of doors, for any reason which he had heard assigned. He concluded, therefore, that the whole was a fiction, and that Jones, of whom he had often from his correspondence heard the wildest character, had in reality run away from his father. It came into his head, therefore, that if he could prevail with the young gentleman to return back to his father, he should by that means render a service to Allworthy which would obliterate all his former anger. Nay, indeed, he conceived that very anger was counterfeited, and that Allworthy had sacrificed him to his own reputation. And this suspicion, indeed, he well accounted for, from the tender behaviour of that excellent man to the founding child, from his great severity to Partridge, who, knowing himself to be innocent, could not conceive that any other should think him guilty. Lastly, from the allowance which he had privately received long after the annuity had been publicly taken from him, and which he looked upon as a kind of smart money, or rather by way of atonement for injustice, for it is very uncommon, I believe, for men to ascribe the benefactions they receive to pure charity, when they can possibly impute them to any other motive. If he could by any means, therefore, persuade the young gentleman to return home, he doubted not but that he should again be received into the favour of Allworthy, and well rewarded for his pains nay, and should be again restored to his native country, a restoration which Ulysses himself never wished more heartily than poor Partridge. As for Jones, he was well satisfied with the truth of what the other had asserted, and believed that Partridge had no other inducements but love to him, and zeal for the cause, a blamable want of caution and diffidence in the veracity of others, in which he was highly worthy of censure. To say the truth, there are but two ways which men become possessed of this excellent quality— the one is from long experience, and the other is from nature, which last, I presume, is often meant by genius, or great natural parts, and it is infinitely the better of the two, not only as we are masters of it much earlier in life, but as it is much more infallible and conclusive, for a man who hath been imposed on by ever so many may still hope to find others more honest, whereas he who receives certain necessary admonitions from within, that this is impossible, must have very little understanding indeed, if he ever renders himself liable to be once deceived. As Jones had not this gift from nature, he was too young to have gained it by experience, for at the diffident wisdom which is to be acquired this way, we seldom arrive till very late in life, which is perhaps the reason why some old men are apt to despise the understandings of all those who are a little younger than themselves. Jones spent most part of the day in the company of a new acquaintance. This was no other than the landlord of the house, or rather the husband of the landlady. He had but lately made his descent downstairs, after a long fit of the gout, in which distemper he was generally confined to his room during one half of the year, and during the rest he walked about the house, smoked his pipe, and drank his bottle with his friends, without concerning himself in the least with any kind of business. He had been bred, as they call it, a gentleman, that is, bred up to do nothing, and had spent a very small fortune, which he inherited from an industrious farmer, his uncle, in hunting, horse-racing, and cock-fighting, and had been married by my landlady for certain purposes which he had long since desisted from answering, for which she hated him heartily. But as he was a surly kind of fellow, so she contented herself with frequently upbraiding him by disadvantageous comparisons with her first husband, whose praise she had eternally in her mouth, and as she was for the most part mistress of the prophet, so she was satisfied to take upon herself the care and government of the family, and after a long successless struggle to suffer her husband to be the master of himself. In the evening, when Jones retired to his room, a small dispute arose between this fond couple concerning him. "'What,' says the wife, "'you have been tippling with the gentleman, I see.' "'Yes,' answered the husband, "'we have cracked a bottle together, and a very gentlemanlike man he is, and hath a very pretty notion of horse-flesh. Indeed he is young, and hath not seen much of the world.' for I believe he hath been at very few horse-races. "'Oh, ho! he is one of your order, is he?' replied the landlady. "'He must be a gentleman to be sure, if he is a horse-racer. The devil fetch such gentry. I am sure I wish I have never seen any of them. I have reason to love horse-racers truly. 
"'That you have,' says the husband, "'for I was one, you know.' "'Yes,' answered she, "'you are a pure one indeed. "'As my first husband used to say, "'I may put all the good I have ever got by you in my eyes, "'and see never the worse.' "'Damn your first husband,' cries he. "'Don't damn a better man than yourself,' answered the wife. "'If he had been alive, you durst not have done it.' "'Then you think,' he said, "'I have not so much courage as yourself, "'for you have damned him often enough in my hearing.' "'If I did,' says she, "'I have repented of it many's the good time and oft. "'And if he was so good to forgive me a word spoken in haste or so, "'it doth not become such a one as you to twitter me. "'He was a husband to me, he was, "'and if ever I did make use of an ill word or so in a passion, "'I never called him rascal. "'I should have told a lie if I had called him rascal.' "'Much more,' she said, but not in his hearing, "'for having lighted his pipe he staggered off as fast as he could.' We shall, therefore, transcribe no more of her speech, as it approached still nearer and nearer to a subject too indelicate to find any place in this history. Early in the morning Partridge appeared at the bedside of Jones, ready equipped for the journey, with his knapsack at his back. This was his own workmanship, for besides his other trades he was no indifferent tailor. He had already put up his whole stock of linen in it, consisting of four shirts, to which he now added eight for Mr. Jones, and then packing up the portmanteau, he was departing with it towards his own house, but was stopped in his way by the landlady, who refused to suffer any removals till after the payment of the reckoning. The landlady was, as we have said, absolute governess in these regions. It was therefore necessary to comply with her rules, so the bill was presently writ out, which amounted to a much larger sum than might have been expected from the entertainment which Jones had met with. But here we are obliged to disclose some maxims which publicans hold to be the grand mysteries of their trade. The first is, if they have anything good in their house, which indeed very seldom happens, to produce it only to persons who travel with great equipage. Secondly, to charge the same for the very worst provisions, as if they were the best. And lastly, if any of their guests call but for little, to make them pay a double price for everything they have, so that the amount by the head may be much the same. The bill being made and discharged, Joan set forward with Partridge, carrying his knapsack, nor did the landlady condescend to wish him a good journey, for this was, it seems, an inn frequented by people of fashion, and I know not whence it is, but all those who get their livelihood by people of fashion contract as much insolence to the rest of mankind as if they really belonged to that rank themselves. CHAPTER Eight. Jones arrives at Gloucester and goes to the Bell, the character of that house, and of a petty fogger which he there meets with. Mr. Jones and Partridge, or Little Benjamin, which epithet of Little was perhaps given him ironically, him, he being in reality near six feet high, having left their last quarters in the manner before described, travelled on to Gloucester without meeting any adventure worth relating. Being arrived here, they chose for their house of entertainment the sign of the bell, an excellent house indeed, and which I do most seriously recommend to every reader who shall visit this ancient city. The master of it is brother to the great preacher Whitefield, but is absolutely untainted with the pernicious principles of Methodism, or of any other heretical sect. He is indeed a very honest plain man, and in my opinion not likely to create any disturbance either in church or state. His wife hath, I believe, had much pretension to beauty, and is still a very fine woman. Her person and deportment might have made a shining figure in the politest assemblies, but though she must be conscious of this and many other perfections, she seems perfectly contented with, and resigned to, that state of life to which she is called, and this resignation is entirely owing to the prudence and wisdom of her temper, for she is at present as free from any methodistical notions as her husband. I say at present, for she freely confesses that her brother's documents made at first some impression upon her, and that she had put herself to the expense of a long hood, in order to attend the extraordinary emotions of the spirit. But having found, during an experiment of three weeks, no emotions, she says, worth a farthing, she very wisely laid by her hood, and abandoned the sect. To be concise, she is a very friendly, good-natured woman, and so industrious to oblige, that the guests must be of a very morose disposition, who are not extremely well satisfied in her house. Mrs. Whitefield happened to be in the yard when Jones and his attendant marched in. Her sagacity soon discovered in the air of our hero something which distinguished him from the vulgar. She ordered her servants, therefore, immediately to show him into a room, and presently afterwards invited him to dinner with herself, which invitation he very thankfully accepted, for indeed much less agreeable company than that of Mrs. Whitefield, and a much worse entertainment than she had provided, would have been welcome after so long fasting and so long a walk." Besides Mr. Jones and the good governess of the mansion, there sat down at table an attorney of Salisbury, indeed the very same who had brought the news of Mrs. Bliffle's death to Mr. Allworthy, 
and whose name, which I think we did not before mention, was Dowling. There was likewise present another person, who styled himself a lawyer, and who lived somewhere near Linlinch, in Somersetshire. This fellow, I say, styled himself a lawyer, but was indeed a most vile pettifogger, without sense or knowledge of any kind, one of those who may be termed train-bearers to the law, a sort of supernumeraries in the profession, who are the hackneys of attorneys, and will ride more miles for half a crown than a post-boy. During the time of dinner the Somersetshire lawyer re recollected the face of Jones, which he had seen at Mr. Allworthy's, for he had often visited in that gentleman's kitchen. He therefore took occasion to inquire after the good family there with that familiarity which would have become an intimate friend or acquaintance of Mr. Allworthy, and indeed he did all in his power to insinuate himself to be such, though he had never had the honour of speaking to any person in that family higher than the butler. Jones answered all his questions with much civility, though he never remembered to have seen the pettifogger before, and though he concluded, from the outward appearance and behaviour of the man, that he usurped a freedom with his betters, to which he was by no means entitled. As the conversation of fellows of this kind is of all others the most detestable to men of any sense, the cloth was no sooner removed than Mr. Jones withdrew, and a little barbarously left poor Mrs. Whitefield to do a penance, which I have often heard Mr. Timothy Harris, and other publicans of good taste, lament, as the severest lot annexed to their calling, namely, that of being obliged to keep company with their guests. Jones had no sooner quitted the room than the pettifogger, in a whispering tone, asked Mrs. Whitefield if she knew who that fine spark was. She answered she had never seen the gentleman before. "'The gentleman, indeed,' replied the pettifogger, "'a pretty gentleman, truly. Why, he's the bastard of a fellow who was hanged for horse-stealing. He was dropped at Squire Allworthy's door, where one of the servants found him in a box so full of rain-water that he would certainly have been drowned, had he not been reserved for another fate.' "'Ay, ay, you need not mention it, I protest. We understand what that fate is very well,' cries Dowling, with a most facetious grin. "'Well,' continued the other, "'the squire ordered him to be taken in, for he is a timbersome man, everybody knows, and was afraid of drawing himself into a scrape. And there the bastard was bred up, and fed, and clothified all to the world like any gentleman, and there he got one of the servant-maids with child, and persuaded her to swear it to the squire himself, and afterwards he broke the arm of one Mr. Thwackham, a clergyman, only because he reprimanded him for following whores, and afterwards he snapped a pistol at Mr. Bliffill behind his back, and once, when Squire Allworthy was sick, he got a drum and beat it all over the house to prevent him from sleeping, and twenty other pranks he hath played, for all which, about four or five days ago, just before I left the country, the squire stripped him stark naked and turned him out of doors. "'And very justly, too, I protest,' cries Dowling. "'I would turn my own son out of doors if he was guilty of half as much. And pray what is the name of this pretty gentleman?' "'The name on?' answered the pettifogger. "'Why, he is called Thomas Jones.' "'Jones!' answered Dowling a little eagerly. "'What, Mr. Jones that lived at Mr. Allworthy's? "'Was that the gentleman that dined with us?' "'The very same,' said the other. "'I have heard of that gentleman,' cried Dowling. "'Often, but I never heard any ill character of him.' and i am sure says mrs whitefield if half of what this gentleman hath said be true mr jones hath the most deceitful countenance i ever saw for sure his looks promise something very different and i must say for the little i have seen of him he is as civil a well-bred man as you would wish to converse with pettifogger calling to mind that he had not been sworn as he usually was before he gave his evidence now bound what he had declared with so many oaths and imprecations that the landlady's ears were shocked and she put a stop to his swearing by assuring him of her belief. Upon which he said, I hope, madam, you imagine I would scorn to tell such things of any man, unless I knew them to be true. What interest have I in taking away the reputation of a man who never injured me? I promise you every syllable of what I have said is fact, and the whole country knows it. As Mrs. Whitefield had no reason to suspect that the pettifogger had any motive or temptation to abuse Jones, the reader cannot blame her for believing what he so confidently affirmed with many oaths. She accordingly gave up her skill in physiognomy, and henceforwards conceived so ill an opinion of her guest that she heartily wished him out of her house. This dislike was now farther increased by a report which Mr. Whitefield made from the kitchen, where Partridge had informed the company that though he carried the knapsack and contented himself with staying among servants, while Tom Jones, as he called him, was regaling in the parlour, he was not his servant, but only a friend and companion, and as good a gentleman as Mr. Jones himself. Dowling sat all this while silent, biting his fingers, making faces, grinning, and looking wonderfully arch. At last he opened his lips, and protested that the gentleman looked like another sort of man. 
He then called for his bill with the utmost haste, declared he must be at Hereford that evening, lamented his great hurry of business, and wished he could divide himself into twenty pieces in order to be at once in twenty places. The petty fogger now likewise departed, and then Jones desired the favour of Mrs. Whitefield's company to drink tea with him, but she refused, and with a manner so different from that which she had received him at dinner, that it a little surprised him. And now he soon perceived her behaviour totally changed, for instead of that natural affability which we have before celebrated, she wore a constrained severity on her countenance which was so disagreeable to Mr. Jones that he resolved, however late, to quit the house that evening. He did indeed account somewhat unfairly for this sudden change, for besides some hard and unjust surmises concerning female fickleness and mutability, he began to suspect that he owed this want of civility to his want of horses, a sort of animals which, as they dirty no sheets, are thought in inns to pay better for their beds than their riders, and are therefore considered as the more desirable company. But Mrs. Whitefield, to do her justice, had a much more liberal way of thinking. She was perfectly well-bred, and could be very civil to a gentleman, though he walked on foot. In reality she looked on our hero as a sorry scoundrel, and therefore treated him as such, for which not even Jones himself, had he known as much as the reader, could have blamed her. Nay, on the contrary, he must have approved her conduct, and have esteemed her the more for the disrespect shown towards himself. This is indeed a most aggravating circumstance, which attends depriving men unjustly of their reputation, for a man who is conscious of having an ill character cannot justly be angry with those who neglect and slight him, but ought rather to despise such as affect his conversation, unless where a perfect intimacy must have convinced them that their friend's character hath been falsely and injuriously aspersed. This was not, however, the case of Jones, for as he was a perfect stranger to the truth, so he was with good reason offended at the treatment he received. He therefore paid his reckoning and departed, highly against the will of Mr. Partridge, who, having remonstrated much against it to no purpose, at last condescended to take up his knapsack and to attend his friend. CHAPTER Nine, CONTAINING SEVERAL DIALOGUES BETWEEN JONES AND PARTRIDGE, CONCERNING LOVE, COLD, HUNGER, AND OTHER MATTERS, WITH THE LUCKY AND NARROW ESCAPE OF PARTRIDGE, AS HE WAS ON THE VERY BRINK OF MAKING A FATAL DISCOVERY TO HIS FRIEND. The shadows began now to ascend larger from the high mountains. The feathered creation had betaken themselves to their rest. Now the highest order of mortals were sitting down to their dinners, and the lowest order to their suppers. In a word, the clock struck five just as Mr. Jones took his leave of Gloucester, an hour at which, as it was now midwinter, the dirty fingers of night would have drawn her sable curtain over the universe, had not the moon forbid her, who now, with a face as broad and as red as those of some jolly mortals, who, like her, turned night into day, began to rise from her bed where she had slumbered away the day, in order to sit up all night. Jones had not travelled far before he paid his compliments to that beautiful planet, and, turning to his companion, asked him if he had ever beheld so delicious an evening. Partridge making no ready answer to his question, he proceeded to comment on the beauty of the moon, and repeated some passages from Milton, who hath certainly excelled all other poets in his description of the heavenly luminaries. He then told Partridge the story from the spectator of two lovers who had agreed to entertain themselves when they were at a great distance from each other by repairing at a certain fixed hour to look at the moon, thus pleasing themselves with the thought that they were both employed in contemplating the same object at the same time. Those lovers, added he, must have had souls truly capable of feeling all the tenderness of the sublimest of all human passions. Very probably, cries Partridge, but I envy them more if they had had bodies incapable of feeling cold, for I am almost frozen to death, and am very much afraid I shall lose a piece of my nose before we get to another house of entertainment. Nay, truly, we may well expect some judgment should happen to us for our folly in running away so by night from one of the most excellent inns I have ever set my foot into. I am sure I never saw more good things in my life, and the greatest lord in the land cannot live better in his own house than he may there. And to forsake such a house, and go a-rambling about the country, the lord knows whither, per diva rura viarum, I say nothing for my part. But some people might not have charity enough to conclude we were in our sober senses. Fie upon it, Mr. Partridge, says Jones, have a better heart. Consider you are going to face an enemy, and are you afraid of facing a little cold? I wish indeed we had a guide to advise us which of these roads we should take. May I be so bold, says Partridge, to offer my advice? Inter dum stultus opportuna loquitur. Why, which of them, cries Jones, would you recommend? Truly, neither of them, answered Partridge. The only road we can be certain of finding is the road we came. A good hearty pace will bring us back to Gloucester in an hour, but if we go forward the Lord Harry knows when we shall arrive at any place, for I see at least fifty miles before me, and no house in all the way. 
"'You see, indeed, a very fair prospect,' says Jones, "'which receives great additional beauty from the extreme luster of the moon. "'However, I will keep the left-hand track, "'as that seems to lead directly to those hills "'which we were informed lie not far from Worcester. "'And here, if you were inclined to quit me, you may, and return back again. "'But for my part I am resolved to go forward.' "'It is unkind in you, sir,' says Partridge, "'to suspect me of any such intention. "'What I have advised hath been as much on your account as on my own, "'but since you are determined to go on, "'I am as much determined to follow. "'E pre sequarte. "'They now travelled some miles without speaking to each other, "'during which suspense of discourse Jones often sighed, "'and Benjamin groaned as bitterly, "'though from a very different reason. "'At length Jones made a full stop, and turning about, cries, who knows, Partridge, but the loveliest creature in the universe may have her eyes now fixed on the very moon which I behold at this instant. Very likely, sir, answered Partridge, and if my eyes were fixed on a good sirloin of roast beef, the devil might take the moon and her horns into the bargain. Did ever Tramontaine make such an answer? cries Jones. Prithee, Partridge, wast thou ever susceptible of love in thy life, or hath time worn away all the traces of it from thy memory? "'Alack a day!' cries Partridge. "'Well would it have been for me if I had never known what love was. "'In fandom regina ubes renovare dolorum. "'I am sure I have tasted all the tenderness and sublimities and bitternesses of the passion.' "'Was your mistress unkind, then?' says Jones. "'Very unkind, indeed, sir,' answered Partridge, "'for she married me, and made one of the most confounded wives in the world. "'However, heaven be praised, she's gone.' and if I believed she was in the moon, according to a book I once read, which teaches that to be the receptacle of departed spirits, I would never look at it for fear of seeing her. But I wish, sir, that the moon was a looking-glass for your sake, and that Miss Sophia Western was now placed before it. "'My dear Partridge,' cries Jones, "'what a thought was there, a thought which I am certain could never have entered into any mind but that of a lover. Oh, Partridge, could I hope once again to see that face? But alas!' All those golden dreams are vanished for ever, and my only refuge from future misery is to forget the object of all my former happiness. "'And do you really despair of ever seeing Miss Western again?' answered Partridge. "'If you will follow my advice, I will engage you shall not only see her, but have her in your arms.' "'Ha! Do not awaken a thought of that nature,' cries Jones. "'I have struggled sufficiently to conquer all such wishes already.' "'Nay,' answered Partridge, "'if you do not wish to have your mistress in your arms, you are a most extraordinary lover indeed.' "'Well, well,' says Jones, "'let us avoid this subject. "'But pray, what is your advice?' "'To give it to you in the military phrase, then,' says Partridge, "'as we are soldiers, to the right about. "'Let us return the way we came. "'We may yet reach Gloucester to-night, though late, "'whereas if we proceed we are likely, for aught I see, "'to ramble about for ever without coming either to a house or home. "'I have already told you my resolution is to go on,' answered Jones, "'but I would have you go back.' I am obliged to you for your company hither, and I beg you to accept a guinea as a small instance of my gratitude. Nay, it would be cruel in me to suffer you to go any farther, for to deal plainly with you, my chief end and desire is a glorious death in the service of my king and country. As for your money, replied Partridge, I beg, sir, you will put it up. I will receive none of you at this time, for at present I am, I believe, the richer man of the two. And as your resolution is to go on, so mine is to follow you if you do. "'Nay, now my presence appears absolutely necessary to take care of you, since your intentions are so desperate. For I promise you my views are much more prudent. As you are resolved to fall in battle if you can, so I am resolved as firmly to come to no hurt if I can help it. And indeed I have the comfort to think there will be but little danger, for a popish priest told me the other day the business would soon be over, and he believed without a battle.' "'A popish priest,' cried Jones, "'I have heard, is not always to be believed when he speaks in behalf of his religion.' "'Yes, but so far,' answered the other, "'from speaking in behalf of his religion, "'he assured me the Catholics did not expect to be any gainers by the change, "'for that Prince Charles was as good a Protestant as any in England, "'and that nothing but regard to right made him and the rest of the Popish party to be Jacobites.' "'I believe him to be as much a Protestant as I believe he hath any right,' says Jones, "'and I make no doubt of our success, but not without a battle, "'so that I am not so sanguine as your friend the Popish priest.' "'Nay, to be sure, sir,' answered Partridge, "'all the prophecies I have ever read speak of a great deal of blood to be spilt in the quarrel, and the miller with three thumbs, who is now alive, is to hold the horses of three kings up to his knees in blood. Lord, have mercy upon us all, and send better times.' "'With what stuff and nonsense hast thou filled thy head?' answered Jones. "'This, too, I suppose, comes from the popish priest. Monsters and prodigies are the proper arguments to support monstrous and absurd doctrines. The cause of King George is the cause of liberty and true religion.' 
In other words, it is the cause of common sense, my boy, and I warrant you will succeed, though Briarius himself was to rise again with his hundred thumbs and to turn Miller. Partridge made no reply to this. He was indeed cast into the utmost confusion by this declaration of Jones, for to inform the reader of a secret, which he had no proper opportunity of revealing before, Partridge was in truth a Jacobite, and had concluded that Jones was of the same party, and was now proceeding to join the rebels. An opinion which was not without foundation, for the tall, long-sided dame mentioned by Hudibras, that many-eyed, many-tongued, many-mouthed, many-eared monster of Virgil, had related the story of the quarrel between Jones and the officer, with the usual regard to truth. She had indeed changed the name of Sophia into that of the pretender, and had reported that drinking his health was the cause for which Jones was knocked down. This partridge had heard, and most firmly believed. Tis no wonder, therefore, that he had thence entertained the above-mentioned opinion of Jones, and which he had almost discovered to him before he found out his own mistake. And at this the reader will be the less inclined to wonder if he pleases to recollect the doubtful phrase in which Jones first communicated his resolution to Mr. Partridge, and indeed, had the words been less ambiguous, Partridge might very well have construed them as he did, being persuaded as he was that the whole nation were of the same inclination in their hearts. Nor did it stagger him that Jones had travelled in the company of soldiers, for he had the same opinion of the army which he had of the rest of the people. But however well affected he might be to James or Charles, he was still much more attached to little Benjamin than to either, for which reason he no sooner discovered the principles of his fellow-traveller than he thought proper to conceal and outwardly give up his own to the man who, on whom he depended for the making his fortune, since he by no means believed the affairs of Jones to be so desperate as they really were with Mr. Allworthy. For as he had kept a constant correspondence with some of his neighbours since he left that country, he had heard much, indeed more than was true, of the great affection Mr. Allworthy bore this young man, who, as Partridge had been instructed, was to be that gentleman's heir, and whom, as we have said, he did not in the least doubt to be his son. He imagined, therefore, that whatever quarrel was between them, it would be certainly made up at the return of Mr. Jones, an event from which he promised great advantages. If he could take this opportunity of ingratiating himself with that young gentleman, and if he could by any means be instrumental in procuring his return, he doubted not, as we have before said, but it would as highly advance him in the favour of Mr. Allworthy. We have already observed that he was a very good-natured fellow, and he hath himself declared the violent attachment he had to the person and character of Jones, but possibly the views which I have just before mentioned might likewise have some little share in prompting him to undertake this expedition, at least in urging him to continue it, after he had discovered that his master and himself, like some prudent fathers and sons, though they travelled together in great friendship, had embraced opposite parties. I am led into this conjecture by having remarked that though love, friendship, esteem, and such like, have very powerful operations in the human mind, Interest, however, is an ingredient seldom omitted by wise men, when they would work others to their own purposes. This is indeed a most excellent medicine, and, like Ward's pill, flies at once to the particular part of the body on which you desire to operate, whether it be the tongue, the hand, or any other member, where it scarce ever fails of immediately producing the desired effect. End of section 30. Recording by Kalinda in Raymond, New Hampshire, on October twenty eighth, two 2007. Section thirty one of Tom Jones. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nikki Sullivan. Tom Jones by Henry Fielding. Chapter ten. In which our travellers meet with a very extraordinary adventure. Just as Jones and his friend came to the end of their dialogue in the preceding chapter, they arrived at the bottom of a very steep hill. Here Jones stopped short, and, directing his eyes upward, stood for a while silent. At length he called to his companion, and said, "'Partridge, I wish I was at the top of this hill. It must certainly afford a most charming prospect, especially by this light. For the solemn gloom which the moon casts on all objects is beyond expression beautiful, especially to an imagination which is desirous of cultivating melancholy ideas.' "'Very probably,' answered Partridge. "'But if the top of the hill be properest to produce melancholy thoughts, "'I suppose the bottom is the likeliest to produce merry ones, "'and these I take to be much the better of the two. 
I protest you have made my blood run cold with the very mentioning of the top of that mountain, which seems to me to be one of the highest in the world. No, no, if we look for anything, let it be for a place underground to screen ourselves from the frost. Do so, said Jones. Let it be but within hearing range of this place, and I will hollow to you when I return back. Surely, sure, you are not mad, said Partridge. Indeed I am answered Jones, if ascending this hill is madness. But as you complain so much of the cold already, I would have you stay below. I will certainly return to you within an hour. Oh, pardon me, sir, cries Partridge. I have determined to follow you wherever you go. Indeed, he was now afraid to stay behind, for though he was coward enough in all respects, yet his chief fear was that of ghosts, with which the present time of night and the wildness of the place, extremely well suited. At this instant Partridge espied a glimmering light through some trees, which seemed very near to them. He immediately cried out in rapture, "'Oh, sir, heaven hath at last heard my prayers, and hath brought us to a house. Perhaps it may be an inn. Let me beseech you, sir, if you have any compassion either for me or for yourself, do not despise the goodness of Providence, but let us go directly to yon light. Whether it be a public house or no, I am sure, if they be Christians that dwell there, they will not refuse a little house-room to persons in our miserable condition. Jones at length yielded to the earnest supplications of Partridge, and both together made directly towards the place whence the light issued. They soon arrived at the door of this house, or cottage, for it might be called either, with much impropriety. Here Jones knocked several times without receiving any answer from within, at which Partridge, whose head was full of nothing but ghosts, devils, witches, and the like, began to tremble, crying, "'Lord, have mercy on us! Surely the people must be all dead! I can see no light neither now, and yet I am certain I saw a candle burning a moment before.' "'Well, I have heard of such things.' "'What hast thou heard of?' said Jones. "'The people are either fast asleep, or, probably, as this is a lonely place, are afraid to open the door.' He then began to vociferate pretty loudly, and at last an old woman, opening an upper casement, asked who they were and what they wanted. Jones answered, they were travellers who had lost the way, and having seen a light in the window, had been led thither in hopes of finding some fire to warm themselves. "'Whoever you are,' cries the woman, "'you have no business here, nor shall I open the door to any one at this time of night.' Partridge, whom the sound of human voice had recovered from his fright, fell to the most earnest supplications to be admitted for a few minutes of fire, saying he was almost dead with cold." to which fear had indeed contributed equally with the forest. He assured her that the gentleman who spoke to her was one of the greatest squires in the country, and made use of every argument save one which Jones afterward effectually added, and this was the promise of half a crown, a bribe too great to be resisted by such a person, especially as the genteel appearance of Jones, which the light of the moon plainly discovered to her, together with his affable behavior, had entirely subdued those apprehensions of thieves which she had at first conceived. She agreed, therefore, at last, to let them in, where Partridge, to his infinite joy, found a good fire ready for his reception. The poor fellow, however, had no sooner warmed himself than those thoughts, which were always uppermost in his mind, began a little to disturb his brain. There was no article of his creed in which he had stronger faith than he had in witchcraft. Nor can the reader conceive of a figure more adapted to inspire this idea than the old woman who now stood before him. She answered exactly to that picture drawn by Otway and his orphan. Indeed, if this woman had lived in the reign of James I, her appearance alone would have hanged her, almost without any evidence. Many circumstances likewise conspired to confirm Partridge in his opinion. Her living, as he then imagined, by herself in so lonely a place— and in a house the outside of which seemed much too good for her, but its inside was furnished with the most neat and elegant manner. To say the truth, Jones himself was not a little surprised at what he saw, for, besides the extraordinary neatness of the room, it was adorned with a great number of knick-knacks and curiosities, which might have engaged the attention of a virtuoso. 
While Jones was admiring these things, Partridge sat trembling with the firm belief that he was in the house of a witch. The old woman said, "'I hope, gentlemen, that you will make what haste you can, for I expect my master presently, and I would not for double the money he should find you here.' "'Then you have a master?' cried Jones. "'Indeed, you will excuse me, good woman, but I was surprised to see all those fine things in your house.' "'Ah, sir,' she said, if the twentieth part of these things were mine, I should think myself a rich woman. But pray, sir, do not stay much longer, for I look for him in every minute. Why, sure he would not be angry with you, said Jones, for doing a common act of charity. Lack a day, sir, said she, he is a strange man, not at all like other people. He keeps no company with anybody, and seldom walks out by night, for he doth not care to be seen and all the country people are as much afraid of meeting him, for his dress is enough to frighten those who are not used to it. They call him the Man of the Hill, for there he walks by night. And the country people are not, I believe, more afraid of the devil himself. He would be terribly angry if he found you here. Pray, sir, says Partridge, don't let us offend the gentleman. I am ready to walk, and was never warmer in my life. Do pray, sir, let us go. Here are pistols over by the chimney. Who knows whether they be charged or no, or what he may do with them. "'Fear nothing, Partridge,' cries Jones. "'I will secure thee from danger. "'Nay, for matter of that, he never doth any mischief,' says the woman. "'But to be sure, it is necessary he should keep some arms for his own safety, "'for this house have been beset more than once, "'and it is not many nights ago that we thought we heard thieves about it. "'For my own part, I have often wondered that he is not murdered by some villain or other, "'as he walks out by himself at such hours. "'But then, as I said, the people are afraid of him. And besides, they think, I suppose, he has nothing about him worth taking. "'I should imagine, by this collection of rarities,' cried Jones, "'that your master had been a traveller.' "'Yes, sir,' answered she. "'He hath been a very great one. There are few gentlemen that know more of all matters than he. I fancy he hath been crossed in love, or whatever it is I know not. But I have lived with him above these thirty years, and in all that time he hath hardly spoke to six living people. She then again solicited their departure, in which she was backed by Partridge. But Jones purposefully protracted the time, for his curiosity was greatly raised to see this extraordinary person. Though the old woman, therefore, concluded every one of her answers with desiring him to be gone, and Partridge proceeded so far as to pull him by the sleeve, he still continued to invent new questions, till the old woman, with an unfrightened countenance, declared she heard her master's signal, and at the same instant more than one voice was heard without the door, crying, "'Dun your blood! Show us your money this instant! Your money, you villain, or we will blow your brains about your ears!' "'Oh, good heavens!' cried the woman. "'Some villains, to be sure, have attacked my master. What shall I do?' how cried jones how are these pistols loaded oh good sir there is nothing in them indeed oh pray don't murder us gentlemen for in reality she now had the same opinion of those within as she had of those without jones made her no answer but snatching an old board sword which hung in the room he instantly sallied out where he found the old gentleman struggling with two ruffians and begging for mercy jones asked no questions but fell so briskly to work with his broadsword that the fellows immediately quitted their hold and without offering to attack our hero betook themselves to their heels and made their escape for he did not attempt to pursue them being contented with having delivered the old gentleman and indeed he concluded he had pretty well done their business for both of them as they ran off cried out with bitter oaths that they were dead men jones presently ran to lift up the old gentleman who had been thrown down in the scuffle, expressing at the same time great concern lest he should have received any harm from the villains. The old man stared a moment at Jones, and then cried, "'No, sir, no, I have very little harm, thank you. Lord, have mercy upon me.' "'I see, sir,' said Jones, "'you are not free from apprehensions, even of those who have had the happiness to be your deliverers. No, nor can I blame any suspicions which you may have. But, indeed, you have no real occasion for any. Here are none but your friends present. Having missed our way this cold night, we took the liberty of warming ourselves at your fire, whence we were just departing when we heard you call for assistance, which, I must say, Providence alone seems to have sent you. Providence, indeed, cried the old gentleman, if it be so. So it is, I assure you, cried Jones. Here is your own sword, sir. I have used it in your defence, and— and I now return it to your hand. 
The old gentleman, having received the sword, which was stained with the blood of his enemies, looked steadfastly at Jones during some moments, and then, with a sigh, cried out, "'You will pardon me, young gentleman. I was not always a suspicious temper, nor am I a friend to ingratitude.' "'Be thankful, then,' cries Jones, "'to that providence to which you owe your deliverance. As to my part, I have only discharged the common duties of humanity in what I would have done for any other fellow-creature in your situation. Let me look at you a little longer, cries the old gentleman. You are a human creature, then? Well, perhaps you are. Come, pray, walk into my little hut. You have been my deliverer, indeed. The old woman was distracted between the fears which she had of her master and for him, and Partridge was, if possible, in a greater fright. The former of these, however— when she heard her master speak kindly to Jones, and perceived what had happened, came again to herself. But Partridge no sooner saw the gentleman than the strangeness of his dress infused greater terrors into that poor fellow than he had fe before felt, either from the strange descriptions which he had heard, or from the uproar which had happened at the door. To say the truth, it was an appearance which might have affected a more constant mind than that of Mr. Partridge. This person was of the tallest size, with a long beard as white as snow. His body was clothed with the skin of an ass, made something into the form of a coat. He wore likewise boots on his legs, and a cap on his head, both composed of the skin of some other animals. As soon as the old gentleman came into his house, the old woman began her congratulations on his happy escape from the ruffians. "'Yes,' cried he, "'I have escaped, indeed, thanks to my preserver. Oh, the blessing on him!' answered she. He is a good gentleman, I warrant him. I was afraid your worship would have been angry with me for letting him in, and to be certain I should not have done it, and had not I seen by the moonlight that he was a gentleman, and almost frozen to death. But to be certain, it must have been some good angel that sent him hither, and tempted me to do it. I am afraid, sir, said the old gentleman to Jones, that I have nothing in this house which you can either eat or drink, unless you will accept a dram of brandy, of which I can give you some most excellent, and which I have had by me these thirty years. Jones declined this offer in a very civil and proper speech, and then the other asked him whither he was travelling when he missed his way, saying, I must own myself surprised to see such a person as you appear to us, journeying on foot at this time of night. I suppose, sir, you are a gentleman of these parts, for you do not look like one who is used to travel far without horses. Appearances, cried Jones, are often deceitful. Men sometimes look what they are not. I assure you I am not of this country, and whither I am travelling, in reality, I scarce knows myself. Whoever you are, or whithersoever you are going, answered the old man, I have obligations to you which I can never return. I once more, repeated, replied Jones, affirm that you have none, for there can be no merit in having hazarded that in your service on which I set no value, and nothing is so contemptible in my eyes as life. I am sorry, young gentleman, answered the stranger, that you have any reason to be so unhappy at your years. Indeed I am, sir, the most unhappy of mankind. Perhaps you have had a friend or a mistress, replied the other. How could you, cried Jones, mention two words sufficient to drive me to distraction? Either of them are enough to drive any man to distraction, answered the old man. I inquire no farther, sir. Perhaps my curiosity has led me too far already. Indeed, sir, cries Jones, I cannot censure a passion which I feel at this instant in the highest degree. You will pardon me when I assure you that everything which I have seen or heard since I first entered this house hath conspired to raise the greatest curiosity in me. Something very extraordinary must have determined you to this course of life, and I have reason to fear your own history is not without misfortunes. Here the old gentleman again sighed, and remained silent for some minutes. At last, looking earnestly on Jones, he said, I have read that a good countenance is a letter of recommendation. If so, none ever can be more strongly recommended than yourself. If I did not feel some yearnings towards you from another consideration, I must be the most ungrateful monster upon the earth, and I am really concerned it is no otherwise in my power than by words to convince you of my gratitude. Jones, after a moment's hesitation, answered, 
that it was in his power by words to gratify him extremely. "'I have confessed a curiosity,' said he. "'Sir, need I say how much obliged I should be to you, if you would condescend to gratify it? Will you suffer me, therefore, to beg, unless any consideration restrains you, that you should be pleased to acquaint me what motives have induced you thus to withdraw from the society of mankind, and to betake yourself to the course of life to which it sufficiently appears you were not born? I scarcely think myself at liberty to refuse you anything after what hath happened, replied the old man. If you desire, therefore, to hear the story of an unhappy man, I will relate it to you. Indeed, you judge rightly, and thinking there is commonly something extraordinary in the fortunes of those who fly from society. For however it may seem a paradox, or even a contradiction, certain it is that great philanthropy chiefly inclines us to avoid and detest mankind, not on account of so much of their private and selfish vices, but for those of a relative kind, such as envy, malice, treachery, cruelty, with every other species of malevolence. These are vices which true philanthropy abhors, and which rather than see and converse with, she avoids society itself. However, without a compliment to you, do you not appear to me one of those whom I should shun or detest? Nay, I must say, in what little hath dropped from you, there appears some parity in our fortunes. I hope, however, yours will conclude more successfully." Here some compliments passed between our hero and his host, and then the latter was going to begin his story, when Partridge interrupted him. His apprehensions had now pretty well left him, but some effects of his terrors remained. He therefore reminded the gentleman of that excellent brandy which he had mentioned. This was presently brought, and Partridge swallowed a large bumper. The gentleman then, without any further preface, began as you may read in the next chapter. CHAPTER Eleven, IN WHICH THE MAN OF THE HILL BEGINS TO RELATE HIS HISTORY. I was born in a village of Somersetshire, called Mark, in the year of 1657. My father was one of those whom they call the gentleman farmers. He had a little estate of about three hundred pounds a year, of his own, and rented another estate of near the same value. He was prudent and industrious, and so good a husbandman that he might have led a very easy and comfortable life, had not an errant vixen of a wife soured his domestic quiet. But though his circumstance perhaps made him miserable, it did not make him poor, for he confined her almost entirely at home, and rather chose to bear eternal upbraidings in his own house than to injure his fortune by indulging her in the extravagancies she desired abroad. By this Xanthippe, so was the wife of Socrates called, said Partridge. By this Xanthippe he had two sons, of which I was the younger. He designed to give us both good education, but my elder brother, who, unhappily for him, was the favorite of my mother, utterly neglecting his learning, insomuch that, after having been five or six years at school with little or no improvement, my father, being told by his master that it would be to no purpose to keep him longer there, at last complied with my mother in taking him home from the hands of that tyrant as she called his master, though indeed he gave the lad much less correction than his idleness deserved, but much more, it seems, than the young gentleman liked, who consistently complained to his mother of his severe treatment, and she as constantly gave him a hearing. "'Yes, yes,' cries Partridge. "'I have seen such mothers. I have been abused myself by them.' and very unjustly such parents deserve correction as much as their children. Jones chid the pedagogue for his interruption, and then the stranger proceeded. My brother now, at the age of fifteen, bade adieu to all learning, and to everything else but to his dog and gun, with which the latter he became so expert that, though perhaps you may think it incredible, he could not only hit a standing mark with great certainty, but hath actually shot a crow as it was flying in the air. He was likewise excellent at finding a hare sitting, and was soon reputed one of the best sportsmen in the country, a reputation which both he and his mother enjoyed as much as if he had been thought the finest scholar. The situation of my brother made me at first think my lot the harder, in being continued at school. But I soon changed my opinion, for as I advanced pretty fast in learning, my labors became easy, and my exercise so delightful that holidays were my most unpleasant time. For my mother, 
who never loved me, now apprehending that I had the greater share of my father's affection, and finding, or at least thinking, that I was more taken notice of by some gentlemen of learning, and particularly by the person of the parish, than my brother, she now hated my sight, and made home so disagreeable to me, that what is called by schoolboys Black Monday was to me the whitest in the whole year. Having at length gone to the school at Taunton, I was thence removed to Exeter College in Oxford, where I remained four years, at the end of which an accident took me off entirely from my studies, and hence I may truly date the rise of all which happened to me afterward in life. There was at the same college with myself one Sir George Grisham, a young fellow who was entitled to a very considerable fortune, which he was not, by the will of his father, to come into full possession till he arrived at the age of twenty-five. However, the liberality of his guardians gave him little cause to regret the abundant caution of his father, for they allowed him five hundred pounds a year while he remained at the university, where he kept his horses in his whore, and lived as wicked and as profligate a life as he could have done, had he been never so entirely master of his fortune. For besides the five hundred a year which he had received from his guardians, he found means to spend a thousand more. He was above the age of twenty-one and had no difficulty in gaining what credit he pleased. This young fellow, among many other tolerable bad qualities, had one very diabolical. He had a great delight in destroying and ruining the youth of inferior fortune, by drawing them into expenses which they could not afford so well as himself. And the better, and worthier, and soberer any young man was, the greater pleasure and triumph he had in his destruction, thus acting the character which is recorded of the devil, and going about, seeking whom he might devour. It was my misfortune to fall into the acquaintance and intimacy with this gentleman. My reputation of diligence in my studies made me a desirable object of his mischievous intention, and my own inclination made it sufficiently easy for him to effect his purpose. For though I had applied myself with much industry to books, in which I took great delight, there were other pleasures in which I was capable of taking much greater. For I was high meted had a violent flow of animal spirits, was a little ambitious, and extremely amorous. I had not long contracted an intimacy with Sir George before I became a partaker of all his pleasure, and when I was once entered on that scene, neither my inclination nor my spirit would suffer me to play an under part. I was second to none in the company in acts of debauchery. Nay, I soon distinguished myself so notably in all riots and disorders that my name generally stood first in the role of delinquents, and instead of being lamented at this unfortunate pupil of Sir George, I was now accused as the person who had misled the debauched and hopeful young gentleman. For though he was the ringleader and promoter of all the mischief, he was never so considered. I fell at last under the censure of the vice-chancellor, and very narrowly escaped expulsion. You will easily believe, sir, that such a life as I am now describing must be incompatible with my further progress in learning, and that in proportion as I addicted myself more and more to loose pleasure, I must grow more and more remiss in application to my studies. This was truly the consequence, but this was not all. My expenses now greatly exceeded not only my former income, but those additions which I had extorted from my poor generous father, on pretenses of sums being necessary for preparing for my approaching degree of the Bachelor of Arts. These demands, however, grew at last so frequent and exorbitant, that my father, by slow degrees, opened his ears to the accounts which he received from many quarters of my present behavior, and which my mother failed not to echo very faithfully and loudly, adding, I, this is the fine gentleman, the scholar who doth so much honor to his family, and is to be the making of it. I thought what all this learning would come to. He is to be the ruin of us all, I find, after his elder brother hath been denied necessaries for his sake, to perfect his education forsooth, for which he was to pay us such interests. I thought what the interest would come to, with much more of the same kind, but I have, I believe, satisfied you with this taste." My father, therefore, began now to return remonstrances, instead of money, to my demands, which brought my affairs perhaps a little sooner to a crisis. But had he remitted me his whole income, you will imagine it could have sufficed a very short time to support one who kept pace with the expense of Sir George Grisham. It is more than possible 
that the distress I was now in for money, and the impracticability of going on in this manner, might have restored me at once to my senses and to my studies, had I opened my eyes before I became involved in the debts from which I saw no hopes of ever extricating myself. This was indeed the great art of Sir George, and by which he accomplished the ruin of many, whom he afterwards laughed at as fools and coxcombs, for vying, as he called it, with the man of his fortune. To bring this about, he would now and then advance a little money himself, in order to support the credit of the unfortunate youth with other people, till, by means of that very credit, he was irretrievably undone. My mind being, by these means, grown as desperate as my fortune, there was scarce a wickedness which I did not meditate in order for my relief. Self-murder itself became the subject of my serious deliberation, and I had certainly resolved on it, had not a more shameful, though perhaps less sinful, thought expelled it from my head. He hesitated a moment, and then cried out, I protest so many years have not washed away the shame of this act, and I shall blush while I relate it. Jones desired him to pass over anything that might give him pain in relation. But Partridge eagerly cried out, Oh, pray, sir, let us hear this. I had rather hear this than all the rest. As I hope to be saved, I will not mention a word of it. Jones was going to rebuke him, but the stranger prevented it by proceeding thus. I had a chum, a very prudent, frugal young lad, who, though he had no very large allowance, had by his parsimony heaped upwards of forty guineas, which I knew he kept in his escotoir. I took, therefore, the, an opportunity of purloining his key from his breeches pocket, while he was asleep, and thus made myself master of all his riches, after which I again conveyed his key into his pocket, and counterfeiting sleep, though I never once closed my eyes, lay in bed till after he arose and went to prayers, an exercise to which I had long been accustomed. Timorous thieves, by extreme caution, often subject themselves to discoveries, which those of a bolder kind escape. Thus it happened to me. For I had boldly broke open his escritoire. I had, perhaps, escaped him his suspicion. But as it was plain that the person who robbed him had possessed himself of his key, he had no doubt, when he first missed the money, but that his chum was certainly the thief. Now, as he was of a fearful disposition, and much my inferior in strength, and I believe in courage, he did not dare to confront me with my guilt for fear of worse bodily consequences which might happen to him. He repaired, therefore, immediately to the vice-chancellor, and upon swearing to the robbery, into the circumstances of it, very easily obtained a warrant against one who had now so bad a character through the whole university. Luckily for me, I lay out of the college the next evening. For that day I attended a young lady in a chase to Whitney, where we stayed all night, and on our return the next morning to Oxford, I met one of my cronies, who acquainted me with sufficient news concerning myself to make me turn my horse another way. A pray, sir, did he mention anything of the warrants? said Partridge. But Jones begged the gentleman to proceed without regarding any impertinent questions, which he did as follows. Having now abandoned all thoughts of returning to Oxford, the next thing which offered itself was the journey to London. I imparted this intention to my female companion, who at first remonstrated against it. But upon producing my wealth, she immediately consented. We then struck across the country, into the great Siren Center Road, and made such haste that we spent the next evening, save one, in London. When you consider the place where I now was, and the company with whom I was, you will, I fancy, conceive that a very short time brought me to the end of that sum of which I had so iniquitously possessed myself. I was now reduced to a much higher degree of distress than before. The necessities of life began to be numbered among my wants, and what made my case still the more grievous was, that my paramour, of whom I was now grown immoderately fond, shared the same distresses with myself. To see a woman you love in distress, to be unable to relieve her, and at the same time to reflect that you have brought her into this situation, is perhaps a curse of which no imagination can represent the horrors to those who have not felt it. I believe it from my soul cries Jones, and I pity you from the bottom of my heart, and then took two or three disorderly turns about the room, and at last begged pardon, and flung himself into his chair, crying, I thank heaven I have escaped that. This circumstance, continued the gentleman, so severely aggravated the horrors of my present situation, 
that they became absolutely intolerable i could with less pain endure the raging of my own natural unsatisfied appetites even hunger or thirst than i could submit to leave ungratified the most whimsical desires of a woman on whom i so extravagantly doted that though i knew she had been the mistress of half my acquaintance i firmly intended to marry her but the good creature was unwilling to consent to an action which the world might think so much to my disadvantage and as possibly she compassionated the daily anxieties which she must have perceived me suffer on her account she resolved to put an end to my distress she soon indeed found means to relieve me from my troublesome and perplexed situation for while i was distracted with various inventions to supply her with pleasures she very kindly betrayed me to one of her former lovers at oxford by whose care and diligence i was immediately apprehended and committed to jail here i first began to seriously reflect on the miscarriages of my former life on the errors i had been guilty of on the misfortunes which i had brought on myself and on the grief which i must have occasioned to one of the best of fathers when i added to all these the perfidy of my mistress such was the horror of my mind that life instead of being longer desirable grew the object of my abhorrence and i could have gladly embraced death as my dearest friend if it had offered itself to my choice unattended by shame the time of the assizes soon came and i was removed by habeas corpus to oxford where i expected certain conviction and condemnation but to my great surprise none appeared against me and i was at the end of the sessions discharged for want of prosecution in short my chum had left oxford and whether from indolence or from what other motive i am ignorant had declined concerning himself any farther in the affair uh, perhaps cries partridge he did not care to have your blood upon his hands as he was in his right aunt if any person was to be hanged upon my evidence i should never be able to lie alone afterwards for fear of seeing his ghost i shall surely doubt partridge says jones whether thou art more brave or wise you may laugh at me sir if you please answered partridge but if you will hear a very short story which i can tell and which is most certainly true perhaps you may change your opinion in the parish where i was born here jones would have silenced him but the stranger interceded that he might be permitted to tell his story and in the meantime promised to recollect the remainder of his own partridge then proceeded thus in the parish where i was born there lived a farmer whose name was bridal and he had a son named francis a good hopeful young fellow i was at grammar school with him where i remember he was got into ovid's epistles and he could construe you three lines together sometimes without looking into the dictionary besides all this he was a very good lad and never missed church on sundays and was reckoned one of the best palm singers in the whole parish he would indeed now and then take a cup too much and that was the only fault he had well but come to the ghost cried jones never fear sir i shall come to him soon enough answered partridge you must know then that farmer bridal lost a mare a sorrel one to the best of my remembrance and so it fell out that this young francis shortly afterward being at a fair in hinden and as i think it was on i can't remember the day and being as he was what should he happen to meet but a man upon his father's mare frank called out presently stop thief and it being in the middle of the fair it was impossible you know for the man to t make his escape so they apprehended him and carried him before the justice i remember it was justice willoughby of noil a very worthy good gentleman and he committed him to prison and bound frank in a recognizance i think they called it a hard word compounded of a re in a cognoso mm, but it differs in its meaning from the use of the simple as may other compounds do well at last down came my lord justice page to hold the assizances and so the fellow was had up and frank was had up for witness to be sure i shall never forget the face of the judge when he began to ask him what he had to say against the prisoner he made poor frank tremble and shake in his shoes well you fellow says my lord what have you to say don't stand humming and hawing but speak out but however he soon turned altogether as civil to frank and began to thunder at the fellow 
and when he asked him if he had anything to say for himself, the fellow said, he had found the horse. "'Aye,' answered the judge. "'Thou art a lucky fellow. "'I have travelled the circuit these forty years, "'and have never found a horse in my life. "'I'll tell you what, friend, "'thou wast more lucky than thou didst know of, "'for thou didst not only find a horse, "'but a halter too, I promise thee. "'But to be sure, I shall never forget the word, "'upon which everybody fell laughing, "'as how could they help it? "'Nay, in the twenty other jests he made, "'which I can't remember now.' There was something about his skill in horse-flesh which made all the folks laugh. To be certain, the judge must have been a very brave man, as well as a man of much learning. It is indeed charming sport to hear the trials upon life and death. One thing I own, I thought, a little hard, that the prisoner's counsel was not suffered to speak for him, though he desired only to be heard one very short word, but my lord would not hearken to him, though he suffered a counsellor to talk against him, for above half an hour. I thought it hard, I own, that there should be so many of them, my lord, in the court, the jury, and the jury, and the counsellors, and the witnesses, all upon one poor man, and he too in chains. Well, the poor fellow was hanged, as to be sure it could be no otherwise, and poor Frank could never be easy about it. He never was in the dark alone, but he fancied he saw the fellow's spirit. "'Well, is this thy story?' cries Jones. "'No, no,' answered Partridge. "'O oh, Lord, have mercy upon me. I am just now coming to the matter. For one night, coming from the alehouse, in a long, narrow, dark lane, there he ran directly up against him, and the spirit was all in white, and fell upon Frank, and Frank, who was a sturdy lad, fell upon the spirit again, and there they had a tussle together.' and poor Frank was dreadfully beat. Indeed, he made a shift at last to crawl home. But what with the beating, and what with the fright, he lay ill above a fortnight. And all this is more certainly true, and the whole parish will bear witness to it. The stranger smiled at this story, and Jones burst into a loud fit of laughter, upon which Partridge cried, Ah, you may laugh, sir, but so did some others, particularly the squire, who was thought to be no better than an atheist, for who, forsooth, because there was a calf with a white face, found dead in the same lane the next morning, would fain have it that the battle was between Frank and that, as if a calf would set upon a man. Besides, Frank told me he knew it to be the spirit, and he could swear to him in any court in Christendom, and he had not drank above a quart or two, or such a matter of liquor, at the time." Lord, have mercy upon us, and keep us all from dipping our hands into blood, I say. <sighs> well, sir, said Jones to the stranger, Mr. Partridge has finished his story, and I hope you will give no further interruption, if you will be so kind as to proceed. He then resumed his narration, but as he had taken a breath for a while, we think it proper to give it to our reader, and shall therefore put an end to this chapter. Chapter 12 in which the man of the hill continues his history. I had now regained my liberty, said the stranger, but had lost my reputation, for there is a wide difference between the case of a man who is barely acquitted of a crime in the court of justice, and of him who is acquitted in his own heart, and in the opinion of other people. I was conscious of my guilt, and ashamed to look at any one in the face. So resolved to leave Oxford the next morning before the daylight discovered me to the eyes of any beholders. When I had got clear of the city, it first entered into my head to return home to my father and endeavour to attain his forgiveness. But as I had no reason to doubt his knowledge of all which had passed, as I was well assured of his great aversion to all acts of dishonesty, I could entertain no hopes of being received by him, especially since I was too certain of all the good offices in the power of my mother. Nay, I had my father's pardon, to be sure, as I conceived his resentment to be. I yet questioned whether I could have had the assurance to behold him, or whether I could, upon any terms, have submitted to live and converse with those who, I was convinced, knew me to have been guilty of so base an action. I hastened, therefore, to London— the best retirement of either grief or shame, unless for persons of a very public character. For here you have the advantage of solitude without its disadvantage, since you may be alone and in company at the same time, 
and while you walk or sit unobserved noise hurry and a constant succession of objects entertain the mind and prevent the spirits from preying on themselves or rather on grief or shame which are the most unwholesome diet in the world and on which though there are many who never taste either but in public there are some who can feed very plentifully and very fatally when alone but as there is scarce any human good without its concomitant evil so there are people who find an inconvenience in this unobserving temper of mankind i mean persons who have no money for as you are not put out of countenance so neither are you clothed or fed by those who do not know you and a man may be as easily starved in Leadenhall market as in the deserts of arabia it was at present my fortune to be destitute of that great evil as it is apprehended to be by several writers who i suppose were overburdened with it namely money with submission sir said partridge i do not remember any writers who have called it malorum but irretimenta malorum effo denunter opeth irretimento malorum well sir continued the stranger whether it be an evil or only the cause of evil i was entirely void of it and at the same time of friends and as i thought of acquaintance when one evening as i was passing through the inner temple very hungry and very miserable i heard a voice on a sudden hailing me with great familiarity by my christian name and upon turning about i presently recollected the person who so saluted me to have been my fellow collegiate one who had left university above a year and long before any of my misfortunes had befallen me this gentleman whose name was watson shook me heartily by the hand and expressing great joy at meeting me proposed our immediate drinking a bottle together i first declined the proposal and pretended business but he was very earnest in pressing hunger at last overcame my pride and i fairly confessed to him i had no money in my pocket yet not without framing a lie for an excuse and imputing it to having changed my breeches that morning mr watson answered i thought jack you and i had been two old acquaintances for you to mention such a matter he then took me by the arm and was pulling me along but i gave him very little trouble for my own inclinations pulled me much stronger than he could do we then went into the friars which you know is the scene of all mirth and jollity here when we arrived at the tavern mr watson applied himself to the drawer only without taking the least notice of the cook for he had no suspicion but that i had dined long since however as the case was really otherwise i forged another falsehood and told my companion i had been at the further end of the city on business of consequence and had snapped up a mutton chop in haste so that i was again hungry and wished he would add a beefsteak to his bottle some people cries partridge ought to have good memories or did you find just enough money in your breeches to pay for the mutton chop your observation is right answered the stranger and i believe such blunders are inseparable from all dealing and untruth but to proceed i began now to feel myself extremely happy the meat and wine soon revived my spirits to a high pitch and i enjoyed much pleasure in the conversation of an old acquaintance the rather as i had thought him entirely ignorant of what had happened at the university since his leaving it but he did not suffer me to remain long in this agreeable delusion for taking a bumper in one hand and holding me by the other here my boy cries he here's wishing you joy of being so honorably acquitted of that affair laid to your charge i was thunderstruck with confusion at those words which watson observing proceeded thus nay never be ashamed man thou hast been acquitted and no one now dares call thee guilty but pray thee do tell me who am thy friend i hope thou didst really rob him for wrap me if it was not a meritorious action to strip such a sneaking pitiful rascal and instead of the two hundred guineas i wish you had taken as many thousand come come my boy don't be shy of confessing it to me you are not now brought before one of the pimps done me if i don't honour you for it for as i hope for salvation i would have made no manner of scruple of doing the same thing this declaration a little relieved my abashment and as wine had now somewhat opened my heart i very freely acknowledged the robbery but acquainted him that he had been misinformed as to the sum taken which was little more than a fifth the part of what he had mentioned i am sorry for it with all my heart quoth he and i wish thee better success another time 
though, if you will take my advice, you shall have no occasion to run any such risk. Here, said he, taking some dice out of his pocket, here's the stuff. Here are the implements. Here are little doctors which cure the distempers of the purse. Follow my counsel, and I will show you a way to empty the pocket of a queer call without any danger of nubbing cheat. Nubbing cheat, cries Partridge. Pray, sir, what is that? Why, that, sir, said the stranger. It's a cant phrase for the gallows. For, as gamesters differ little from highwaymen in their morals, so do they very much resemble them in their language. We now each drank our bottle, when Mr. Watson said, the board was sitting, and he must attend, earnestly pressing me at the same time to go with him and try my fortune. I answered he knew that was present out of my power, as I had informed him of the emptiness of my pocket. To say the truth, I doubted not, from his many strong expressions of friendship, but that he would have offered to lend me a small sum for that purpose, but he answered, And never mind that, man. Even bully run in Levant. Partridge was going to inquire the meaning of that word, but Jones stopped his mouth. But be circumspect as to the man. I will tip you to the proper person, which may be necessary, as you do not know the town, nor can distinguish a rum call from a queer one. The bill was now brought, when Watson paid his share and was departing. I reminded him, not without blushing, of my having no money. He answered, That signifies nothing. Score it behind the door, or make a bold brush and take no notice. Or, Stay, says he. I will go downstairs first, and then do you take up my money and score the whole reckoning at the bar, and I will wait for you at the corner. I expressed some dislike at this, and hinted my expectation that he would have deposited the whole, but he swore he had not another sixpence in his pocket. He then went down, and I was prevailed on to take up the money and follow him, which I did close enough to hear him tell the drawer the reckoning was upon the table. The drawer passed me upstairs. But I made such haste into the street that I heard nothing of the disappointment, nor did I mention a syllable at the bar according to my instructions. We now went directly to the gaming table, where Mr. Watson, to my surprise, pulled out a large sum of money and placed it before him, as did many others, all of them, no doubt, considering their own heaps as so many decoy birds, which were to entice and draw over the heaps of their neighbors. Here it would be tedious to relate all of the freaks which fortune— or rather the dice, played in this her temple. Mountains of gold were in a few moments reduced to nothing at one part of the table, and rose as suddenly in another. The rich grew in a moment poor, and the poor as suddenly became rich, so that it seemed a philosopher could nowhere have so well instructed his pupils in the contempt of riches. At least he could nowhere have better inculcated the uncertainty of their duration. For my own part, after having considerably improved my small estate, I at last entirely demolished it. Mr. Watson, too, after much variety of luck, rose from the table in some heat and declared he had lost a cool hundred and would play no longer. Then coming up to me, he asked me to return with him to the tavern, but I positively refused, saying I would not bring myself for the second time into such a dilemma, and especially as he had lost all his money and was now in my own condition. Pooh, says he, I have just borrowed a couple of guineas from a friend, and one of them is at your service. He immediately put one of them into my hand, and I no longer resisted his inclination. I was at first a little shocked in returning to the same house whence we had departed in so unhandsome a manner. But when the drawer, with very civil address, told us he believed we had forgot to pay our reckoning, I became perfectly easy and very readily gave him a guinea bid him pay himself, and acquiesced in the unjust charge which had been laid on my memory. Mr. Watson now bespoke the most extravagant supper he could well think of, and though he had contented himself with simple claret before, nothing now but the most precious burgundy would serve his purpose. Our company was soon increased by the addition of several gentlemen from the gaming table, most of whom, as I afterwards found, came not to the tavern to drink, but in the way of business. For the true gamesters pretended to be ill and refused their glass, while they plied heartily two young fellows, who were to be afterwards pillaged, 
as indeed they were without mercy. Of this plunder I had a good fortune to be a sharer, though I was not yet let into the secret. There was one remarkable accident attended this tavern play, for the money by degrees totally disappeared, so that though at the beginning the table was half covered with gold, yet before the play ended, which it did not till the next day, being Sunday at noon, there was scarce a single guinea to be seen on the table, and this was a stranger, as every person present except myself declared he had lost, and what was become of the money, unless the devil himself carried it away, it is difficult to determine. Uh, most certainly he did, says Partridge, for evil spirits can carry away anything without being seen, though there was never so many folk in a room and I should not have been surprised if he had carried away all the company of a set of wicked wretches who were all at play in sermon time. And I could tell you a true story, if I would, where the devil took a man out of bed from another man's wife and carried him away through the keyhole of a door. I've seen this very house where it was done, and nobody hath lived in it these thirty years. Though Jones was a little offended by this impertinence of Partridge, he could not, however, avoid smiling at his simplicity. The stranger did the same, and then proceeded with his story, as will be seen in the next chapter. End of section 31. Recording by Nikki Sullivan, Chicago. Section 32 of Tom Jones. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nikki Sullivan. Tom Jones by Henry Fielding. Chapter 13. In which the foregoing story is farther continued. My fellow collegiate had now entered me into a new scene of life. I soon became acquainted with the whole fraternity of sharpers, and was let into their secrets. I mean into the knowledge of those gross cheats which are proper to impose upon the raw and unexperienced, for there are some tricks of a finer kind, which are known only to a few of the gang who are at the head of their profession, a degree of honour beyond my expectation. For drink, to which I was immoderately addicted, and the natural warmth of my passions prevented me from arriving at any great success in the art which requires as much coolness as the most austere school of philosophy. And Mr. Watson, with whom I now lived in the closest amity, had unluckily the former failing to a very great excess, so that instead of making fortune by his profession, as some others did, he was alternately rich and poor, and was often obliged to surrender to his cooler friends, over a bottle which they never tasted, that plunder that he had taken from calls in the public table. However, we both made a shift to pick up an uncomfortable livelihood, and for two years I continued of this calling during which time I tasted all the varieties of fortune, sometimes flourishing in affluence, and at others being obliged to struggle with almost incredible difficulties, to-day wallowing in luxury, and to-morrow reduced to the coarsest and most homely fare, my fine clothes being often on my back in the evening, and at the pawn-shop the next morning. One night, as I was returning penniless from the gaming-table, I observed a very great disturbance, and a large mob gathering together in the street. As I was in no danger from pickpockets, I ventured into the crowd, where upon inquiry I found that a man had been robbed and very ill-used by some ruffians. The wounded man appeared very bloody, and seemed scarce able to support himself on his legs. As I had not therefore been deprived of my humanity by my present life and conversation, though they had left me very little of either honesty or shame, I immediately offered my assistance to the unhappy person who thankfully accepted it, and putting himself under my conduct, begged me to convey him to some tavern where he might send for a surgeon, being, as he said, faint with loss of blood. He seemed indeed highly pleased at finding one who appeared in the dress of a gentleman, for as to all the rest of the company present, their outside was such that he could not wisely place any confidence in them. I took the poor man by the arm, and led him to the tavern where we kept our rendezvous, as it happened to be the nearest at hand. A surgeon happening luckily to be in the house, immediately attended and applied himself to dressing his wounds which I had the pleasure to hear were not likely to be mortal. This surgeon, whose name I have forgot, though I remember it began with an R, had the first character in his profession, 
and was sergeant surgeon to the king. He had moreover many good qualities, and was very generous and good-natured man, and ready to do any service to his fellow-creatures. He offered his patient the use of his chariot to carry him to his inn, and at the same time whispered in his ear that if he want any money, he would furnish him. The poor man was not now capable of returning thanks for this generous offer, for having had his eyes for some time steadfastly on me, he threw himself back in his chair, crying, "'Oh, my son! my son!' and then he fainted away. Many of the people present imagined this accident had happened through his loss of blood. But I, who at the same time began to recollect the features of my father, was now confirmed in my suspicions, and satisfied that it was he himself who appeared before me. I presently ran to him, raised him in my arms, and kissed his cold lips with the utmost eagerness. Here I must draw a curtain over a scene which I cannot describe, for though I did not lose my being— as my father for a while did, my senses were, however, so overpowered with affright and surprise, that I am a stranger to what passed during some minutes, and indeed till my father had again recovered from his swoon, and I found myself in his arms, both tenderly embracing each other, while the tears trickled apace down the cheeks of each of us. Most of those present seemed affected by this scene, which we, who might be considered as the actors in it, were desirous of removing from the eyes of all spectators as fast as we could. My father therefore accepted the kind offer of the surgeon's chariot, and I attended him in it to his inn. When we were alone together, he gently upbraided me for having neglected to write him during so long a time, but entirely omitted the mention of that crime which had occasioned it. He then informed me of my mother's death, and insisted on my returning home with him, saying that he had long suffered the greatest anxiety on my account, that he knew not whether he had most feared my death or wished it, since he had so many more dreadful apprehensions for me. At last, he said, a neighboring gentleman, who had just recovered a son from the same place, informed him where I was, and that to reclaim me from this course of life was the sole cause of his journey to London. He thanked heaven he had succeeded so far as to find me out by means of an accident which had like to have proved fatal to him, and had the pleasure to think he partly owed his preservation to my humanity, which he professed himself to be more delighted than he should have been with my filial piety, if I had known that the object of my care was my own father. Vice I had not so depraved my heart as to excite it in an insensibility of so much paternal affection though so unworthily bestowed. I presently promised to obey his commands in my return home with him, as soon as he was able to travel, which indeed he was in a very few days, by the assistance of that excellent surgeon who had undertaken his cure. The day preceding my father's journey, before which time I scarce ever left him, I went to take my leave of some of my most intimate acquaintance, particularly of Mr. Watson, who dissuaded me from burying myself, as he called it, out of a simple compliance with the fond desires of a foolish old fellow. Such solicitations, however, had no effect. Such solicitations, however, had no effect, and I once more saw my own home. My father now greatly solicited me to think of marriage, but my inclinations were utterly averse to any such thoughts. I had tasted of love already, and perhaps you know the extravagant excess of that most tender and most violent passion. Here the old gentleman paused, and looked earnestly at Jones, whose countenance, within a minute's space, displayed the extremities of both red and white, upon which the old man, without making any observations, renewed his narrative. Being now provided with all the necessities of life, I betook myself once again to study, and that with a more inordinate application than I had ever done formerly. The books, which now employed my time solely, were those— as well Antian as modern, which treat of true philosophy, a word which is by many thought to be the subject only of farce and ridicule. I now read over the works of Aristotle and Plato, with the rest of those inestimable treasures which Antian Greece had bequeathed to the world. These authors, though they instructed me in no science by which men may promise to themselves to acquire the least riches or worldly power, taught me, however, the art of despising the highest acquisitions of both. They elevate the mind, 
and steel and harden it against the capricious invasions of fortune. They not only instruct in the knowledge of wisdom, but confirm men in their habits, and demonstrate plainly that this must be our guide, if we propose ever to arrive at the greatest worldly happiness, or to defend ourselves with any intolerable security against the misery which everywhere surrounds and invests us. To this I added another study, compared to which all the philosophy taught by the wisest heathens is little better than a dream, and is indeed as full of vanity as the silliest jester ever pleased to represent it. This is that divine wisdom which is alone to be found in the holy scriptures, for they impart to us knowledge and assurance of things much more worthy our attention than all which this world can offer to our acceptance of things which heaven itself hath condescended to reveal to us, and to the smallest knowledge of which the highest human wit unassisted could never ascend. I began now to think that all the time I had spent with the best heathen writers was little more than labor lost, for, however pleasant and delightful their lessons may be, or however adequate to the right regulation of our conduct with respect to this world only, yet, when compared with the glory revealed in Scripture, their highest documents will appear as trifling, and of as little consequence, as the rules by which children regulate their childish little games and pastime. True it is that philosophy makes us wiser, but Christianity makes us better men. Philosophy elevates and steals the mind, Christianity softens and sweetens it. The former makes us the objects of human admiration, and the latter of divine love. That ensures us of temporal, but this in eternal happiness. But I am afraid I tire you with my rhapsody. Not at all, cries Partridge. Blood forbid we should be tired with good things. I had spent, continued the stranger, about four years in the most delightful manner to myself, totally given up to contemplation, and entirely unembarrassed with the affairs of the world, when I lost the best of fathers— and one whom I so entirely loved, that my grief at his loss exceeds all description. I now abandoned my books, and gave myself up for the whole month to the effects of melancholy and despair. Time, however, the best physician of the mind, at length brought me relief. Ay, ay, tempus edex rerum, said Partridge. I then, continued the stranger, betook myself again to my former studies, which I may say perfected my cure, for philosophy and religion may be called the exercises of the mind, and when this is disordered, they are as wholesome as exercise can be to a distempered body. They do indeed produce similar effects with exercise, for they strengthen and conform the mind, till man becomes, in the noble strain of Horace, fortis et in sepso totus terris et Take rotundus, externi neg quid valet per lave morare, in quem manca root semper fortuna, meaning firm in himself, who on himself relies, polished and round, who runs his proper course, and breaks misfortune with superior force, Mr. Francis. Here Jones smiled at some conceit which intruded itself into his imagination. But the stranger, I believe, perceived it not, and proceeded thus. My circumstances were now greatly altered by the death of that best of men, for my brother, who was now become master of the house, differed so widely from me in his inclination, and our pursuits of life had been so very various, that we were the worst company to each other. But what made our living together still more disagreeable was the little harmony which could subsist between the few who resorted to me and the numerous train of sportsmen who often attended my brother from the field to the table, for such fellows, besides the noise and nonsense with which they persecute the ears of sober men, endeavor always to attack them with affront and contempt. This was so much the case, that neither I myself nor my friends could ever sit down to a meal with them without being treated with derision, because we were unacquainted with the phrases of sportsmen. For men of true learning— in almost universal knowledge, always compassionate the ignorance of others, but fellows who excel in some little, low, contemptible art, are always certain to despise those who are unacquainted with that art. 
In short, we soon separated, and I went, by the advice of a physician, to drink the bath waters, for my violent affliction, added to a sedentary life, had thrown me into a kind of paralytic disorder, for which those waters are accounted an almost certain cure. The second day after my arrival, as I was walking by the river, the sun shone so intensely hot, though it was early in the year, that I retired to the shelter of some willows, and sat down by the riverside. Here I had not been seated long before I heard a person on the other side of the willows sighing and bemoaning himself bitterly. On a sudden, having uttered a most impious oath, he cried, I am resolved to bear it no longer, and he directly threw himself into the water. I immediately started, and ran towards the place, calling at the time as loudly as I could for assistance. An angler happened, luckily, to be a-fishing a little below me, though some very high sedge had hid him from my sight. He immediately came up, and both of us together, not without some hazard of our lives, drew the body to the shore. At first we perceived no sign of life remaining, but having held the body up by the heels, for we soon had assistance enough, it discharged a vast quantity of water at the mouth, and at length began to discover some symptoms of breathing, and little afterwards to move both its hands and its legs. An apothecary, who happened to be present among others, advised that the body, which seemed now to have pretty well emptied itself of water, and which began to have many convulsive motions, should be directly taken up and carried into a warm bed. This was accordingly performed, the apothecary and myself attending. As we were going towards the inn, for we knew not the man's lodging, luckily a woman met us, who, after some violent screaming, told us that the gentleman lodged at her house. When I had seen the man safely deposited there, I left him to the care of the apothecary, who, I suppose, used all the right methods with him, for the next morning I heard he had perfectly recovered his senses. I then went to visit him, intending to search out, as well I could, the cause of his having attempted so desperate an act and to prevent, as far as I was able, his pursuing such wicked intentions for the future. I was no sooner admitted into his chamber than we both instantly knew each other, for who should this person be but my good friend Mr. Watson? Here I will not trouble you with what passed at our first interview, for I would avoid prolixity as much as possible. Pray, let us hear it all, cries Partridge. I want mightily to know what brought him to Bath. You shall hear everything material answer the stranger, and then proceeded to relate what we shall proceed to write, after we have given a short breathing time to both ourselves and the reader. CHAPTER Fourteen, IN WHICH THE MAN OF THE HILL CONCLUDES HIS HISTORY Mr. Watson, continued the stranger, very freely acquainted me that the unhappy situation of his circumstances, occasioned by a tide of ill luck, had in a manner forced him to our resolution of destroying himself. I now began to argue seriously with him, in opposition to this heathenish, or indeed diabolical, principle of the lawfulness of self-murder, and said everything which occurred to me on the subject, but, to my great concern, it seemed to have very little effect on him. He seemed not at all to repent of what he had done, and gave me reason to fear that he would make a second attempt of the like horrible kind. When I had finished my discourse, instead of endeavouring to answer my arguments, he looked me steadfastly in the face, and with a smile, said, "'You are strangely altered, my good friend, since I remember you. I question whether any of our bishops could have made a better argument against suicide than you have entertained me with. But unless you can find somebody who will lend me a cool hundred, I must either hang, or drown, or starve, and in my opinion, the last death is the most terrible of the three. I answered him very gravely that I was indeed altered since I had seen him last, that I had found leisure to look into my follies and to repent of them. I then advised him to pursue the same steps, and at last concluded with an assurance that I myself would lend him a hundred pound, if it would be of any service to his affairs, and he would not put it into the power of a die to deprive him of it. Mr. Watson, who seemed almost composed in slumber by the former part of my discourse, was roused by the latter. He seized my hand eagerly, 
gave me a thousand thanks, and declared I was a friend indeed, adding that he hoped I had a better opinion of him than to imagine he had profited so little by experience as to put any confidence in those damned dice which had so often deceived him. No, no, cries he, let me but once handsomely be set up again, and if ever fortune makes a broken merchant of me afterwards, I will forgive her. I very well understood the language of setting up and broken merchant. I therefore said to him, with a very grave face, Mr. Watson, you must endeavor to find out some business or employment by which you may produce yourself a livelihood, and I promise you, could I see any probability of being repaid thereafter, I would advance a much larger sum than what you have mentioned, to equip you in any affair and honorable calling. But as to gaming, besides the baseness and wickedness of making it a profession, you are really, to my own knowledge, unfit for it, and it will end in your certain ruin. "'Why, now, that's strange,' answered he. "'Neither you nor any of my friends would ever allow me to know anything of the matter, and yet I believe I am as good a hand at every game as any of you all, and I heartily wish I was to play with you only for your whole fortune. I should desire no better sport, and I would let you name your game into the bargain. But come, my dear boy, you have the hundred in your pocket?' I answered I had only a bill for fifty, which I delivered him, and promised to bring the rest next morning, and after giving him a little more advice, took my leave. I was indeed better than my word, for I returned to him that very afternoon. When I entered the room I found him sitting up on his bed at cards with a notorious gamester. This sight, you will imagine, shocked me not a little, to which I may add the mortification of seeing my bill delivered by him to his antagonist, and thirty guineas only given in exchange for it. The other gamester presently quitted the room, and then Watson declared he was ashamed to see me. But, says he, I find luck runs so damnably against me that I will resolve to leave off play for ever. I have thought of the kind proposal you made me ever since, and I promise you there shall be no fault in me if I do not put it in execution. Though I had no great faith in his promises, I produced him the remainder of the hundred in consequence of my own, for which he gave me a note, which was all I ever expected to see in return for my money. We were prevented from any further discourse, at present, by the arrival of the apothecary, who, with much joy in his countenance, and without even asking his patient how he did, proclaimed that there was great news arrived in a letter to himself, which he said would shortly be public, that the duke, of Monmouth was landed in the west with a vast army of Dutch, and that another vast fleet hovered over the coast of Norfolk, and was to make a descent there in order to favor the Duke's enterprise with a diversion on that side. This apothecary was one of the greatest politicians of his time. He was more delighted with the most paltry packet than with the best patient, and the highest joy he was capable of he received from having a piece of news in his possession an hour or two sooner than any other person in the town. His advices, however, were seldom authentic, for he would swallow almost anything as the truth, a humor which many made use of to impose upon him. Thus it happened with what he at present communicated, for it was known within a short time afterwards that the duke was really landed, but that his army consisted of only a few attendants, and as to the diversion in Norfolk, it was entirely false. The apothecary stayed no longer in the room than while he acquainted us with his news, and then, without saying a syllable to his patient on any other subject, departed to spread his advices all over the town. Events of this nature in the public are generally apt to eclipse all private concerns. Our discourse therefore now became entirely political. For my own part, I had been for some time very seriously affected with the danger to which the Protestant religion was so visibly exposed under a popish prince, and thought the apprehension of it alone sufficient to justify that insurrection, for no real security can ever be found against the persecuting spirit of popery when armed with power, except by the depriving it of that power, as woeful experience presently showed. You know how King James behaved after getting the better of this attempt, how little he valued either the royal word, or coronation oath, or the liberties and rights of his people. 
But all had not the sense to foresee this at first, and therefore the Duke of Monmouth was weakly supported. Yet all could feel when the evil came upon them, and therefore all united at last to drive out the king against whose exclusion a great party among us had so warmly contended during the reign of his brother, and for whom they now fought with such zeal and affection. "'What you say,' interrupted Jones, "'is very true, and it has often struck me as the most wonderful thing I ever read of in history, that so soon, after this convincing experience which brought our whole nation to join so unanimously in expelling King James, for the preservation of our religion and liberties, there should be a party among us mad enough to desire the placing his family again on the throne.' "'You are not in earnest.' answered the old man. There can be no such party. As bad an opinion as I have of mankind, I cannot believe them infatuated to such a degree. There may be some hot-headed papists led by their priests to engage in this desperate cause, and think it a holy war. But that Protestants, that are members of the Church of England, should be such apostates, such philos de se, that I cannot believe it. No, no, young man, acquainted as I am with what has passed in the world for these last thirty years, I cannot be so imposed upon to credit so foolish a tale, but I see you have a mind to sport with my ignorance. Can it be possible, replied Jones, that you have lived so much out of the world as not to know that during that time there have been two rebellions in favour of the son of King James, one of which is now actually raging in the very heart of the kingdom? At these words the old gentleman started up, and in a most solemn tone of voice conjured Jones by his maker to tell him if what he said was really true, which the other, as solemnly affirming, he walked several turns about the room in a profound silence, then cried, then laughed, and at last fell down upon his knees and blessed God in a loud thanksgiving prayer, for having delivered him from all society with human nature which could be capable of such monstrous extravagances after which being reminded by jones that he had broke off his story he resumed it again in this manner as mankind in the days i was speaking of was not yet arrived at that pitch of madness which i find they are capable of now in which to be sure i have only escaped by living alone and at distance from the contagion there was a considerable rising in favour of monmouth and my principal strongly inclined me to take the same part i determined to join him and mr watson from different motives concurring in the same resolution for the spirit of a gamester will carry a man as far upon such an occasion as the spirit of patriotism we soon provided ourselves with all necessities and went to the duke at bridgewater the unfortunate event of this enterprise you are i conclude as well acquainted with as myself i escaped together with mr watson from the battle at siegemore in which i received a slight wound we rode near forty miles together on the exeter road and then abandoning our horses scrambled as well as we could through the fields and by-roads till we arrived at a little wild hut on the common where a poor old woman took all the care of us she could and dressed my wound with salve which quickly healed it pray sir was there a wound says partridge the stranger satisfied him it was in his arm and then continued his narrative here sir said he mr watson left me the next morning in order as he pretended to get us some provision from the town of columpton but can i relate it or can you believe it this mr watson this friend this base barbarous treacherous villain betrayed me to a party of horse belonging to king james and at his return delivered me into their hands the soldiers being six in number had now seized me and were conducting me to the taunton jail but neither my present situation nor the apprehensions of what might happen to me were half so irksome to my mind as the company of my false friend who having surrendered himself was likewise considered as a prisoner though he was better treated as being to make his peace at my expense he was at first endeavoured to excuse his treachery but when he received nothing but scorn and upbraiding from me he soon changed his note abusing me as the most atrocious and malicious rebel and laid all his own guilt to my charge who as he declared had solicited and even threatened him to make him take up arms against his gracious as well as lawful sovereign 
this false evidence for in reality he had been much the forwarder of the two stung me to the quick and raised an indignation scarce conceivable by those who have not felt it however fortune at length took pity on me for as we were got a little beyond wellington in a narrow lane my guards received a false alarm that nearly fifty of the enemy were at hand upon which they shifted for themselves and left me and my betrayer to do the same that villain immediately ran from me and i am glad he did or i should have certainly endeavoured though i had no arms to have executed vengeance on his baseness i was now once more at liberty and immediately withdrawing from the highway into the fields i travelled on scarce knowing which way i went and making it my chief care to avoid all public roads and all towns nay even the most homely houses for i imagined every human creature whom i saw desirous of betraying me at last after rambling several days about the country during which the fields afforded me the same bed and the same food which nature bestows on our savage brothers of the creation i at length arrived at this place where the solitude and wildness of the country invited me to fix my abode the first person with whom i took up my habitation was the mother of this old woman with whom i remained concealed till the news of the glorious revolution put an end to all my apprehensions of danger and gave me an opportunity of once more visiting my own home and of inquiring a little into my affairs which i soon settled as agreeably to my brother as to myself having resigned everything to him for which he paid me the sum of a thousand pounds and settled on me an annuity for life his behaviour in this last instance as in all others was selfish and ungenerous i could not look on him as my friend nor indeed he desired that i should so i presently took my leave of him as well as my other acquaintances and from that day to this my history is little better than a blank and is it possible sir said jones that you have resided here from that day to this oh no sir answered the gentleman i have been a great traveller and there are few parts of europe with which i am not acquainted i have not sir cried jones that assurance to ask it of you now indeed it would be cruel after so much breath as you have already spent but you will give me leave to wish for some further opportunity of hearing the excellent observations which a man of your sense and knowledge of the world must have in so long a course of travels indeed young gentleman answered the stranger i will endeavour to satisfy your curiosity on this head likewise as far as i am able jones attempted fresh apologies but was prevented and while he and partridge sat with greedy and impatient ears the stranger proceeded as in the next chapter chapter fifteen a brief history of europe and a curious discourse between mr jones and the man of the hill in italy the landlords are very silent in france they are more talkative but yet civil in germany and holland they are generally very impertinent and as for their honesty i believe it is pretty equal in all those countries the lacroix à louange are sure to lose no opportunity of cheating you and as for the postilions i think they are pretty much alike all the world over these sir are the observations on men which i made in my travel for these were the only men i ever conversed with my design when i went abroad was to divert myself by seeing the wondrous variety of prospects beasts birds fishes insects and vegetables with which god has been pleased to enrich the several parts of this globe a variety which as it must give great pleasure to a contemplative beholder so doth it admirably display the power and wisdom and goodness of the creator indeed to say the truth there is but one work in his whole creation that doth him any dishonour and with that i have long since avoided holding any conversation you will pardon me cries jones but i have always imagined that there is in this very work you mention as great variety as in all the rest for besides the difference of inclination customs and climates have i am told introduced the utmost diversity into human nature very little indeed answered the other those who travel in order to acquaint themselves with the different manners of men might spare themselves much pains by going to a carnival at venice 
for there they will see at once all which they can discover in the several courts of Europe. The same hypocrisy, the same fraud, in short, the same follies and vices dressed in different habits. In Spain these are equipped with much gravity, in Italy with vast splendor. In France a knave is dressed like a fop, in the northern countries like a sloven. But human nature is everywhere the same, everywhere the object of detestation and scorn. As for my own part, I passed through all these nations as you perhaps may have done, through a crowd at a shoe jostling to get by them, holding my nose with one hand and defending my pockets with another without speaking a word to any of them, while I was pressing on to see what I wanted to see, which, however entertaining it might be in itself, scarce made me amends for the trouble the company gave me. Did not you find some of the nations among which you travelled less troublesome to you than others? said Jones. Oh, yes, replied the old man. The Turks were much more tolerable to me than the Christians, for they are men of profound taciturnity, and never disturb a stranger with questions. Now and then, indeed, they bestow a short curse upon him, or spit in his face as he walks in the streets. But then they have done with him, and a man may live an age in their country without hearing a dozen words from them. But of all the people I ever saw, heaven defend me from the French, with their damned prate and civilities, and doing the honor of their nation to strangers, as they are pleased to call it, but indeed setting forth their own vanity. They are so troublesome, that I had infinitely rather pass my life with the Hottentots than set my foot in Paris again. They are a nasty people, but their nastiness is mostly without, whereas in France in some other nations that I won't name. It is all within, and makes them stink much more to my reason than that of Hottentots does to my nose. Thus, sir, I have ended the history of my life, for as to all that series of years during which I have lived retired here, it affords no variety to entertain you, and may be almost considered as one day. Their retirement has been so complete that I could hardly have enjoyed a more absolute solitude in the deserts of Thabius than here in the midst of this populous kingdom. As I have no estate, I am plagued with no tenants or stewards. My annuity is paid me pretty regularly, as indeed it ought to be, for it is much less than what I might have expected in return for what I gave up. Visits I admit none and the old woman who keeps my house knows that her place entirely depends on her saving me all the trouble of buying the things that I want, keeping off all solicitation or business from me, and holding her tongue whenever I am within hearing. As my walks are all by night, I am pretty secure in this wild, unfrequented place from meeting any company. Some few persons I have met by chance, and sent them home heartily frightened. As from the oddness of my dress and figure, they took me for a ghost or a hobgoblin. But what has happened to-night shows that even here I cannot be safe from the villainy of man. For without your assistance, I may not only have been robbed, but very probably murdered. Jones thanked the stranger for the trouble he had taken in relating his story, and then expressed some wonder how he could possibly endure a life of such solitude. In which, says he, you may well complain of the want of variety. Indeed, I am astonished how you have filled up, or rather killed, so much of your time. I am not at all surprised, answered the other, that to one whose affections and thoughts are fixed on the world, my hours should appear to have wanted employment in this place. But there is one single act for which the whole life of man is infinitely too short. What time can suffice for the contemplation and worship of that glorious, immortal, and eternal being, among the works of whose stupendous creation not only this globe, but even those numberless luminaries which we may here behold spangling all the sky, though they should many of them be suns lighting different systems of worlds, may possibly appear but as a few atoms opposed to the whole creation which we inhabit? Can a man, who by divine meditations is admitted, as it were, into the conversation of this ineffable, incomprehensible majesty, think days, or years, or ages, too long for the continuance of so ravishing an honor? 
shall the trifling amusements the palling pleasures the silly business of the world roll away our hours too swiftly from us and shall the pace of time seem sluggish to a mixed exercise in study so high so important and so glorious as no time is sufficient so no place is improper for this great concern on what object can we cast our eyes which may not inspire us with ideas of his power of his wisdom of his goodness it is not necessary that the rising sun should dart his fiery glories over the eastern horizon nor that the boisterous winds should rush from their caverns and shake the lofty forest nor that the opening clouds should pour their deluges on the plains it is not necessary i say that any of these should proclaim his majesty there is not an insect not a vegetable of so low an order in the creation as not to be honored with bearing marks of the attributes of its great creator marks not only of his power but of his wisdom and goodness man alone the king of this globe the last and greatest work of the supreme being below the sun man alone hath basely dishonored his own nature and by dishonesty cruelty ingratitude and treachery hath called his master's goodness in question by puzzling us to account how a benevolent being should form so foolish and so vile an animal yet this is the being from whose conversation you think i suppose that i have been unfortunately restrained and without whose blessed society life in your opinion must be tedious and insipid the former part of what you said replied jones i most heartily and readily concur but i believe as well as hope that the abhorrence which you express for mankind in the conclusion is much too general indeed you here fall into an error which in my little experience has i have observed to be a very common one by taking the character of mankind from the worst and basest among them whereas indeed as an excellent writer observes nothing should be esteemed as characteristical of a species but what is to be found among the best and most perfect individuals of that species this error i believe is generally committed by those who from want of proper caution in the choice of their friends and acquaintance have suffered injuries from bad and worthless men two or three instances of which are very unjustly charged on all human nature i think i had experience enough of it answered the other my first mistress and my first friend betrayed me in the basest manner and in the matters which threatened to be of the worst of consequences even to bring me to a shameful death but you will pardon me cries jones if i desire you to reflect who that mistress and who that friend were what better my good sir could be expected in love derived from the stews or in friendship first produced and nourished at a gaming table to take the characters of women from the former instance or of men from the latter would be as unjust as to assert that air is a nauseous and unwholesome element because we find it so in a jakes i have lived but a short time in the world and yet have known men worthy of the highest friendship and women of the highest love alas young man answered the stranger you have lived you confess but a very short time in the world i was somewhat older than you when i was of the same opinion you might have remained so still replies jones if you had not been unfortunate i will venture to say incautious in the placing your affections if there was indeed much more wickedness in the world than there is it would not prove such general assertions against human nature since much of this arrives by mere accident and many a man who commits evil is not totally bad and corrupt in his heart in truth none seem to have any title to assert human nature to be necessarily and universally evil but those whose own minds afford them one instance of this nat natural depravity which is not i am convinced your case and such said the stranger will be always the most backward to assert any such thing knaves will no more endeavor to persuade us of the baseness of mankind 
then a highwayman will inform you that there are thieves on the road. This would indeed be a method to put you on your guard, and to defeat their own purposes. For which reason, though knaves, as I remember, are very apt to abuse particular persons, yet they never cast any reflection on human nature in general. The old gentleman spoke this so warmly, that as Jones despaired of making a convert, and was unwilling to offend, he returned no answer. The day now began to send forth its first streams of light, when Jones made an apology to the stranger for having stayed so long, and perhaps detained him from his rest. The stranger answered, he never wanted rest less than at present, for that day and night were in different seasons to him, and that he commonly made use of the former for the time of his repose, and of the latter for his walks and lucubrations. However, he said, it is now the most lovely morning, and if you can bear it any longer to be without your own rest and food, I will gladly entertain you with the sight of some very fine prospects which I believe you have not yet seen. Jones very readily embraced this offer, and they immediately set forward together from the cottage. As for Partridge, he had fallen into a profound repose just as the stranger had finished his story, for his curiosity was satisfied and the subsequent discourse was not forcible enough in its operation to conjure down the charms of sleep. Jones therefore left him to enjoy his nap, and as the reader may perhaps be at this season glad of the same favour, we will here put an end to the eighth book of our history. End of section 32 Recording by Nikki Sullivan, Chicago Section 33 of Tom Jones. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Tom Jones by Henry Fielding. Book 9, Chapters 1 through 3. Chapter 1 of those who lawfully may, and of those who may not, write such histories as this, among other good uses for which I have thought proper to institute these several introductory chapters, I have considered them as a kind of mark or stamp, which may hereafter enable a very indifferent reader to distinguish what is true and genuine in this historic kind of writing from what is false and counterfeit. Indeed, it seems likely that some such mark may shortly become necessary, since the favourable reception which two or three authors have lately procured for their works of this nature from the public will probably serve as an encouragement to many others to undertake the like. Thus a swarm of foolish novels and monstrous romances will be produced, either to the great impoverishing of booksellers, or to the great loss of time, and deprivation of morals in the reader, nay, often to the spreading of scandal and calumny, and to the prejudice of the characters of many worthy and honest people. I question not but the ingenious author of the spectator was principally induced to prefix Greek and Latin mottoes to every paper, from the same consideration of guarding against the pursuit of those scribblers, who, having no talents of a writer but what is taught by the writing master, are yet no wise afraid, nor ashamed, to amuse the same titles with the greatest genius than their good brother in the fable was of braying in the lion's skin. By the device, therefore, of this motto, it became impracticable for any man to presume to imitate the spectators without understanding at least one sentence in the learned languages. 
In the same manner I have now secured myself from the imitation of those who are utterly incapable of any degree of reflection, and whose learning is not equal to an essay. I would not be here understood to insinuate that the greatest merit of such historical productions can ever lie in these introductory chapters. But, in fact, those parts which contain mere narrative only afford much more encouragement to the pen of an imitator than those which are composed of observation and reflection. Here I mean such imitators as Rowe was of Shakespeare, or as Horace hints some of the Romans were of Cato, by bare feet and sour faces. To invent good stories, and to tell them well, are possibly very rare talents, and yet I have observed few persons who have scrupled to aim at both. And if we examine the romances and novels with which the world abounds, I think we may fairly conclude that most of the authors would not have attempted to show their teeth, if the expression may be allowed me, in any other way of writing, nor would, indeed, have strung together a dozen sentences on any other subject, whatever. Scribimis in docti doctice passim. Each desperate blockhead dares to write. Verse is the trade of every living wight. Francis. May be more truly said of the historian and biographer, than of any other species of writing, for all the arts and sciences, even criticism itself, require some little degree of learning and knowledge. Poetry, indeed, may perhaps be thought an exception, but then it demands numbers, or something like numbers, whereas to the composition of novels and romances nothing is necessary but paper, pens, and ink with the manual capacity of using them. This, I conceive, their production show to be the opinion of the authors themselves, and this must be the opinion of their readers, if indeed there be any such. Hence we are to derive that universal contempt which the world, who always denominate the whole from the majority, have cast on all historical writers, who do not draw their materials from records. And it is the apprehension of this contempt that hath made us so cautiously avoid the term romance, a name with which we might otherwise have been well enough contented. Though, as we have good authority for all our characters, no less indeed than the vast, authentic, doomsday book of nature, as is elsewhere hinted, our labours have sufficient title to the name of history. Certainly they deserve some distinction from those works, which one of the wittiest of men regarded only as proceeding from a pruritus, or indeed rather from a looseness of the brain. But, Besides the dishonour which is thus cast on one of the most useful as well as entertaining of all kinds of writing, there is just reason to apprehend that by encouraging such authors we shall propagate them much dishonour of another kind, I mean to the characters of many good and valuable members of society, for the dullest writers, no more than the dullest companions, are always inoffensive. They have both enough of language to be indecent and abusive. And surely if the opinion just above cited be true, we cannot wonder that works so nastily derived should be nasty themselves, or have a tendency to make others so. To prevent, therefore, for the future, such intemperate abuses of leisure, of letters, and of the liberty of the press, especially as the world seems at present to be 
more than usually threatened with them, I shall here venture to mention some qualifications, every one of which are in a pretty high degree necessary to this order of historians. The first is genius, without a full vein of which no study, says Horace, can avail us. By genius I would understand that power, or rather those powers of the mind, which are capable of penetrating into all things within our reach and knowledge, and of distinguishing their essential differences. These are no other than invention and judgment, and they are both called by the collective name of genius, as they are of those gifts of nature which we bring with us into the world, concerning each of which many seem to have fallen into very great errors. For by invention, I believe, is generally understood a creative faculty, which would indeed prove most romance writers to have the highest pretensions to it, whereas by invention is really meant no more, and so the word signifies, than discovery, or finding out, or to explain it at large, a quick and sagacious penetration into the true essence of all the objects of our contemplation. This, I think, can rarely exist without the concomitancy of judgment, for how we can be said to have discovered the true essence of two things, without discerning their difference, seems to me hard to conceive. Now this last is the undisputed province of judgment, and yet some few men of wit have agreed with all the dull fellows in the world in representing these two to have been seldom or never the property of one and the same person. But though they should be so, they are not sufficient for our purpose, without a good share of learning, for which I could again cite the authority of Horace, and of many others, if any was necessary to prove that tools are of no service to a workman, when they are not sharpened by art, or when he wants rules to direct him in his work, or hath no matter to work upon. All these uses are supplied by learning, for nature can only furnish us with capacity, or, as I have chose to illustrate it, with the tools of our profession, learning must fit them for use, must direct them in it, and lastly must contribute part, at least, of the materials. A competent knowledge of history and of the belles lettres is here absolutely necessary, and without this share of knowledge at least, to affect the character of an historian, is as vain as to endeavor at building a house without timber, or mortar, or brick or stone. Homer and Milton, who though they added the ornament of numbers to their works, were both historians of our order, were masters of all the learning of their times. Again, there is another sort of knowledge beyond the power of learning to bestow, and this is to be had by conversation. So necessary is this to the understanding the characters of men, that none are more ignorant of them than those learned pedants whose lives have been entirely consumed in colleges and among books. For, however exquisitely human nature may have been described by writers, the true practical system can be learnt only in the world. Indeed, the like happens in every other kind of knowledge. Neither physic nor law are to be practically known from books. Nay, the farmer, the planter, the gardener, must perfect by experience what he hath acquired the rudiments of by reading. How accurately soever the 
ingenious Mr. Miller may have described the plant, he himself would advise his disciple to see it in the garden. As we must perceive, that after the nicest strokes of a Shakespeare or a Johnson, of a Wycherley or an Otway, some touches of nature will escape the reader, which the judicious action of a Garrick or a Cyber or a Clive can convey to him. So, on the real stage, the character shows himself in a stronger and bolder light than he can be described. And if this be the case, in those fine and nervous descriptions which great authors themselves have taken from life, how much more strongly will it hold when the writer himself takes his lines, not from nature, but from books? Such characters are only the faint copy of a copy, and can have neither the justness nor spirit of an original. Note. There is a peculiar propriety in mentioning this great actor, Garrick, and these two most justly celebrated actresses, Sibber or Clive, in this place, as they have all formed themselves on the study of nature only, and not on the imitation of their predecessors. Hence they have been able to excel all who have gone before them, a degree of merit which the servile herd of imitators can never possibly arrive at. End of note. Now this conversation, in our historian, must be universal, that is, with all ranks and degrees of men, for the knowledge of what is called high life will not instruct him in low, nor, a converso, will his being acquainted with the inferior part of mankind teach him the manners of the superior. And though it may be thought that the knowledge of either may sufficiently enable him to describe at least that in which he hath been conversant, yet he will even here fall greatly short of perfection, for the follies of either rank do in reality illustrate each other. For instance, the affectation of high life appears more glaring and ridiculous from the simplicity of the low, and again the rudeness and barbarity of this latter strikes with much stronger ideas of absurdity, when contrasted with, and opposed to, the politeness which controls the former. Besides, to say the truth, the manners of our historian will be improved by both these conversations, for in the one he will easily find examples of plainness, honesty, and sincerity, and in the other of refinement, elegance, and a liberality of spirit, which last quality I myself have scarce ever seen in men of low birth and education nor will all the qualities I have hitherto given my historian avail him, unless he have what is generally meant by a good heart, and be capable of feeling. The author who will make me weep, says Horace, must first weep himself. In reality no man can paint a distress well which he doth not feel, while he is painting it. Nor do I doubt but that the most pathetic and affecting scenes have been writ with tears. In the same manner it is with the ridiculous. I am convinced I never make my reader laugh heartily, but where I have laughed before him, unless it should happen at any time that instead of laughing with me, he should be inclined to laugh at me. Perhaps this may have been the case at some passages in this chapter, from which apprehension I will here put an end to it. Chapter 2. Containing a very surprising adventure indeed, 
which Mr. Jones met with in his walk with the man of the hill. Aurora now first opened her casement. I'm going to say the day began to break, when Jones walked forth in company with the stranger, and mounted Mazard Hill, of which they had no sooner gained the summit than one of the most noble prospects in the world presented itself to their view, and which we would likewise present to the reader, but for two reasons. First, we despair of making those who have seen this prospect admire our description. Secondly, we very much doubt whether those who have not seen it would understand it. Jones stood for some minutes fixed in one posture, and directing his eyes towards the south, upon which the old gentleman asked what he was looking at with so much attention. Alas, sir, answered he, with a sigh, I was endeavouring to trace out my own journey hither. Good heavens, what a distance is Gloucester from us! What a vast track of land must be between me and my own home! Ay, ay, young gentleman, cries the other, and from what you love better than your own home, or I am mistaken. I perceive now the object of your contemplation is not within your sight, and yet I fancy you have a pleasure in looking that way. Jones answered with a smile, I find, old friend, you have not yet forgot the sensations of your youth. I own my thoughts were employed as you have guessed. They now walked to that part of the hill which looks to the north-west and which hangs over a vast and extensive wood. Here they were no sooner arrived, than they heard at a distance the most violent screams of a woman, proceeding from the wood below them. Jones listened a moment, and then, without saying a word to his companion, for indeed the occasion seemed sufficiently pressing, ran, or rather, slid down the hill, and, without the least apprehension or concern for his own safety, made directly to the thicket, whence the sound had issued. He had not entered far into the wood, before he beheld a most shocking sight indeed, a woman stripped half-naked under the hands of a ruffian, who had put his garter round her neck, and was endeavouring to draw her up to a tree. Jones asked no questions at this interval, but fell instantly upon the ruffian, and made such good use of his trusty oaken stick, that he laid him sprawling on the ground before he could defend himself, indeed almost before he knew he was attacked. Nor did he cease the prosecution of his blows, till the woman herself begged him to forbear, saying she believed he had sufficiently done his business. The poor wretch then fell upon her knees to Jones, and gave him a thousand thanks for her deliverance. He presently lifted her up, and told her he was highly pleased with the extraordinary accident which had sent him thither for her relief, where it was so improbable she should find any, adding that heaven seemed to have designed him as the most happy instrument of her protection. Nay, answered she, I could almost conceive you to be some good angel, and to say the truth, you look more like an angel than a man in my eye. Indeed, he was a charming figure, and if a very fine person, and a most comely set of features adorned with youth, health, strength, freshness, spirit, and good nature, can make a man resemble an angel. He certainly had that resemblance. The redeemed captive was 
not altogether so much of the human angelic species, she seemed to be at least of the middle age, nor had her face much appearance of beauty. But her clothes, being torn from all the upper part of her body, her breasts, which were well formed and extremely white, attracted the eyes of her deliverer, and for a few moments they stood silent and gazing at each other, till the ruffian on the ground beginning to move, Jones took the garter, which had been intended for another purpose, and bound both his hands behind him. And now, on contemplating his face, he discovered, greatly to his surprise, and perhaps not a little to his satisfaction, this very person to be no other than Ensign Northerton. Nor had the Ensign forgotten his former antagonist, whom he knew the moment he came to himself. His surprise was equal to that of Jones, but I conceive his pleasure was rather less on this occasion. Jones helped Northerton upon his legs, and then, looking him steadfastly in the face, "'I fancy, sir,' said he, "'you did not expect to meet me any more in this world.' and I confess I had as little expectation to find you here. However, fortune, I see, hath brought us once more together, and hath given me satisfaction for the injury I have received, even without my own knowledge. It is very much like a man of honour indeed, answered Northerton, to take satisfaction by knocking a man down behind his back. Neither am I capable of giving you satisfaction here, as I have no sword. But if you dare behave like a gentleman, let us go where I can furnish myself with one, and I will do by you as a man of honour ought. Doth it become such a villain as you are, cries Jones, to contaminate the name of honour by assuming it? But I shall waste no time in discourse with you. Justice requires satisfaction of you now, and shall have it. Then, turning to the woman, he asked her if she was near her home, or if not, whether she was acquainted with any house in the neighbourhood, where she might procure herself some decent clothes, in order to proceed to a justice of the peace. She answered she was an entire stranger in that part of the world. Jones then, recollecting himself, said he had a friend near who would direct them. Indeed, he wondered at his not following. But, in fact, the good man of the hill, when our hero departed, sat himself down on the brow, where, though he had a gun in his hand, he with great patience and unconcern had attended the issue. Jones, then, stepping without the wood, perceived the old man sitting as we have just described him. He presently exerted his utmost agility, and with surprising expedition ascended the hill. The old man advised him to carry the woman to Upton, which he said was the nearest town, and there he would be sure of furnishing her with all manner of conveniences. Jones, having received his direction to the place, took his leave of the man of the hill, and, desiring him to direct Partridge the same way, returned hastily to the wood. Our hero, at his departure, to make this inquiry of his friend, had considered that as the ruffian's hands were tied behind him, he was incapable of executing any wicked purposes on the poor woman. Besides, he knew he should not be beyond the reach of her voice, and could return soon enough to prevent any mischief. He had, moreover, declared to the villain that if he attempted the least insult, he would be himself immediately the executioner of vengeance on him. 
but Jones unluckily forgot that though the hands of Northerton were tied, his legs were at liberty. Nor did he lay the least injunction on the prisoner that he should not make what use of these he pleased. Northerton, therefore, having given no parole of that kind, thought he might, without any breach of honour, depart, not being obliged, as he imagined, by any rules to wait for a formal discharge. He therefore took up his legs, which were at liberty, and walked off through the wood, which favoured his retreat, nor did the woman, whose eyes were perhaps rather turned toward her deliverer, once think of his escape, or give herself any concern or trouble to prevent it. Jones, therefore, at his return, found the woman alone. He would have spent some time in searching for Northerton, but she would not permit him, earnestly entreating that he would accompany her to the town whither they had been directed. As to the fellow's escape, said she, it gives me no uneasiness, for philosophy and Christianity both preach up forgiveness of injuries. But for you, sir, I am concerned at the trouble I give you. Nay, indeed, my nakedness may well make me ashamed to look you in the face, and if it was not for the sake of your protection, I should wish to go alone. Jones offered her his coat, but, I know not for what reason, she absolutely refused the most earnest solicitations to accept it. He then begged her to forget both the causes of her confusion. With regard to the former, says he, I have done no more than my duty in protecting you, and as for the latter, I will entirely remove it by walking before you all the way, for I would not have my eyes offend you, and I could not answer for my power of resisting the attractive charms of so much beauty. Thus our hero and the redeemed lady walked in the same manner as Orpheus and Eurydice marched heretofore. But, though I cannot believe that Jones was designedly tempted by his fair one to look behind him, yet as she frequently wanted his assistance to help her over stiles, and had besides many trips and other accidents, he was often obliged to turn about. However, he had better fortune than what attended poor Orpheus, for he brought his companion, or rather follower, safe into the famous town of Upton. CHAPTER Three, THE ARRIVAL OF MR. JONES WITH HIS LADY AT THE INN, AND A VERY FULL DESCRIPTION OF THE BATTLE OF UPTON. Though the reader, we doubt not, is very eager to know who this lady was, and how she fell into the hands of Mr. Northerton, we must beg him to suspend his curiosity for a short time, as we are obliged, for some very good reasons, which hereafter perhaps he may guess, to delay his satisfaction a little longer. Mr. Jones and his fair companion no sooner entered the town than they went directly to that inn which in their eyes presented the fairest appearance to the street. Here Jones, having ordered a servant to show a room above stairs, was ascending, when the dishevelled fair, hastily following, was laid hold on by the master of the house, who cried, Hey, day, where is that beggar wench going? Stay below downstairs, I desire you. But Jones, at that instance, thundered from above, let the lady come up, in so authoritative a voice, that the good man instantly withdrew his hands, and the lady made the best of her way to the chamber. 
Here Jones wished her joy of her safe arrival, and then departed, in order, as he promised, to send the landlady up with some clothes. The poor woman thanked him heartily for all his kindness, and said she hoped she should see him again soon, to thank him a thousand times more. During this short conversation she covered her white bosom as well as she could possibly with her arms, for Jones could not avoid stealing a sly peep or two, though he took all imaginable care to avoid giving any offence. Our travellers had happened to take up their residence at a house of exceeding good repute, whither Irish ladies of strict virtue, and many northern lasses of the same predicament, were accustomed to resort on their way to Bath. The landlady, therefore, would by no means have admitted any conversation of a disreputable kind to pass under her roof. Indeed, so foul and contagious are all such proceedings that they contaminate the very innocent scenes where they are committed, and give the name of a bad house, or of a house of ill repute, to all those where they are suffered to be carried on. Not that I would intimate that such strict chastity as was preserved in the temple of Vesta can possibly be maintained at a public inn. My good landlady did not hope for such a blessing, nor would any one of the ladies I have spoken of, or, indeed, any others of the most rigid note, have expected or insisted on any such thing. But to exclude all vulgar concubinage, and to drive all whores in rags from within the walls, is within the power of every one. This my landlady very strictly adhered to, and this her virtuous guests, who did not travel in rags, would very reasonably have expected of her. Now, it required no very blamable degree of suspicion to imagine that Mr. Jones and his ragged companion had certain purposes in their intention, which, though tolerated in some Christian countries, connived at in others, and practised in all, are, however, as expressly forbidden as murder, or any other horrid vice, by that religion which is universally believed in those countries. The landlady, therefore, had no sooner received an intimation of the entrance of the above-said persons, than she began to meditate the most expeditious means for their expulsion. In order to this, she had provided herself with a long and deadly instrument, with which, in times of peace, the chambermaid was wont to demolish the labours of the industrious spider. In vulgar phrase, she had taken up the broomstick, and was just about to sally from the kitchen, when Jones accosted her with the demand of a gown and other vestments to cover the half-naked woman upstairs. Nothing can be more provoking to the human temper, nor more dangerous to that cardinal virtue, patience, than solicitations of extraordinary offices of kindness on behalf of those very persons with whom we are highly incensed. For this reason Shakespeare hath artfully introduced his Desdemona, soliciting favours for Cassio of her husband, as the means of inflaming not only his jealousy, but his rage, to the highest pitch of madness, and we find the unfortunate Moor less able to command his passion on this occasion than even when he beheld his valued present to his wife in the hands of his supposed rival. In fact, we regard these efforts as insults on our understanding, and to such the pride of man is very difficultly brought to submit. My landlady, though a very good-tempered woman, had, I suppose, 
some of this pride in her composition, for Jones had scarce ended his request, when she fell upon him with a certain weapon, which, though it be neither long nor sharp nor hard, nor indeed threatens from its appearance with either death or wound, hath been, however, held in great dread and abhorrence by many wise men, nay, by many brave ones, insomuch that some who have dared to look into the mouth of a loaded cannon have not dared to look into a mouth where this weapon was brandished, and, rather than run the hazard of its execution, have contented themselves with making a most pitiful and sneaking figure in the eyes of all their acquaintance. To confess the truth, I am afraid Mr. Jones was one of these, for though he was attacked and violently belaboured with the aforesaid weapon, he could not be provoked to make any resistance, but in a most cowardly manner applied, with many entreaties, to his antagonist to desist from pursuing her blows. In plain English, he only begged her with the utmost earnestness to hear him, but before he could obtain his request, my landlord himself entered into the fray, and embraced that side of the cause which seemed to stand very little in need of assistance. There are a sort of heroes who supposed to be determined in their choosing or avoiding a conflict by the character and behavior of the person whom they are to engage. These are said to know their men, and Jones, I believe, knew his woman. For though he had been so submissive to her, he was no sooner attacked by her husband than he demonstrated an immediate spirit of resentment, and enjoined him silence under a very severe penalty, no less than that, I think, of being converted into fuel for his own fire. The husband, with great indignation, but with a mixture of pity, answered, You must pray first to be made able. I believe I am a better man than yourself, I every way that I am, and presently proceeded to discharge half a dozen whores at the lady above stairs, the last of which had scarce issued from his lips, when a swinging blow from the cudgel that Jones carried in his hand assaulted him over the shoulders. It is a question whether the landlord or the landlady was the most expeditious in returning this blow. My landlord, whose hands were empty, fell to with his fist, and the good wife, uplifting her broom and aiming at the head of Jones, had probably put an immediate end to the fray, and to Jones likewise, had not the descent of this broom been prevented not by the miraculous intervention of any heathen deity, but by a very natural, though fortunate, accident, viz., by the arrival of Partridge, who entered the house at that instant, for fear had caused him to run every step from the hill, and who, seeing the danger which threatened his master or companion, which you choose to call him, prevented so sad a catastrophe by catching hold of the landlady's arm, as it was brandished aloft in the air. The landlady soon perceived the impediment which prevented her blow, and being unable to rescue her arm from the hands of Partridge, she let fall the broom, and then leaving Jones to the discipline of her husband, she fell with the utmost fury on that poor fellow, who had already given some intimation of himself, by crying, Zounds, do you intend to kill my friend? Partridge, though not much addicted to battle, would not, however, stand still when his friend was attacked, nor was he much displeased with that part of the combat 
which fell to his share. He therefore returned my lady's blows as soon as he received them. And now the fight was obstinately maintained on all parts, and it seemed doubtful to which side fortune would incline when the naked lady, who had listened at the top of the stairs to the dialogue which preceded the engagement, descended suddenly from above, and, without weighing the unfair inequality of two to one, fell upon the poor woman who was boxing with Partridge. Nor did that great champion desist, but rather redoubled his fury, when he found fresh suckers were arrived to his assistance. Victory must now have fallen to the side of the travellers, for the bravest troops must yield to numbers. Had not Susan, the chambermaid, come luckily to support her mistress? This Susan was as two-handed a wench, according to the phrase, as any in the country, and would, I believe, have beat the famed Thalistress herself, or any of her subject Amazons, for her form was robust and manlike, and every way made for such encounters. As her hands and arms were formed to give blows with great mischief to an enemy, so was her face as well contrived to receive blows without any great injury to herself, her nose being already flat to her face. Her lips were so large that no swelling could be perceived in them, and, moreover, they were so hard that a fist could hardly make any impression on them. Lastly, her cheekbones stood out as if nature had intended them for two bastions to defend her eyes in those encounters for which she seemed so well calculated, and to which she was most wonderfully well inclined. This fair creature, entering the field of battle, immediately filed to that wing where her mistress maintained so unequal a fight with one of either sex. Here she presently challenged Partridge to single combat. He accepted the challenge, and a most desperate fight began between them. Now the dogs of war being let loose began to lick their bloody lips. Now victory, with golden wings, hung hovering in the air. Now fortune, taking her scales from her shelf, began to weigh the fates of Tom Jones, his female companion, and Partridge, against the landlord, his wife, and maid, all which hung in exact balance before her. When a good-natured accident put suddenly an end to the bloody fray, with which half of the combatants had already sufficiently feasted. This accident was the arrival of a coach and four, upon which my landlord and landlady immediately desisted from fighting, and at their entreaty obtained the same favour of their antagonists. But Susan was not so kind to Partridge, for that Amazonian fair, having overthrown and bestrid her enemy, was now cuffing him lustily with both her hands, without any regard to his request of a cessation of arms, or to those loud exclamations of murder which he roared forth. No sooner, however, had Jones quitted the landlord than he flew to the rescue of his defeated companion, from whom he with much difficulty drew off the enraged chambermaid. But Partridge was not immediately sensible of his deliverance, for he still lay flat on the floor, guarding his face with his hands, nor did he cease roaring till Jones had forced him to look up, and to perceive that the battle was at an end. The landlord, who had no visible hurt, and the landlady, hiding her well-scratched face with her handkerchief, ran both hastily to the door to attend the coach, from which a young lady and her maid now alighted. 
These the landlady presently ushered into that room where Mr. Jones had at first deposited his fair prize, as it was the best apartment in the house. Hither they were obliged to pass through the field of battle, which they did with the utmost haste, covering their faces with their handkerchiefs, as desirous to avoid the notice of any one. Indeed, their caution was quite unnecessary, for the poor unfortunate Helen, the fatal cause of all the bloodshed, was entirely taken up in endeavouring to conceal her own face, and Jones was no less occupied in rescuing Partridge from the fury of Susan, which, being happily effected, the poor fellow immediately departed to the pump to wash his face, and to stop that bloody torrent which Susan had plentifully set a-flowing from his nostrils. End of Section 33 of Tom Jones Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California for LibriVox Spring 2008
and was afraid some accident had happened to her. An accident hath happened to me indeed, says she, and I am highly obliged to this gentleman, pointing to Jones, that it was not a fatal one, or that I am now living to mention it. Whatever the gentleman hath done, cries the sergeant, I am sure the captain will make him amends for it, and if I can be of any service, your ladyship may command me, and I shall think myself very happy to have it in my power to serve your ladyship, and so indeed may any one, for I know the captain will well reward them for it. The landlady, who heard from the stairs all that passed between the sergeant and Mrs. Waters, came hastily down, and running directly up to her, began to ask pardon for the offences she had committed, begging that all might be imputed to ignorance of her quality. For, Lud, madam, says she, how should I have imagined that a lady of your fashion would appear in such a dress? I am sure, madam, if I had once suspected that your ladyship was your ladyship, I would sooner have burnt my tongue out than have said what I have said, and I hope your ladyship will accept of a gown till you can get your own clothes. Prithee, woman, says Mrs. Waters, cease your impertinence. How can you imagine I should concern myself about anything which comes from the lips of such low creatures as yourself? But I am surprised at your assurance in thinking, after what is past, that I will condescend to put on any of your dirty things. I would have you know, creature, I have a spirit above that. Here Jones interfered, and begged Mrs. Waters to forgive the landlady, and to accept her gown. For, I must confess, cries he, our appearance was a little suspicious when first we came in. And, I am well assured, all this good woman did was, as she professed, out of regard to the reputation of her house. Yes, upon my truly was it, says she. The gentleman speaks very much like a gentleman, and I see very plainly is so. And, to be certain, the house is well known to be a house of as good reputation as any on the road, and, though I say it, is frequented by gentry of the best quality, both Irish and English. I defy anybody to say black is my eye, for that matter. And, as I was saying, if I had known your ladyship to be your ladyship, I would as soon have burnt my fingers as have affronted your ladyship. But, truly, where gentry come and spend their money, I am not willing that they should be scandalized by a set of poor shabby vermin, that, wherever they go, leave more lice than money behind them. Such folks never raise my compassion, for to be certain it is foolish to have any for them. And if our justices did as they ought, they would be all whipped out of the kingdom, for to be certain it is what is most fitting for them. But as for your ladyship, I am heartily sorry, your ladyship hath had a misfortune, and if your ladyship will do me the honour to wear my clothes till you can get some of your ladyship's own, to be certain, the best I have is at your ladyship's service." Whether cold, shame, or the persuasions of Mr. Jones prevailed most on Mrs. Waters, I will not determine, but she suffered herself to be pacified by this speech of my landlady, and retired with that good woman, in order to apparel herself in a decent manner. My landlord was likewise beginning his oration to Jones, but was presently interrupted by that generous youth, 
who shook him heartily by the hand, and assured him of entire forgiveness, saying, If you are satisfied, my worthy friend, I promise you I am. And, indeed, in one sense, the landlord had the better reason to be satisfied, for he had received a belly full of drubbing, whereas Jones had scarce felt a single blow. Partridge, who had been all this time washing his bloody nose at the pump, returned from the kitchen at the instant when his master and the landlord were shaking hands with each other. As he was of a peaceable disposition, he was pleased with those symptoms of reconciliation, and though his face bore some marks of Susan's fist, and many more of her nails, he rather chose to be contented with his fortune in the last battle than to endeavour at bettering it in another. The heroic Susan was likewise well contented with her victory, though it had cost her a black eye, which Partridge had given her at the first onset. Between these two, therefore, a league was struck, and those hands which had been the instruments of war became now the mediators of peace. Matters were thus restored to a perfect calm, at which the sergeant, though it may seem so contrary to the principles of his profession, testified his approbation. "'Well, now, that's friendly,' said he. "'Damn me, I hate to see two people bear ill-will to one another after they have had a tussle. The only way when friends quarrel is to see it out fairly in a friendly manner, as a man may call it, either with a fist, a sword, or pistol, according as they like, and then let it be all over. For my part, damn me if I ever love my friend better than when I am fighting with him. To bear malice is more like a Frenchman than an Englishman. He then proposed a libation as a necessary part of the ceremony at all treaties of this kind. Perhaps the reader may here conclude that he was well versed in ancient history, but this, though highly probable, as he cited no authority to support the custom, I will not affirm with any confidence. Most likely, indeed, it is, that he founded his opinion on very good authority, since he confirmed it with many violent oaths. Jones no sooner heard the proposal than, immediately agreeing with the learned sergeant, he ordered a bowl, or rather a large mug, filled with the liquor used on these occasions, to be brought in, and then began the ceremony himself. He placed his right hand in that of the landlord, and seizing the bowl with his left, uttered the usual words, and then made his libation, after which the same was observed by all present. Indeed, there is very little of being particular in describing the whole form, as it differed so little from those libations of which so much is recorded in ancient authors and their modern transcribers. The principal difference lay in two instances, for, first, the present company poured the liquor only down their throats, and, secondly, the sergeant, who officiated as priest, drank the last. But he preserved, I believe, the ancient form in swallowing much the largest draught of the whole company, and in being the only person present who contributed nothing towards the libation besides his good office in assisting at the performance. The good people now ranged themselves round the kitchen fire, where good humour seemed to maintain an absolute dominion, and Partridge not only forgot his shameful defeat, but converted hunger into thirst, and soon became extremely 
facetious. We must, however, quit this agreeable assembly for a while, and attend Mr. Jones to Mrs. Waters's apartment, where the dinner which he had bespoke was now on the table. Indeed, it took no long time in preparing, having been all dressed three days before, and required nothing more from the cook than to warm it over again. CHAPTER Five, AN APOLOGY FOR ALL HEROES WHO HAVE GOOD STOMACHS, WITH A DESCRIPTION OF A BATTLE OF THE AMOROUS KIND. HEROES, NOTWITHSTANDING THE HIGH IDEAS WHICH, BY THE MEANS OF FLATTERERS, THEY MAY ENTERTAIN OF THEMSELVES, OR THE WORLD MAY CONCEIVE OF THEM, HAVE CERTAINLY MORE OF MORTAL THAN DIVINE ABOUT THEM. However elevated their minds may be, their bodies, at least, which is much the major part of most, are liable to be the worst infirmities, and subject to the vilest offices of human nature. Among these latter, the act of eating, which hath by several wise men been considered as extremely mean and derogatory from the philosophic dignity, must be in some measure performed by the greatest prince, hero, or philosopher upon earth. Nay, sometimes nature hath been so frolicsome as to exact of these dignified creatures a much more exorbitant share of this office than she hath obliged those of the lowest order to perform. To say the truth, as no known inhabitant of this globe is really more than man, so none need be ashamed of submitting to what the necessities of man demand. But when those great personages I have just mentioned condescend to aim at confining such low offices to themselves, as when by hoarding or destroying, they seem desirous to prevent any others from eating, then they surely become very low and despicable. Now, after this short preface, we think it no disparagement to our hero to mention the immoderate ardour with which he laid about him at this season. Indeed, it may be doubted whether Ulysses, who, by the way, seems to have had the best stomach of all the heroes in that eating poem of the Odyssey, ever made a better meal. Three pounds at least of that flesh, which formerly had contributed to the composition of an ox, was now honoured with becoming part of the individual Mr. Jones. This particular we thought ourselves obliged to mention, as it may account for our hero's temporary neglect of his fair companion, who ate but very little, and was indeed employed in considerations of a very different nature, which passed unobserved by Jones, till he had entirely satisfied that appetite which a fast of twenty-four hours had procured him. But his dinner was no sooner ended than his attention to other matters revived. With these matters, therefore, we shall now proceed to acquaint the reader. Mr. Jones, of whose personal accomplishments we have hitherto said very little, was in reality one of the handsomest young fellows in the world. His face, besides being the picture of health, had in it the most apparent marks of sweetness and good nature. These qualities were indeed so characteristical in his countenance, that while the spirit and sensibility in his eyes, though they must have been perceived by an accurate observer, might have escaped the notice of the less discerning, so strongly was this good nature painted in his look, 
that it was remarked by almost every one who saw him. It was, perhaps, as much owing to this as to a very fine complexion that his face had a delicacy in it almost inexpressible, and which might have given him an air rather too effeminate, had it not been joined to a most masculine person and mean, which latter had as much in them of the Hercules as the former had of the Adonis. He was, besides, active, genteel, gay, and good-humoured, and had a flow of animal spirits which enlivened every conversation where he was present. When the reader hath duly reflected on these many charms which all centred in our hero, and considers at the same time the fresh obligations which Mrs. Waters had to him, it will be a mark more of prudery than candor to entertain a bad opinion of her, because she conceived a very good opinion of him. But whatever censures may be passed upon her, it is my business to relate matters of fact with veracity. Mrs. Waters had, in truth, not only a good opinion of our hero, but a very great affection for him. To speak out boldly at once, she was in love, according to the present universally received sense of that phrase, by which love is applied indiscriminately to the desirable objects of all our passions, appetites, and senses, and is understood to be that preference which we give to one kind of food rather than to another. But though the love to these several objects may possibly be one and the same in all cases, its operation, however, must be allowed to be different. For how much soever we may be in love with an excellent sirloin of beef, or bottle of burgundy, with the damask rose, or cremona fiddle, yet do we never smile, nor ogle, nor dress, nor flatter, nor endeavour by any other arts or tricks to gain the affection of the said beef, etc. Sigh, indeed, we sometimes may, but it is generally in the absence, not in the presence, of the beloved object. For otherwise we might possibly complain of their ingratitude and deafness, with the same reason as Pasiphae doth of her bull, whom she endeavoured to engage by all the coquetry practice with good success in the drawing-room, on the much more sensible, as well as tender hearts, of the fine gentlemen there. The contrary happens in that love which operates between persons of the same species, but of different sexes. Here we are no sooner in love than it becomes our principal care to engage the affection of the object beloved. For what other purpose indeed are our youth instructed in all the arts of rendering themselves agreeable? If it was not with a view to this love, I question whether any of those trades which deal in setting off and adorning the human person would procure a livelihood. Nay, those great polishers of our manners, who are by some thought to teach what principally distinguishes us from the brute creation, even dancing-masters themselves, might possibly find no place in society. In short, all the graces which young ladies and young gentlemen, too, learn from others, and the many improvements which, by the help of a looking-glass, they add of their own, are, in reality, those very spicula et facis amores, so often mentioned by Ovid, or, as they are sometimes called in our own language, the whole artillery of love. Now, 
Mrs. Waters and our hero had no sooner sat down together than the former began to play this artillery upon the latter. But here, as we are about to attempt a description hitherto unassayed, either in prose or verse, we think proper to invoke the assistance of certain aerial beings, who will, we doubt not, come kindly to our aid on this occasion. Say then, ye graces, you that inhabit the heavenly mansions of Seraphina's countenance, for you are truly divine, are always in her presence, and well know all the arts of charming, say, what were the weapons now used to cultivate the heart of Mr. Jones? First, from two lovely blue eyes, whose bright orbs flashed lightning at their discharge, flew forth two pointed ogles, but happily for our hero hit only a vast piece of beef, which he was then conveying into his plate, and harmless spent their force. The fair warrior perceived their miscarriage, and immediately from her fair bosom drew forth a deadly sigh, a sigh which none could have heard unmoved, and which was sufficient at once to have swept off a dozen bows, so soft, so sweet, so tender, that the insinuating air must have found its subtle way to the heart of our hero, had it not, luckily, been driven from his ears by the coarse bubbling of some bottled ale, which at that time he was pouring forth. Many other weapons did she assay, but the god of eating, if there be any such deity, for I do not confidently assert it, preserved his votary. Or perhaps it may not be dignus vindice notus, and the present security of Jones may be accounted for by natural means. For as love frequently preserves from the attacks of hunger, so may hunger possibly in some cases defend us against love. This fair one, engaged at her frequent disappointments, determined on a short cessation of arms, which interval she employed in making ready every engine of amorous warfare for the renewing of the attack when dinner should be over. No sooner then was the cloth removed than she again began her operations. First, Having planted her right eye sideways against Mr. Jones, she shot from its corner a most penetrating glance, which, though great part of its force was spent before it reached our hero, did not vent itself absolutely without effect. This the fair one, perceiving, hastily withdrew her eyes, and leveled them downwards as if she was concerned for what she had done, though by this means she designed only to draw him from his guard, and indeed to open his eyes, through which she intended to surprise his heart. And now, gently lifting up those two bright orbs which had already begun to make an impression on poor Jones, she discharged a volley of small charms at once from her whole countenance in a smile. Not a smile of mirth, nor of joy, but a smile of affection, which most ladies have always ready at their command, and which serves them to show at once their good humour, their pretty dimples, and their white teeth. This smile our hero received full in the eyes, and was immediately staggered with its force. He then began to see the designs of the enemy, and, indeed, to feel their success. A parley now was set on foot between the parties, during which the artful fair so slyly and imperceptibly 
carried on her attack, that she had almost subdued the heart of our hero, before she again repaired to acts of hostility. To confess the truth, I am afraid Mr. Jones maintained a kind of Dutch defence, and treacherously delivered up the garrison, without duly weighing his allegiance to the fair Sophia. In short, no sooner had the amorous parley ended, and the lady had unmasked the royal battery, by carelessly letting her handkerchief drop from her neck, than the heart of Mr. Jones was entirely taken, and the fair conqueror enjoyed the usual fruits of her victory. Here the graces think proper to end their description, and here we think proper to end the chapter. CHAPTER six, A FRIENDLY CONVERSATION IN THE KITCHEN, WHICH HAD A VERY COMMON, THOUGH NOT VERY FRIENDLY CONCLUSION. While our lovers were entertaining themselves in the manner which is partly described in the foregoing chapter, they were likewise furnishing out an entertainment for their good friends in the kitchen, and this in a double sense by affording them matter for their conversation, and at the same time drink to enliven their spirits. There were now assembled round the kitchen fire, besides my landlord and landlady, who occasionally went backward and forward, Mr. Partridge, the sergeant, and the coachman who drove the young lady and her maid. Partridge, having acquainted the company with what he had learnt from the man of the hill, concerning the situation in which Mrs. Waters had been found by Jones, the sergeant proceeded to that part of her history which was known to him. He said she was the wife of Mr. Waters, who was a captain in their regiment, and had often been with him at quarters. Some folks, says he, used indeed to doubt whether they were lawfully married in a church or no. But, for my part, that's no business of mine. I must own, if I was put to my corporal oath, I believe she is little better than one of us, and I fancy the captain may go to heaven when the sun shines upon a rainy day. But, if he does, that is neither here nor there, for he won't want company. And the lady, to give the devil his due, is a very good sort of lady, and loves the cloth and is always desirous to do strict justice to it, for she hath begged off many a poor soldier, and by her good will would never have any of them punished. But yet, to be sure, Ensign Northerton and she were very well acquainted together at our last quarters. That is the very right and truth of the matter. But the captain, he knows nothing about it, and as long as there is enough for him too, what does it signify? He loves her not a bit the worse, and, I am certain, would run any man through the body that was to abuse her. Therefore I won't abuse her for my part. I only repeat what other folks say, and, to be certain, what everybody says, there must be some truth in it. Ay, ay, a great deal of truth I warrant you, cries Partridge. Veritas odium parit. All a parcel of scandalous stuff, answered the mistress of the house. I am sure, now she is dressed, she looks like a very good sort of lady, and she behaves herself like one, for she gave me a guinea for the use of my clothes. A very good lady, indeed, cries the landlord, and if you had not been a little too hasty, you would not have quarrelled with her as you did at first. You need mention that with my truly, answered she. If it had not been for your nonsense, nothing had happened. You must be meddling with what did not belong to you, and throw in your fool's discourse. Well, well, answered he, what's past cannot be amended. 
so there's an end to the matter. Yes, cries she, for this once, but will it be mended ever the more hereafter? This is not the first time I have suffered for your numbskulls, pate. I wish you would always hold your tongue in the house, and meddle only in matters without doors, which concern you. Don't you remember what happened about seven years ago? Nay, my dear, returned he, don't rip up old stories. Come, come, all's well, and I am sorry for what I have done. The landlady was going to reply, but was prevented by the peacemaking sergeant, sorely to the displeasure of Partridge, who was a great lover of what is called fun, and a great promoter of those harmless quarrels which tend rather to the production of comical than tragical incidents. The sergeant asked Partridge whither he and his master were travelling. "'None of your magisters,' answered Partridge. "'I am no man's servant, I assure you, "'for though I have had misfortunes in the world, "'I write gentlemen after my name, "'and as poor and simple as I may appear now, "'I have taught grammar school in my time. "'Sed hey mihi, non sum quod fui.' Uh, "'No offence, I hope, sir,' said the sergeant, where, then, if I may venture to be so bold, may you and your friend be travelling. You have now denominated us right, says Partridge, amici sumus, and I promise you my friend is one of the greatest gentlemen in the kingdom, at which words both landlord and landlady pricked up their ears. He is the heir of Squire Allworthy. What? THE SQUIRE WHO DOTH SO MUCH GOOD ALL OVER THE COUNTRY, CRIES MY LANDLADY. EVEN HE, ANSWERED PARTRIDGE. THEN, I WARRANT, SAYS SHE, HE'LL HAVE A SWINGING GREAT ESTATE HEREAFTER. MOST CERTAINLY, ANSWERED PARTRIDGE. WELL, REPLIED THE LANDLADY, I THOUGHT THE FIRST MOMENT I SAW HIM HE LOOKED LIKE A GOOD SORT OF GENTLEMAN, BUT MY HUSBAND HERE, TO BE SURE, IS WISER THAN ANYBODY. I own, my dear, cries he, it was a mistake. A mistake, indeed, answered she. But when did you ever know me to make such mistakes? But how comes it, sir, cries the landlord, that such a great gentleman walks about the country afoot? I don't know, returned Partridge. Great gentlemen have humours sometimes, he hath now a dozen horses and servants at Gloucester, and nothing would serve him. But last night, it being very hot weather, he must cool himself with a walk to yon high hill, whither I likewise walked with him to bear him company. But if ever you catch me there again, for I was never so frightened in all my life, we met with the strangest man there. I'll be hanged, cries the landlord, if it was not the man of the hill, as they call him, if indeed he be a man, for I know several people who believe it is the devil that lives there. Nay, nay, like enough, says Partridge, and now you put me in the head of it. I verily and sincerely believe it was the devil, though I could not perceive his cloven foot. But perhaps he might have the power given him to hide that, since evil spirits can appear in what shapes they please. And pray, sir, says the sergeant, no offence, I hope, but pray, what sort of a gentleman is the devil? For I have heard some of our officers say there is no such person, and that it is only a trick of the parsons to prevent their being broke. For... <clears throat> If it was publicly known that there was no devil, the parsons would be of no more use than we are in time of peace. Those officers, says Partridge, are very great scholars, I suppose. Not much of scholiards, neither, answered the sergeant. 
They have not half your learning, sir, I believe it. And to be sure, I thought there must be a devil, notwithstanding what they said, though one of them was a captain, for, methought, thinks I to myself, if there be no devil, how can wicked people be sent to him? And I have read all that upon a book. Some of your officers, quoth the landlord, will find there is a devil, to their shame, I believe. I don't question, but he'll pay off some old scores upon my account. Here was one quartered upon me half a year, who had the conscience to take up one of my best beds, though he hardly spent a shilling a day in the house, and suffered his men to roast cabbages at the kitchen fire, because I would not give them a dinner on a Sunday. Every good Christian must desire there should be a devil for the punishment of such wretches. Harkee, landlord, said the sergeant, don't abuse the cloth, for I won't take it. Damn the cloth, answered the landlord, I have suffered enough by them. Bear witness, gentlemen, says the sergeant, he curses the king, and that's high treason. I curse the king, the villain, said the landlord. Yes, you did, cries the sergeant. You curse the cloth, and that's cursing the king. It's all one and the same, for every man who curses the cloth would curse the king if he durst. So for matter of that, it's all one and the same thing. Excuse me there, Mr. Sergeant, quoth Partridge. That's a non-sequitur. None of your outlandish linguo, answered the sergeant, leaping from his seat. I will not sit still and hear the cloth abused. You mistake me, friend, cries Partridge. I did not mean to abuse the cloth. I only said your conclusion was a non-sequitur. Note. This word which the sergeant unhappily mistook for an affront, is a term in logic which means that the conclusion does not follow from the premises. End of note. You are another, cries the sergeant, and you come to that. No more a sequitur than yourself. You are a pack of rascals, and I'll prove it for I will fight the best man of you all for twenty pound. This challenge effectively silenced Partridge, whose stomach for drubbing did not so soon return after the hearty meal which he had lately been treated with. But the coachman, whose bones were less sore, and, and whose appetite for fighting was somewhat sharper, did not so easily brook the affront, of which he conceived some part at least fell to his share. He started, therefore, from his seat, and advancing to the sergeant, swore he looked on himself to be as good a man as any in the army, and offered to box for a guinea. The military man accepted the combat, but refused the wager upon which both immediately stripped and engaged, till the driver of horses was so well mauled by the leader of men, that he was obliged to exhaust his small remainder of breath in begging for quarter. The young lady was now desirous to depart, and had given orders for her coach to be prepared, but all in vain for the coachman was disabled from performing his office for that evening. An ancient heathen would perhaps have imputed this disability to the god of drink, no less than to the god of war, for in reality both the combatants had sacrificed as well to the former deity as to the latter. To speak plainly, they were both dead drunk, nor was Partridge in a much better situation. As for my landlord, drinking was his trade, and the liquor had no more effect on him than it had on any other vessel in his house. The mistress of the inn, 
being summoned to attend Mr. Jones and his companion at their tea, gave a full relation of the latter part of the foregoing scene, and at the same time expressed great concern for the young lady, who, she said, was under the utmost uneasiness at being prevented from pursuing her journey. She is a sweet, pretty creature, added she, and I am certain I have seen her face before. I fancy she is in love, and running away from her friends. Who knows but some young gentleman or other may be expecting her, with a heart as heavy as her own. Jones fetched a heavy sigh at those words, of which, though Mrs. Waters observed it, she took no notice while the landlady continued in the room. But after the departure of that good woman, she could not forbear giving our hero certain hints on her suspecting some very dangerous rival in his affections. The awkward behavior of Mr. Jones on this occasion convinced her of the truth, without his giving her a direct answer to any of her questions. But she was not nice enough in her amours to be greatly concerned at the discovery. The beauty of Jones highly charmed her eye, but as she could not see his heart, she gave herself no concern about it. She could feast heartily at the table of love, without reflecting that some other already had been, or hereafter might be, feasted with the same repast. A sentiment which, if it deals but little in refinement, deals, however, much in substance, and is less capricious, and perhaps less ill-natured and selfish, than the desires of those females who can be contented enough to abstain from the possession of their lovers, provided they are sufficiently satisfied that no one else possesses them. CHAPTER Seven, CONTAINING A FULLER ACCOUNT OF MRS. WATERS, AND BY WHAT MEANS SHE CAME INTO THAT DISTRESSFUL SITUATION FROM WHICH SHE WAS RESCUED BY JONES. THOUGH NATURE HATH BY NO MEANS MIXED UP AN EQUAL SHARE EITHER OF CURIOSITY OR VANITY IN EVERY HUMAN COMPOSITION, there is perhaps no individual to whom she hath not allotted such a proportion of both as requires much arts and pains too to subdue and keep under a conquest however absolutely necessary to every one who would in any degree deserve the characters of wisdom or good breeding as jones therefore might very justly be called a well-bred man, he had stifled all that curiosity which the extraordinary manner in which he had found Mrs. Waters must be supposed to have occasioned. He had, indeed, at first thrown out some few hints to the lady, but when he perceived her industriously avoiding any explanation, he was contented to remain in ignorance, the rather as he was not without suspicion that there were some circumstances which must have raised her blushes, had she related the whole truth. Now, since it is possible that some of our readers may not so easily acquiesce under the same ignorance, and as we are very desirous to satisfy them all, we have taken uncommon pains to inform ourselves of the real fact, with the relation of which we shall conclude this book. <clears throat> this lady, then, had lived some years with one Captain Waters, who was a captain in the same regiment, to which Mr. Northerton belonged. She passed for that gentleman's wife, and went by his name. And yet, as the sergeant said, 
there were some doubts concerning the reality of their marriage, which we shall not at present take upon us to resolve. Mrs. Waters, I am sorry to say it, had for some time contracted an intimacy with the above-mentioned ensign, which did no great credit to her reputation. That she had a remarkable fondness for that young fellow is most certain, but whether she indulged this to any very criminal lengths is not so extremely clear, unless we will suppose that women never grant every favour to a man but one, without granting him that one also. The division of the regiment to which Captain Waters belonged had two days preceded the march of that company to which Mr. Northerton was the ensign, so that the former had reached Worcester the very day after the unfortunate re-encounter between Jones and Northerton, which we have before recorded. Now, it had been agreed between Mrs. Waters and the captain that she would accompany him in his march as far as Worcester, where they were to take their leave of each other, and she was thence to return to Bath where she was to stay till the end of the winter's campaign against the rebels. With this agreement Mr. Northerton was made acquainted. To say the truth, the lady had made him an assignation at this very place, and promised to stay at Worcester till his division came thither, with what view, and for what purpose, must be left to the reader's divination. For though we are obliged to relate facts, we are not obliged to do a violence to our nature by any comments to the disadvantage of the loveliest part of the creation. Northerton no sooner obtained a release from his captivity, as we have seen, than he hasted away to overtake Mrs. Waters, which as he was a very active, nimble fellow, he did at the last-mentioned city, some few hours after Captain Waters had left her. At his first arrival he made no scruple of acquainting her with the unfortunate accident, which he made appear very unfortunate indeed, for he totally extracted every particle of what could be called fault at least in a court of honour, though he left some circumstances which might be questionable in a court of law. Women, to their glory be it spoken, are more generally capable of that violent and apparently disinterested passion of love, which seeks only the good of its object, than men. Mrs. Waters, therefore, was no sooner apprised of the danger to which her lover was exposed than she lost every consideration besides that of his safety, and this being a matter equally agreeable to the gentlemen, it became the immediate subject of debate between them. After much consultation on this matter, it was at length agreed that the ensign should go across the country to Hereford, whence he might find some conveyance to one of the seaports in Wales, and thence might make his escape abroad. In all which expedition Mrs. Waters declared she would bear him company, and for which she was able to furnish him with money, a very material article to Mr. Northerton, she having then in her pocket three bank-notes to the amount of ninety pounds, besides some cash, and a diamond ring of pretty considerable value on her finger, all of which she, with the utmost confidence, revealed to this wicked man, little suspecting she should by these means inspire him with a design 
of robbing her. Now, as they must, by taking horses from Worcester, having furnished any pursuers with the means of hereafter discovering their route, the ensign proposed, and the lady presently agreed, to make their first stage on foot, for which purpose the hardness of the frost was very seasonable. The main part of the lady's baggage was already at Bath, and she had nothing with her at present besides a very small quantity of linen, which the gallant undertook to carry in his own pockets. All things, therefore, being settled in the evening, they arose early the next morning, and at five o'clock departed from Worcester, it being then above two hours before day, but the moon, which was then at the full, gave them all the light she was capable of affording. Mrs. Waters was not of that delicate race of women who are obliged to the invention of vehicles for the capacity of removing themselves from one place to another, and with whom, consequently, a coach is reckoned among the necessaries of life. Her limbs were indeed full of strength and agility, and, as her mind was no less animated with spirit, she was perfectly able to keep pace with her nimble lover. Having travelled on for some miles in a high road, which Northerton said he was informed led to Hereford, they came at the break of day to the side of a large wood, where he suddenly stopped, and, affecting to meditate a moment with himself, expressed some apprehensions from travelling any longer in so public a way, upon which he easily persuaded his fair companion to strike with him into a path which seemed to lead directly through the wood, and which at length brought them both to the bottom of Mazard Hill. Whether the execrable scheme which he now attempted to execute was the effect of previous deliberation, or whether it now first came into his head, I cannot determine. But, being arrived in this lonely place, where it was very improbable he should meet with any interruption, he suddenly slipped his garter from his leg, and, laying violent hands on the poor woman, endeavoured to perpetrate that dreadful and detestable fact which we have before commemorated, and which the providential appearance of Jones did so fortunately prevent. Happy was it for Mrs. Waters that she was not of the weakest order of females, for no sooner did she perceive, by his tying a knot in his garter, and by his declarations, what his hellish intentions were, than she stood stoutly to her defence, and so strongly struggled with her enemy, screaming all the while for assistance, that she delayed the execution of the villain's purpose several minutes, by which means Mr. Jones came to her relief, at that very instant when her strength failed, and she was totally overpowered, and delivered her from the ruffian's hands, with no other loss than that of her clothes, which were torn from her back, and of the diamond ring, which, during the contention, either dropped from her finger, or was wrenched from it by Northerton. Thus, reader, we have given thee the fruits of a very painful inquiry, which, for thy satisfaction, we have made into this matter. And here we have opened to thee a scene of folly as well as villainy, which we could scarce have believed a human creature capable of being guilty of had we not remembered that this fellow was at that time firmly persuaded that he had already committed a murder, and had forfeited his life to the law. As he concluded, therefore, that his only safety lay in flight, he thought the possessing himself of this poor woman's money and ring would make him amends for the additional burden 
he was to lay on his conscience. And here, reader, we must strictly caution thee that thou dost not take any occasion from the misbehavior of such a wretch as this to reflect on so worthy and honorable a body of men as are the officers of our army in general. Thou wilt be pleased to consider that this fellow, as we have already informed thee, had neither the birth nor education of a gentleman, nor was a proper person to be enrolled among the number of such. If, therefore, his baseness can justly reflect on any besides himself, it must be only on those who gave him his commission. End of Section 34 of Tom Jones Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California Spring 2008Section 35 of Tom Jones. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Tom Jones by Henry Fielding. Book 10. In which the history goes forward about twelve hours. Chapter 1. Containing instructions very necessary to be perused by modern critics. Reader, it is impossible we should know what sort of person thou wilt be for perhaps thou mayst be as learned in human nature as shakespeare himself was and perhaps thou mayst be no wiser than some of his editors now lest this letter should be the case we think proper before we go any farther together to give thee a few wholesome admonitions that thou mayst not as grossly misunderstand and misrepresent us as some of the said editors have misunderstood and misrepresented their author first then we warn thee not too hastily to condemn any of the incidents in this our history as impertinent and foreign to our main design, because thou dost not immediately conceive in what manner such incident may conduce to that design. This work may indeed be considered as a great creation of our own, and for a little reptile of a critic to presume to find fault with any of its parts without knowing the manner in which the whole is connected, and before he comes to the final catastrophe, is a most presumptuous absurdity. The allusion and metaphor we have here made use of we must acknowledge to be infinitely too great for our occasion, but there is, indeed, no other which is at all adequate to express the difference between an author of the first rate and a critic of the lowest. Another caution we would give thee, my good reptile, is that thou dost not find out too near a resemblance between certain characters here introduced, as, for instance, between the landlady who appears in the seventh book and her in the ninth. Thou art to know, friend, that there are certain characteristics in which most individuals of every profession and occupation agree. To be able to preserve these characteristics, and at the same time to diversify their operations, is one talent of a good writer. Again, to mark the nice distinction between two persons actuated by the same vice or folly is another. And, as this last talent is found in very few writers, so is the true discernment of it found in as few readers though, I believe, the observation of this forms a very principal pleasure in those who are capable of the discovery. Every person, for instance, can distinguish between Sir Epicure Mammon and Sir Fopling Flutter, but to note the difference between Sir Fopling Flutter and Sir Courtly Nice requires a more exquisite judgment, for want of which vulgar spectators of plays very often do great injustice in the theatre where I have sometimes known a poet in danger of being convicted as a thief upon much worse evidence than the resemblance of hands hath been held to be in the law. In reality, I apprehend every amorous widow on the stage would run the hazard of being condemned as a servile imitation of Dido, but that happily very few of our playhouse critics understand enough of Latin to read Virgil. In the next place we must admonish thee, my worthy friend, for perhaps thy heart may be better than thy head, not to condemn a character as a bad one, because it is not perfectly a good one. 
if thou dost delight in these models of perfection, there are books enough written to gratify thy taste. But, as we have not, in the course of our conversation, ever happened to meet with any such person, we have not chosen to introduce any such here. To say the truth, I a little question whether mere men ever arrived at this consummate degree of excellence, as well as whether there hath ever existed a monster bad enough to verify that nulla virtute redemptum avit is, or whose vices are not allayed with a single virtue, in juvenal. Nor do I, indeed, conceive the good purposes served by inserting characters of such angelic perfection, or such diabolical depravity, in any work of invention, since, from contemplating either, the mind of man is more likely to be overwhelmed with sorrow and shame than to draw any good uses from such patterns. For in the former instance he may be both concerned and ashamed to see a pattern of excellence in his nature, which he may reasonably despair of ever arriving at, and, in contemplating the latter, he may be no less affected with those uneasy sensations at seeing the nature of which he is a partaker degraded into so odious and detestable a creature. In fact, if there be enough of goodness in a character to engage the admiration and affection of a well-disposed mind, though there should appear some of those little blemishes, quas humana parum cavit natura, they will raise our compassion rather than our abhorrence. Indeed, nothing can be of more moral use than the imperfections which are seen in examples of this kind, since such form a kind of surprise, more apt to affect and dwell upon our minds than the faults of very vicious and wicked persons. The foibles and vices of men, in whom there is great mixture of good, become more glaring objects from the virtues which contrast them and show their deformity, and when we find such vices attended with their evil consequence to our favourite characters, we are not only taught to shun them for our own sake, but to hate them for the mischiefs they have already brought on those we love. And now, my friend, having given you these few admonitions, we will, if you please, once more set forward with our history. CHAPTER Two, CONTAINING THE ARRIVAL OF AN IRISH GENTLEMAN, WITH VERY EXTRAORDINARY ADVENTURES WHICH ensued AT THE INN. Now the little trembling hair, which the dread of all her numerous enemies, and chiefly of that cunning, cruel, carnivorous animal, man, had confined all the day to her lurking-place, sports wantonly over the lawns. Now on some hollow tree, the owl, shrill chorister of the night, hoots forth notes which might charm the ears of some modern connoisseurs in music. Now, in the imagination of the half-drunk clown, as he staggers through the churchyard, or rather charnel-yard, to his home, fear paints the bloody hobgoblin. Now thieves and ruffians are awake, and honest watchmen fast asleep. In plain English, it was now midnight, and the company at the inn, as well those who have been already mentioned in this history, as some others who arrived in the evening, were all in bed. Only Susan Chambermaid was now stirring, she being obliged to wash the kitchen before she retired to the arms of the fond expecting hostler. In this posture were affairs at the inn, when a gentleman arrived there post. He immediately alighted from his horse, and, coming up to Susan, inquired of her, in a very abrupt and confused manner, being almost out of breath with eagerness, whether there was any lady in the house. The hour of night, and the behaviour of the man, who stared very wildly all the time, a little surprised Susan, so that she hesitated before she made any answer, upon which the gentleman, with redoubled eagerness, begged her to give him a true information, saying, he had lost his wife, and was come in pursuit of her. "'Upon my soul,' cries he, "'I have been near catching her already in two or three places, if I had not found her gone just as I came up with her.' If she be in the house, do carry me up in the dark, and show her to me, and if she be gone away before me, do tell me which way I shall go after her, to meet her, and, upon my soul, I will make you the richest poor woman in the nation. He then pulled out a handful of guineas, a sight which would have bribed persons of much greater consequence than this poor wench to much worse purposes. Susan, from the account she had received of Mrs. Waters, made not the least doubt but that she was the very identical stray whom the right owner pursued. As she concluded, therefore, with great appearance of reason, that she never could get money in an honester way than by restoring a wife to her husband, she made no scruple of assuring the gentleman that the lady he wanted was then in the house, and was presently afterwards prevailed upon, by very liberal promises and some earnest paid into her hands, to conduct him to the bedchamber of Mrs. Waters. 
it hath been a custom long established in the polite world, and that upon very solid and substantial reasons, that a husband shall never enter his wife's apartment without first knocking at the door. The many excellent uses of this custom need scarce be hinted to a reader who hath any knowledge of the world, for by this means the lady hath time to adjust herself, or to remove any disagreeable object out of the way. For there are some situations in which nice and delicate women would not be discovered by their husbands. To say the truth, there are several ceremonies instituted among the polished part of mankind, which, though they may, to coarser judgments, appear as matters of mere form, are found to have much substance in them, by the more discerning. And lucky would it have been, had the custom above mentioned been observed by our gentleman in the present instance. Knock, indeed, he did at the door, but not with one of those gentle raps which is usual on such occasions. On the contrary, when he found the door locked, he flew at it with such violence that the lock immediately gave way, the door burst open, and he fell headlong into the room. He had no sooner recovered his legs than, forth from the bed, upon his legs likewise, appeared, with shame and sorrow are we obliged to proceed, our hero himself, who, with a menacing voice, demanded of the gentleman who he was, and what he meant by daring to burst open his chamber in that outrageous manner. The gentleman at first thought he had committed a mistake, and was going to ask pardon and retreat, when, on a sudden, as the moon shone very bright, he cast his eyes on stays, gowns, petticoats, caps, ribbons, stockings, garters, shoes, clocks, etc., all which lay in a disordered manner on the floor. All these, operating on the natural jealousy of his temper, so enraged him that he lost all power of speech, and, without returning any answer to Jones, he endeavoured to approach the bed. Jones immediately interposing, a fierce contention arose, which soon proceeded to blows on both sides. And now Mrs. Waters, for he must confess she was in the same bed, being, I suppose, awakened from her sleep, and seeing two men fighting in her bedchamber, began to scream in the most violent manner, crying out, murder, robbery, and, more frequently, rape, which last, some, perhaps, may wonder she should mention, who do not consider that these words of exclamation are used by ladies in a fright, as fa la la rada, etc., are in music, only as the vehicles of sound, and without any fixed ideas. Next to the lady's chamber was deposited the body of an Irish gentleman, who arrived too late at the inn to have been mentioned before. This gentleman was one of those whom the Irish call a calabalaro, or cavalier. He was a younger brother of a good family, and, having no fortune at home, was obliged to look abroad in order to get one, for which purpose he was proceeding to the bath, to try his luck with cards and the women. This young fellow lay in bed reading one of Mrs. Bain's novels, for he had been instructed by a friend that he would find no more effectual method of recommending himself to the ladies than the improving his understanding and filling his mind with good literature. He no sooner, therefore, heard the violent uproar in the next room than he leapt from his bolster, and, taking his sword in one hand and the candle which burned by him in the other, he went directly to Mrs. Waters' chamber. If the sight of another man in his shirt at first added some shock to the decency of the lady, it made her presently amends by considerably abating her fears, for no sooner had the calabalero entered the room than he cried out, "'Mr. Fitzpatrick, what the devil is the meaning of this?' Upon which the other immediately answered, "'Oh, Mr. MacLachlan, I am rejoiced you are here. This villain hath debauched my wife, and has got into bed with her.' "'What wife?' cries MacLachlan. "'Do not I know Mrs. Fitzpatrick very well?' And don't I see that the lady, whom the gentleman, who stands here in his shirt, is lying in bed with, is none of her? Fitzpatrick, now perceiving, as well by the glimpse he had of the lady, as by her voice, which might have been distinguished at a greater distance than he now stood from her, that he had made a very unfortunate mistake, began to ask many pardons of the lady, and then, turning to Jones, he said, I would have you take notice I do not ask your pardon, for you have bait me for which I am resolved to have your blood in the morning. Jones treated this menace with much contempt, and Mr. MacLachlan answered, Indeed, Mr. Fitzpatrick, you may be ashamed of your own self to disturb people at this time of night. If all the people in the inn were not asleep, you would have awakened them as you have me. The gentleman has served you very rightly. Upon my conscience, though I have no wife, if you had treated her so, I would have cut your throat.' 
Jones was so confounded with his fears for his lady's reputation that he knew neither what to say or do. But the invention of women is, as hath been observed, much readier than that of men. She recollected that there was a communication between her chamber and that of Mr. Jones. Relying, therefore, on his honour and her own assurance, she answered, "'I know not what you mean, villains. I am wife to none of you. Help! Rape! Murder! Rape!' And now, the landlady coming into the room, Mrs. Waters fell upon her with the utmost virulence, saying, "'She thought herself in a sober inn, and not in a bawdy-house, but that a set of villains had broke into a room, with an intent upon her honour, if not upon her life, and both, she said, were equally dear to her.' The landlady now began to roar as loudly as the poor woman in bed had done before. She cried, "'She was undone!' and that the reputation of her house, which was never blown upon before, was utterly destroyed. Then, turning to the men, she cried, "'What, in the devil's name, is the reason of all this disturbance in the lady's room?' Fitzpatrick, hanging down his head, repeated that he had committed a mistake for which he heartily asked pardon, and then retired with his countrymen. Jones, who was too ingenious to have missed the hint given him by his fair one, boldly asserted, that he had run to her assistance upon hearing the door broke open, with what design he could not conceive, unless of robbing the lady, which, if they intended, he said, he had the good fortune to prevent. "'I never had a robbery committed in my house since I have kept it,' cries the landlady. "'I would have you to know, sir, I harbour no highwaymen here. I scorn the word, though I say it. None but honest, good gentlefolks are welcome to my house, and, I thank good luck, I have always had enough of such customers.' indeed as many as I could entertain. Here has been my lord. And then she repeated over a catalogue of names and titles, many of which we might, perhaps, be guilty of a breach of privilege by inserting. Jones, after much patience, at length interrupted her, by making an apology to Mrs. Waters for having appeared before her in his shirt, assuring her that nothing but a concern for her safety could have prevailed on him to do it. The reader may inform himself of her answer, and indeed of her whole behaviour to the end of the scene, by considering the situation which she affected, it being that of a modest lady who was awakened out of her sleep by three strange men in her chamber. This was the part which she undertook to perform, and, indeed, she executed it so well that none of our theatrical actresses could exceed her in any of their performances either on or off the stage. And hence, I think, we may very fairly draw an argument— to prove how extremely natural virtue is to the fair sex, for, though there is not, perhaps, one in ten thousand who is capable of making a good actress, and even among these we rarely see two who are equally able to personate the same character, yet this of virtue they can all admirably well put on, and as well those individuals who have it not as those who possess it, can all act it to the utmost degree of perfection. When the men were all departed, Mrs. Waters, recovering from her fear, recovered likewise from her anger, and spoke in much gentler accents to the landlady, who did not so readily quit her concern for the reputation of the house, in favour of which she began again to number the many great persons who had slept under her roof. But the lady stopped her short, and having absolutely acquitted her of having had any share in the past disturbance, begged to be left to her repose, which, she said, she hoped to enjoy unmolested during the remainder of the night." upon which the landlady, after much civility and many curtsies, took her leave. CHAPTER Three, A dialogue between the landlady and Susan the chambermaid, proper to be read by all innkeepers and their servants, with the arrival and affable behaviour of a beautiful young lady, which may teach persons of condition how they may acquire the love of the whole world. The landlady, remembering that Susan had been the only person out of bed when the door was burst open, resorted presently to her, to inquire into the first occasion of the disturbance, as well as who the strange gentleman was, and when and how he arrived. Susan related the whole story which the reader knows already, varying the truth only in some circumstances, as she saw convenient, and totally concealing the money which she had received. But whereas her mistress had, in the preface to her inquiry, spoken much in compassion for the fright which the lady had been in concerning any intended depredations on her virtue, Susan could not help endeavouring to quiet the concern which her mistress seemed to be under on that account, by swearing heartily she saw Jones leap out from her bed. The landlady fell into a violent rage at these words. "'A likely story, truly,' cried she. 
that a woman should cry out and endeavour to expose herself if that was the case. I desire to know what better proof any lady can give of her virtue than her crying out, which I believe twenty people can witness for her she did. I beg, madam, you would spread no such scandal of any of my guests, for it will not only reflect on them but upon the house, and I am sure no vagabonds nor wicked beggarly people come here. Well, says Susan, then I must not believe my own eyes. No, indeed, must you not always, answered her mistress. I would not have believed my own eyes against such good gentlefolks. I have not had a better supper ordered this half year than they ordered last night, and so easy and good-humoured were they that they found no fault with my Worcestershire perry, which I sold them for champagne, and to be sure it is as well tasted and as wholesome as the best champagne in the kingdom, otherwise I would scorn to give it them, and they drank me two bottles. No, no, I will never believe any harm of such sober good sort of people. Susan being thus silenced, her mistress proceeded to other matters. "'And so you tell me,' continued she, "'that the strange gentleman came post, and there is a footman without with the horses. Why, then, he is certainly some of your great gentlefolks, too. Why did not you ask him whether he'd have any supper? I think he is in the other gentleman's room. Go up and ask whether he called. Perhaps he'll order something when he finds anybody stirring in the house to dress it.' Now don't commit any of your usual blunders by telling him the fire's out, and the fowl's alive, and if he should order mutton, don't blab out that we have none. The butcher, I know, killed a sheep just before I went to bed, and he never refuses to cut it up warm when I desire it. Go, remember, there's all sorts of mutton and fowls. Go, open the door with, gentlemen, do you call? And if they say nothing, ask what his honour will be pleased to have for supper. Don't forget his honour. Go. If you don't mind all these matters better, you'll never come to anything. Susan departed, and soon returned with an account that the two gentlemen were got both into the same bed. Two gentlemen, says the landlady, in the same bed? That's impossible. They are two errant scrubs, I warrant them, and I believe young Squire Allworthy guessed right that the fellow intended to rob her ladyship for if he had broke open the lady's door with any of the wicked designs of a gentleman he would never have sneaked away to another room to save the expense of a supper and a bed to himself they are certainly thieves and their searching after a wife is nothing but a pretence in these censures my landlady did mr fitzpatrick great injustice for he was really born a gentleman though not worth a groat and though perhaps he had some few blemishes in his heart as well as in his head yet being a sneaking or a niggardly fellow was not one of them. In reality he was so generous a man that, whereas he had received a very handsome fortune with his wife, he had now spent every penny of it, except some little pittance which was settled upon her, and, in order to possess himself of this, he had used her with such cruelty that, together with his jealousy, which was of the bitterest kind, it had forced the poor woman to run away from him. This gentleman, then, being well tired with his long journey from Chester in one day, with which, and some good dry blows he had received in the scuffle, his bones were so sore that, added to the soreness of his mind, it had quite deprived him of any appetite for eating. And, being now so violently disappointed in the woman whom, at the maid's instance, he had mistaken for his wife, it never once entered into his head that she might nevertheless be in the house, though he had erred in the first person he had attacked. He therefore yielded to the dissuasions of his friend from searching any farther after her that night, and accepted the kind offer of part of his bed. The footman and postboy were in a different disposition. They were more ready to order than the landlady was to provide. However, after being pretty well satisfied by them of the real truth of the case, and that Mr. Fitzpatrick was no thief, she was at length prevailed on to get some cold meat before them, which they were devouring with great greediness when Partridge came into the kitchen. He had been first awaked by the hurry which we have before seen, and while he was endeavouring to compose himself again on his pillow, a screech-owl had given him such a serenade at his window that he leapt in a most horrible affright from his bed, and, huddling on his clothes with great expedition, ran down to the protection of the company, whom he heard talking below in the kitchen. His arrival detained my landlady from returning to her rest, for she was just about to leave the other two guests to the care of Susan, but the friend of young Squire Allworthy was not to be so neglected, especially as he called for a pint of wine to be mulled. She immediately obeyed, by putting the same quantity of perry to the fire, 
for this readily answered to the name of every kind of wine. The Irish footman was retired to bed, and the postman was going to follow, but Partridge invited him to stay and partake of his wine, which the lad very thankfully accepted. The schoolmaster was indeed afraid to return to bed by himself, and as he did not know how soon he might lose the company of my landlady, he was resolved to secure that of the boy, in whose presence he apprehended no danger from the devil or any of his adherents. And now arrived another post-boy at the gate, upon which Susan, being ordered out, returned, introducing two young women in riding habits, one of which was so very richly laced that Partridge and the post-boy instantly started from their chairs, and my landlady fell to her curtsies and her ladyship's with great eagerness. The lady in the rich habit said, with a smile of great condescension, "'If you will give me leave, madam, I will warm myself a few minutes at your kitchen fire, for it is really very cold, but I must insist on disturbing no one from his seat.' This was spoken on account of Partridge, who had retreated to the other end of the room, struck with the utmost awe and astonishment at the splendour of the lady's dress. Indeed, she had a much better title to respect than this, for she was one of the most beautiful creatures in the world. The lady earnestly desired Partridge to return to his seat, but could not prevail. She then pulled off her gloves and displayed to the fire two hands which had every property of snow in them except that of melting. Her companion, who was indeed her maid, likewise pulled off her gloves and discovered what bore an exact resemblance in cold and colour to a piece of frozen beef. I wish, madam, quoth the latter, your ladyship would not think of going any farther to-night. I am terribly afraid your ladyship will not be able to bear the fatigue. Why, sure, cries the landlady, her ladyship's honour can never intend it. Oh, bless me, farther to-night indeed. Let me beseech your ladyship not to think on it. But to be sure, your ladyship can't. What will your honour be pleased to have for supper? I have mutton of all kinds, and some nice chicken. I think, madam, said the lady, it would be rather breakfast than supper, but I can't eat anything, and if I stay I shall only lie down for an hour or two. However, if you please, madam, you may get me a little sack whey, made very small and thin. Yes, madam, cries the mistress of the house, I have some excellent white wine. You have no sack, then, says the lady. Yes, and please, your honour, I have. I may challenge the country for that, but let me beg your ladyship to eat something. "'Upon my word, I can't eat a morsel,' answered the lady, "'and I shall be much obliged to you if you will please to get my apartment ready as soon as possible, for I am resolved to be on horseback again in three hours.' "'Why, Susan,' cries the landlady, "'is there a fire lit yet in the wild goose? I am sorry, madam, all my best rooms are full. Several people of the first quality are now in bed. Here is a great young squire, and many other great gentlefolks of quality.' Susan answered, that the Irish gentlemen weren't got into the wild goose. "'Was ever anything like it?' says the mistress. "'Why the devil would you not keep some of the best rooms for the quality, when you know scarce a day passes without some calling here? If they be gentlemen, I am certain, when they know it is for her ladyship, they will get up again.' "'Not upon my account,' says the lady. "'I will have no person disturbed for me. If you have a room that is commonly decent, it will serve me very well, though it be never so plain.' I beg, madam, you will not give yourself so much trouble on my account. Oh, madam, cries the other, I have several very good rooms for that matter, but none good enough for your honour's ladyship. However, as you are so condescending to take up with the best I have, do, Susan, get a fire in the rose this minute. Will your ladyship be pleased to go up now, or stay till the fire is lighted? I think I have sufficiently warned myself, answered the lady. So, if you please, I will go now. I am afraid I have kept people, and particularly that gentleman, meaning Partridge, too long in the cold already. Indeed, I cannot bear to think of keeping any person from the fire this dreadful weather. She then departed with her maid, the landlady marching with two lighted candles before her. When that good woman returned, the conversation in the kitchen was all upon the charms of the young lady. There is indeed in perfect beauty a power which none almost can withstand, for my landlady, though she was not pleased at the negative given to the supper, declared she had never seen so lovely a creature. Partridge ran out into the most extravagant encomiums on her face, though he could not refrain from paying some compliments to the gold lace on her habit. 
The postboy sung forth the praises of her goodness, which were likewise echoed by the other postboy, who was now come in. "'She's a true good lady, I warrant her,' says he, "'for she hath mercy upon dumb creatures, for she asked me every now and then, upon the journey, if I did not think she should hurt the horses by riding too fast. And when she came in, she charged me to give them as much corn as ever they would eat.' Such charms are there in affability, and so sure is it to attract the praises of all kinds of people. It may indeed be compared to the celebrated Mrs. Hussey. Footnote. A celebrated mantua-maker in the Strand, famous for setting off the shapes of women. End footnote. It is equally sure to set off every female perfection to the highest advantage, and to palliate and conceal every defect. A short reflection, which we could not forbear making in this place, where my reader had seen the loveliness of an affable deportment, and truth will now oblige us to contrast it by showing the reverse. End of section 35「Section 36 of Tom Jones」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Tom Jones by Henry Fielding Book 10, Chapters 4 through 6 Chapter 4 Containing Infallible Nostrums for Procuring Universal Disesteem and Hatred the lady had no sooner laid herself on her pillow than the waiting-woman returned to the kitchen to regale with some of those dainties which her mistress had refused. The company, at her entrance, showed her the same respect which they had before paid to her mistress by rising, but she forgot to imitate her by desiring them to sit down again. Indeed, it was scarce possible that they should have done so for she placed her chair in such a posture as to occupy almost the whole fire. Then she ordered a chicken to be broiled that instant, declaring, if it was not ready in a quarter of an hour, she would not stay for it. Now, though the said chicken was then at roost in the stable, and required the several ceremonies of catching, killing, and picking before it was brought to the gridiron, my landlady would nevertheless have undertaken to do all within the time, but the guest, being unfortunately admitted behind the scenes, must have witness to the forberie. The poor woman was therefore obliged to confess that she had none in the house. But, madam, she said, I can get any kind of mutton in an instant from the butcher's. Do you think, then, answered the waiting gentlewoman, that I have the stomach of a horse, to eat mutton at this time of night? Sure, you people that keep inns imagine your betters are like yourselves. Indeed, I expected to get nothing at this wretched place. I wonder my lady would stop at it. I suppose none but tradesmen and graciers ever call here. The landlady fired at this indignity, offered to her house. However, she suppressed her temper, and contented herself with saying, Very good quality frequented it, she thanked heaven. Don't tell me, cries the other, of quality. I believe I know more of people of quality than such as you. But, prithee, without troubling me with any of your impertinence, do tell me what I can have for supper. For though I cannot eat horse-flesh, I am really hungry. Why, truly, madam, answered the landlady, you could not take me again at such a disadvantage, for I must confess I have nothing in the house unless a cold piece of beef, which indeed a gentleman's footman and the postboy have almost cleared to the bone. Woman! said Mrs. Abigail, so for shortness we will call her, I entreat you not to make me sick. If I had fasted a month, I could not eat what had been touched by the fingers of such fellows. 
is there nothing neat or decent to be had in this horrid place? What think you of some eggs and bacon, madam? said the landlady. Are your eggs new laid? Are you certain they were laid to-day? And let me have the bacon cut very nice and thin, for I can't endure anything that's gross. Prithee, try if you can, do a little tolerably for once, and don't think you have a farmer's wife, or some of those creatures in the house. The landlady began then to handle her knife, but the other stopped her, saying, Good woman, I must insist upon your first washing your hands, for I am extremely nice, and have been always used from my cradle to have everything in the most elegant manner. The landlady, who governed herself with much difficulty, began now the necessary preparations, for as to Susan she was utterly rejected, and with such disdain that the poor wench was as hard put to it to restrain her hands from violence as her mistress had been to hold her tongue. This, indeed, Susan did not entirely, for, though she literally kept it within her teeth, yet there it muttered many merry come-ups as good flesh and blood as yourself with other such indignant phrases while the supper was preparing mrs abigail began to lament she had not ordered a fire in the parlour but she said that was now too late however said she i have novelty to recommend a kitchen for i do not believe I ever eat in one before. Then, turning to the post-boys, she asked them why they were not in the stable with their horses. If I must eat my hard fare here, madam, cries she to the landlady, I beg the kitchen may be kept clear, that I may not be surrounded with all the blackguards in town. As for you, sir, says she to Partridge, you look somewhat like a gentleman, and may sit still, if you please. I don't desire to disturb anybody but mob. Yes, yes, madam, cries Partridge. I am a gentleman, I do assure you, and I am not so easily to be disturbed. Non semper vox cosalis est verbo nominativus. This Latin she took to be some affront, and answered, You may be a gentleman, sir, but you don't show yourself as one to talk Latin to a woman. Partridge made a gentle reply, and concluded with more Latin, upon which she tossed up her nose, and contented herself by abusing him with the name of a great scholar. The supper being now on the table, Mrs. Abigail eat very heartily for so delicate a person, and while a second course of the same was by her order preparing, she said, And so, madam, you tell me your house is frequented by people of great quality? The landlady answered in the affirmative, saying, There were a great many very good quality and gentlefolks in it now. There's young Squire Allworthy, as that gentleman there knows. And pray, who is this young gentleman of quality, this young Squire Allworthy? said Abigail. Who should he be, answered Partridge, but the son and heir of the great squire Allworthy of Somersetshire? Upon my word, said she, you tell me strange news, for I know Mr. Allworthy of Somersetshire very well, and I know he hath no son alive. The landlady pricked up her ears at this, and Partridge looked a little confounded. However, after a short hesitation, he answered, Indeed, madam, it is true. Everybody doth not know him to be Squire Allworthy's son, for he was never married to his mother. But his son he certainly is, and will be his heir too, as certainly as his name is Jones. At that word, Abigail let drop the bacon which she was conveying to her mouth, and cried out, you surprise me, sir. Is it possible Mr. Jones should be now in the house? 
quare non, answered Partridge. It is possible, and it is certain. Abigail now made haste to finish the remainder of her meal, and then repaired back to her mistress, when the conversation passed, which may be read in the next chapter. Chapter 5 Showing Who the Amiable Lady and Her Unamiable Maid Were as in the month of June the damask rose, which chance hath planted among the lilies, with their candid hue, mixes his vermilion, or as some placesome heifer in the pleasant month of May, diffuses her odoriferous breath over the flowery meadows, or as in the blooming month of April the gentle constant dove, perched on some fair bough, sits meditating on her mate. So, looking a hundred charms, and breathing as many sweets, her thoughts being fixed on her Tommy, with a heart as good and innocent as her face was beautiful, Sophia, for it was she herself, lay reclining her lovely head on her hand, when her maid entered the room, and running directly to the bed, cried, Madam! Madam, who doth your ladyship think is in the house? Sophia, starting up, cried, I hope my father hath not overtaken us. No, madam, it is one worth a hundred fathers. Mr. Jones himself is here at this very instant. Mr. Jones? said Sophia. It is impossible. I cannot be so fortunate. Her maid averred the fact and was presently detached by her mistress to order him to be called, for she said she was resolved to see him immediately. Mrs. Honour had no sooner left the kitchen, in the manner we have before seen, than the landlady fell severely upon her. The poor woman had indeed been loading her heart with foul language for some time, and now it scoured out of her mouth, as filth doth from a mud-cart, when the board which confines it is removed. Partridge, likewise, shoveled in his share of calumny, and, what may surprise the reader, not only bespattered the maid, but attempted to sully the lily-white character of Sophia herself. "'Never a barrel the better herring,' cries he. "'Nositur associo is a true saying. It must be confessed, indeed, that the lady in the fine garments is the civiler of the two, but I warrant neither of them are a bit better than they should be. A couple of bath trolls, I'll answer for them. Your quality don't ride about at this time of night without servants. Spolicans, and that's true, cries the landlady. You have certainly hit upon the very matter for quality don't come into a house without bespeaking a supper, whether they eat it or no. While they were thus discoursing, Mrs. Honour returned, and discharged her commission, by bidding the landlady immediately wake Mr. Jones, and tell him a lady wanted to speak with him. The landlady referred her to Partridge, saying, He was the squire's friend, but for her part, she never called men folks, especially gentlemen, and then walked sullenly out of the kitchen. Honour applied herself to Partridge, but he refused. For my friend, cries he, went to bed very late, and he would be very angry to be disturbed so soon. Mrs. Honour insisted still to have him called, saying she was sure, instead of being angry, that he would be to the highest degree delighted when he knew the occasion. Another time, perhaps, he might, but non omnia possumus omnes. One woman is enough at once for a reasonable man. What do you mean by one woman, fellow? cries Honour. None of your fellow, answered Partridge. He then proceeded to inform her plainly that Jones was in bed with a wench, and made use of an expression too indelicate to be here inserted, which so enraged Mrs. Honour, 
that she called him jackanapes, and returned in a violent hurry to her mistress, whom she acquainted with the success of her errand, and with the account she had received, which, if possible, she exaggerated, being as angry with Jones as if he had pronounced all the words that came from the mouth of Partridge. She discharged a torrent of abuse on the master. She advised her mistress to quit all thoughts of a man who had never shown himself deserving of her. She then ripped up the story of Molly Seagram, and gave the most malicious turn to his formerly quitting Sophia herself, which, I must confess, the present incident not a little countenanced. The spirits of Sophia were too much dissipated by concern to enable her to stop the torrent of her maid. At last, however, she interrupted her, saying, I never can believe this. Some villain hath belied him. You say you had it from his friend, but surely it is not the office of a friend to betray such secrets. I suppose, cries Honour, the fellow is his pimp, for I never saw so ill-looked a villain. Besides, such profligate rakes as Mr. Jones are never ashamed of these matters. To say the truth, this behaviour of Partridge was a little inexcusable, but he had not slept off the effect of the dose which he swallowed the evening before, which had, in the morning, received the addition of above a pint of wine, or indeed rather of malt spirits, for the perry was by no means pure. Now that part of his head which nature designed for the reservoir of drink being very shallow, a small quantity of liquor overflowed it, and opened the sluices of his heart, so that all the secrets there deposited run out. These sluices were indeed naturally very ill-secured. To give the best-natured turn we can to his disposition, he was a very honest man, for, as he was the most inquisitive of mortals, and eternally prying into the secrets of others, so he very faithfully paid them by communicating, in return, everything within his knowledge. While Sophia, tormented with anxiety, knew not what to believe, nor what resolution to take, Susan arrived with the sack-way. Mrs. Honour immediately advised her mistress, in a whisper, to pump this wench, who probably could inform her of the truth. Sophia approved it, and began as follows. Come hither, child. Now answer me truly what I am going to ask you, and I promise you I will very well reward you. Is there a gentleman in this house, a handsome young gentleman, that, here Sophia blushed and was confounded, a young gentleman, cries Honour, that came hither in company with that saucy rascal, who is now in the kitchen? Sophia answered, There was. Do you know anything of any lady? continues Sophia. Any lady? I don't ask you whether she is handsome or no. Perhaps she is not. That's nothing to the purpose, but do you know of any lady? La, madam, cries Honour, you will make a very bad examiner. Harky, child, says she, is not that very young gentleman now in bed with some nasty trull or other? Here Susan smiled, and was silent. Answer the question, child, says Sophia, and here's a guinea for you. A guinea, madam? cries Susan. La, what's a guinea? If my mistress should know it, I shall certainly lose my place that very instant. Here's another for you, says Sophia, and I promise you faithfully your mistress shall never know it. Susan, after a very short hesitation, took the money, and told the whole story, concluding with saying, If you have any great curiosity, madam, I can steal softly into his room, and see whether he be in his own bed or no. She, accordingly, did this by Sophia's desire, and returned with an answer in the negative. Sophia now trembled, and turned pale. 
Mrs. Honor begged her to be comforted, and not to think any more of so worthless a fellow. "'Why there,' says Susan, "'I hope, madam, your ladyship won't be offended. But pray, madam, is not your ladyship's name Madam Sophia Western?' "'How is it possible you should know me?' answered Sophia. "'Why, that man that the gentlewoman spoke of, who is in the kitchen, told about you last night.' and I hope your ladyship is not angry with me. Indeed, child, said she, I am not. Pray tell me all, and I promise you I'll reward you. Why, madam, continued Susan, that man told us all in the kitchen that Madam Sophia Western, indeed, I don't know how to bring it out. Here she stopped, till, having received encouragement from Sophia, and— being vehemently pressed by Mrs. Honour, she proceeded thus. He told us, madam, though to be sure it is all a lie, that your ladyship was dying for love of the young squire, and that he was going to the wars to get rid of you. I thought to myself then he was a false-hearted wretch, for now to see such a fine, rich, beautiful lady as you be, forsaken for such an ordinary woman, for, to be sure, so she is, and another man's wife into the bargain. It is such a strange, unnatural thing, in a manner. Sophia gave her a third guinea, and telling her she would certainly be her friend if she mentioned nothing of what had passed, nor informed any one who she was, dismissed the girl, with orders to the postboy to get the horses ready immediately. Being now left alone with her maid, she told her trusty waiting-woman that she was never more easy than at present. "'I am now convinced,' said she, "'he is not only a villain, but a low, despicable wretch. I can forgive all rather than his exposing my name in so barbarous a manner. That renders him the object of my contempt. Yes, Honour, I am now easy.' I am indeed, I am very easy. And then she burst into a violent flood of tears. After a short interval spent by Sophia, chiefly in crying, and assuring her maid that she was perfectly easy, Susan arrived with an account that the horses were ready, when a very extraordinary thought suggested itself to our young heroine, by which Mr. Jones would be acquainted with her having been at the inn, in a way which, if any sparks of affection for her remained in him, would be at least some punishment for his faults. The reader will be pleased to remember a little muff, which hath had the honour of being more than once remembered already in this history. This muff, ever since the departure of Mr. Jones, had been the constant companion of Sophia by day and her bedfellow by night, and this muff she had at this very instant upon her arm, whence she took it off with great indignation, and having writ her name with her pencil upon a piece of paper which she pinned to it, she bribed the maid to convey it into the empty bed of Mr. Jones, in which, if he did not find it, she charged her to take some method of conveying it before his eyes in the morning. Then, having paid for what Mrs. Honour had eaten, in which bill was included an account of what she herself might have eaten, she mounted her horse, and, once more assuring her companion that she was perfectly easy, continued her journey. CHAPTER Six, CONTAINING, AMONG OTHER THINGS, THE INGENUITY OF PARTRIDGE, THE MADNESS OF JONES, and the folly of Fitzpatrick. It was now past five in the morning, and other company began to rise and come to the kitchen, among whom were the sergeant and the coachman, who, being thoroughly reconciled, made a libation, or in the English phrase, drank a hearty cup together. In this drinking nothing more remarkable happened than the behaviour of Partridge, who, when the sergeant drank a health to King George, repeated only the word King, nor could he be brought to utter more, for though he was going to fight against his own cause, 
yet he could not be prevailed upon to drink against it. Mr. Jones, being now returned to his own bed, but from whence he returned, we must beg to be excused from relating, summoned Partridge from this agreeable company, who, after a ceremonious preface, having obtained leave to offer his advice, delivered himself as follows. It is, sir, an old saying, and a true one, that a wise man may sometimes learn counsel from a fool. I wish, therefore, I might be so bold as to offer you my advice, which is to return home again, and lead these horrid bella, these bloody wars, to fellows who are contented to swallow gunpowder, because they have nothing else to eat. Now, everybody knows your honour waits for nothing at home. When that's the case, why should any man travel abroad? Partridge, cries Jones, thou art certainly a coward. I wish, therefore, thou wouldst return home thyself, and trouble me no more. I ask your honour's pardon, cries Partridge. I spoke on your account more than my own, for, as to me, heaven knows my circumstances are bad enough, and I am so far from being afraid that I value a pistol, or a blunderbuss, or any such thing, no more than a pop-gun. Every man must die once, and what signifies the manner how? Besides, perhaps I may come off with the loss only of an arm or a leg. I assure you, sir, I was never less afraid in my life, and so, if your honour is resolved to go on, I am resolved to follow you. But in that case I wish I might give my opinion. To be sure, it is a scandalous way of travelling, a great gentleman like you to walk afoot. But here are two or three good horses, in the stable, which the landlord will certainly make no scruple of trusting you with. But, if he should, I can easily contrive to take them, and let the worst come to the worst. The king would certainly pardon you, as you are going to fight in his cause. Now, as the honesty of Partridge was equal to his understanding, and both dealt only in small matters, he would never have attempted a roguery of this kind, had he not imagined it altogether safe, for he was one of those who have more consideration of the gallows than of the fitness of things, but, but, in reality, he thought he might have committed this felony without any danger. For, besides, that he doubted not but the name of Mr. Allworthy would sufficiently quiet the landlord, he conceived they should be altogether safe, whatever turn affairs might take, as Jones, he imagined, would have friends enough on one side, and as his friends would as well secure him on the other. When Mr. Jones found that Partridge was in earnest in this proposal, he very severely rebuked him, and that in such bitter terms, that the other attempted to laugh it off, and presently turned the discourse to other matters, saying he believed they were then in a body-house, and that he had, with much ado, prevented two wenches from disturbing his honour in the middle of the night. "'Hey day,' says he, "'I believe they got into your chamber, whether I would or no, for here lies the muff of one of them on the ground. Indeed, as Jones returned to his bed in the dark, he had never perceived the muff on the quilt, and in leaping into his bed he had tumbled it on the floor. This Partridge now took up, and was going to put into his pocket when Jones desired to see it. The muff was so very remarkable that our hero might possibly have recollected it without the information annexed. But his memory was not put to that hard office, for at the same instant he saw and read the words Sophia Western upon the paper which was pinned to it. His looks now grew frantic in a moment, and he eagerly cried out, "'Oh, heavens! How came this muff here?' "'I know no more than your honour," cried Partridge, but I saw it upon the arm of one of the women who would have disturbed you if I would have suffered them. 
"'Where are they?' cries Jones, jumping out of bed, and laying hold of his clothes. "'Many miles off, I believe, by this time,' said Partridge. And now Jones, upon further inquiry, was sufficiently assured that the bearer of this muff was no other than the lovely Sophia herself. The behavior of Jones on this occasion, his thoughts, his looks, his words, his actions, were such as beggar all description. After many bitter execrations on Partridge, and not fewer on himself, he ordered the poor fellow, who was frightened out of his wits, to run down and hire him horses at any rate. And a very few minutes afterwards, having shuffled on his clothes, he hastened downstairs to execute the orders himself, which he had just before given. But before we proceed to what passed on his arrival in the kitchen, it will be necessary to recur to what had there happened since Partridge had first left it on his master's summons. The sergeant was just marched off with his party, when the two Irish gentlemen arose, and came downstairs, both complaining that they had been so often waked by the noises in the inn, that they had never once been able to close their eyes all night. The coach, which had brought the young lady and her maid, and which perhaps the reader may have hitherto concluded was her own, was indeed a returned coach belonging to Mr. King, of Bath, one of the worthiest and honestest men that ever dealt in horse-flesh, and whose coaches we heartily recommend to all our readers who travel that road. By which means they may, perhaps, have the pleasure of riding in the very coach, and being driven by the very coachman that is recorded in this history. The coachman, having but two passengers, and hearing Mr. McLaughlin was going to Bath, offered to carry him thither at a very moderate price. He was induced to this by the report of the hostler, who said that the horse which Mr. McLaughlin had hired from Worcester would be much more pleased with returning to his friends there than to prosecute a long journey, for that the said horse was rather a two-legged than a four-legged animal. Mr. McLaughlin immediately closed with the proposal of the coachman, and, at the same time, persuaded his friend Fitzpatrick to accept of the fourth place in the coach. This conveyance, the soreness of his bones, made more agreeable to him than a horse, and being well assured of meeting with his wife at Bath, he thought a little delay would be of no consequence. McLaughlin, who was much the sharper man of the two, no sooner heard that this lady came from Chester, with the other circumstances which he learned from the hostler, than it came into his head that she might possibly be his friend's wife, and presently acquainted him with this suspicion, which had never once occurred to Fitzpatrick himself. To say the truth, he was one of those compositions which nature makes up in too great a hurry, and forgets to put any brains into their head. Now it happens to this sort of men, as to bad hounds, who never hit off a fault themselves, but no sooner doth a dog of sagacity open his mouth, than they immediately do the same, and without the guidance of any scent, run directly forwards as fast as they are able. In the same manner, the very moment Mr. McLaughlin had mentioned his apprehension, Mr. Fitzpatrick instantly concurred, and flew directly upstairs to surprise his wife, before he knew where she was, and, unluckily, as fortune loves to play tricks with those gentlemen who put themselves entirely under her conduct, ran his head against several doors and posts to no purpose. Much kinder was she to me when she suggested that simile of the hounds, just before inserted, since the poor wife may, on these occasions, be so justly compared to a hunted hare. Like that little wretched animal, she pricks up her ears to listen after the voice of her pursuer. Like her, flies away trembling when she hears it, and, like her, 
is generally overtaken and destroyed in the end. This was not, however, the case at present, for, after a long, fruitless search, Mr. Fitzpatrick returned to the kitchen, where, as if this had been a real chase, entered a gentleman hallowing, as hunters do, when the hounds are at a fault. He was just alighted from his horse, and had many attendants at his heels. Here, reader, it may be necessary to acquaint thee with some matters, which, if thou dost know already, thou art wiser than I take thee to be. And this information thou shalt receive in the next chapter. End of chapters 4, 5, and 6 of Book 10 Tom Jones Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California for LibriVox Fall 2008「in the first place, then, this gentleman just arrived was no other person than Squire Western himself, who was come hither in pursuit of his daughter, and, had he fortunately been two hours earlier, he had not only found her, but his niece, into the bargain, for such was the wife of Mr. Fitzpatrick, who had run away with her five years before out of the custody of that sage lady, Madame Western. Now this lady had departed from the inn much about the same time with Sophia, for having been waked by the voice of her husband, she had sent up for the landlady, and being by her apprised of the matter, had bribed the good woman, at an extravagant price, to furnish her with horses for her escape. Such prevalence had money in this family, and though the mistress would have turned away her maid for a corrupt hussy if she had known as much as the reader, yet she was no more proof against corruption herself than poor Susan had been. Mr. Western and his nephew were not known to one another, nor indeed would the former have taken any notice of the latter if he had known him, for this being a stolen match, and consequently an unnatural one in the opinion of the good squire, he had, from the time of her committing it, abandoned the poor young creature, who was then no more than eighteen, as a monster, and had never since suffered her to be named in his presence. The kitchen was now a scene of universal confusion. Western inquiring after his daughter, and Fitzpatrick as eagerly after his wife, when Jones entered the room, unfortunately having Sophia's muff in his hand. As soon as Western saw Jones, he set up the same holla as is used by sportsmen when their game is in view. He then immediately run up and laid hold of Jones, crying, "'We have got the dog, Fox. I warrant the bitch is not far off.' The jargon which followed for some minutes, where many spoke different things at the same time, as it would be very difficult to describe, so would it be no less unpleasant to read. Jones, having at length shaken Mr. Western off, and some of the company having interfered between them, our hero protested his innocence as to knowing anything of the lady, when Parson Supple stepped up and said, "'It is folly to deny it, for why the marks of guilt are in thy hands?' I will myself asseverate, and bind it by an oath, that the muff thou bearest in thy hand belongeth unto Madame Sophia, for I have frequently observed her of later days to bear it about her. My daughter's muff, cries the squire in a rage, hath he got my daughter's muff? Bear witness the goods are found upon him. I'll have him before a justice of peace this instant. Where is my daughter, villain? Sir, said Jones, I beg you would be pacified. The muff, I acknowledge, is the young lady's, but upon my honour I have never seen her. At these words Western lost all patience, and grew inarticulate with rage. Some of the servants had acquainted Fitzpatrick who Mr. Western was. The good Irishman, therefore, thinking he had now an opportunity to do an act of service to his uncle, and by that means might possibly obtain his favour, stepped up to Jones and cried out, Upon my conscience, sir, you may be ashamed of denying your having seen the gentleman's daughter before my face, when you know I found you there upon the bed together. 
Then, turning to Western, he offered to conduct him immediately to the room where his daughter was, which offer being accepted, he, the squire, the parson, and some others ascended directly to Mrs. Waters' chamber, which they entered with no less violence than Mr. Fitzpatrick had done before. The poor lady started from her sleep with as much amazement as terror, and beheld at her bedside a figure which might very well be supposed to have escaped out of Bedlam. Such wildness and confusion were in the looks of Mr. Western, who no sooner saw the lady than he started back, shewing sufficiently by his manner, before he spoke, that this was not the person sought after. So much more tenderly do women value their reputation than their persons, that though the latter seemed now in more danger than before, yet as the former was secure, the lady screamed not with such violence as she had done on the other occasion. However, she no sooner found herself alone than she abandoned all thoughts of further repose, and, as she had sufficient reason to be dissatisfied with her present lodging, she dressed herself with all possible expedition. Mr. Western now proceeded to search the whole house, but to as little purpose as he had disturbed poor Mrs. Waters. He then returned disconsolate into the kitchen, where he found Jones in the custody of his servants. This violent uproar had raised all the people in the house, though it was yet scarcely daylight. Among these was a grave gentleman who had the honour to be in the commission of the peace for the county of Worcester of which Mr. Western was no sooner informed than he offered to lay his complaint before him. The justice declined executing his office, as he said he had no clerk present, nor no book about justice business, and that he could not carry all the law in his head about stealing away daughters and such sort of things. Here Mr. Fitzpatrick offered to lend him his assistance, informing the company that he had been himself bred to the law, and indeed he had served three years as clerk to an attorney in the north of Ireland, when, choosing a genteeler walk in life, he quitted his master, came over to England, and set up that business which requires no apprenticeship, namely that of a gentleman, in which he had succeeded, as hath been already partly mentioned. Mr. Fitzpatrick declared that the law concerning daughters was out of the present case, that stealing a muff was undoubtedly felony, and the goods being found upon the person were sufficient evidence of the fact. The magistrate, upon the encouragement of so learned a coadjutor, and upon the violent intercession of the squire, was at length prevailed upon to seat himself in the chair of justice where being placed upon viewing the muff which jones still held in his hand and upon the parson swearing it to be the property of mr western he desired mr fitzpatrick to draw up a commitment which he said he would sign jones now desired to be heard which was at last with difficulty granted him he then produced the evidence of mr partridge as to the finding it but what was still more susan deposed that sophia herself had delivered the muff to her and had ordered her to convey it into the chamber where mr jones had found it whether a natural love of justice or the extraordinary comeliness of jones had wrought on susan to make the discovery i will not determine but such were the effects of her evidence that the magistrate throwing himself back in his chair declared that the matter was now altogether as clear on the side of the prisoner as it had before been against him with which the parson concurred saying the lord forbid he should be instrumental in committing an innocent person to durance the justice then arose acquitted the prisoner and broke up the court Mr. Western now gave every one present a hearty curse, and immediately ordering his horses, departed in pursuit of his daughter, without taking the least notice of his nephew Fitzpatrick, or returning any answer to his claim of kindred, notwithstanding all the obligations he had just received from that gentleman. In the violence, moreover, of his hurry and of his passion, he luckily forgot to demand the muff of Jones. I say luckily, for he would have died on the spot rather than have parted with it jones likewise with his friend partridge set forward the moment he had paid his reckoning in quest of his lovely sophia whom he now resolved never more to abandon the pursuit of nor could he bring himself even to take leave of mrs waters of whom he detested the very thoughts as she had been though not designedly the occasion of his missing the happiest interview with sophia to whom he now vowed eternal constancy as for mrs waters she took the opportunity of the coach which was going to bath for which place she set out in company with the two irish gentlemen the landlady kindly lending her her clothes in return for which she was contented only to receive about double their value as a recompense for the loan upon the road she was perfectly reconciled to mr fitzpatrick who was a very handsome fellow and indeed did all she could to console him in the absence of his wife 
Thus ended the many odd adventures which Mr. Jones encountered at his inn at Upton, where they talked to this day of the beauty and lovely behaviour of the charming Sophia by the name of the Somersetshire Angel. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 In which the history goes backward before we proceed any farther in our history it may be proper to look a little back in order to account for the extraordinary appearance of sophia and her father at the inn at upton the reader may be pleased to remember that in the ninth chapter of the seventh book of our history we left sophia after a long debate between love and duty deciding the cause as it usually i believe happens in favour of the former this debate had arisen, as we have there shown, from a visit which her father had just before made her, in order to force her consent to a marriage with Bliffle, and which he had understood to be fully implied in her acknowledgment that she neither must nor could refuse any absolute command of his. Now, from this visit the squire retired to his evening potation, overjoyed at the success he had gained with his daughter, and as he was of a social disposition, and willing to have partakers in his happiness, the beer was ordered to flow very liberally into the kitchen, so that before eleven in the evening there was not a single person sober in the house, except only Mrs. Western herself and the charming Sophia. Early in the morning a messenger was dispatched to summon Mr. Bliffle for though the squire imagined that young gentleman had been much less acquainted than he really was with the former aversion of his daughter as he had not however yet received her consent he longed impatiently to communicate it to him not doubting but that the intended bride herself would confirm it with her lips as to the wedding it had the evening before been fixed by the male parties to be celebrated on the next morning save one Breakfast was now set forth in the parlour where Mr. Bliffle attended, and where the squire and his sister likewise were assembled, and now Sophia was ordered to be called. O oh, Shakespeare, had I thy pen, O oh, Hogarth, had I thy pencil, then would I draw the picture of the poor serving-man, who, with pale countenance, staring eyes, chattering teeth, faltering tongue, and trembling limbs, e'en such a man so faint so spiritless so dull so dead in look so woe begone drew priam's curtains in the dead of night and would have told him half his troy was burned entered the room and declared that madame sophia was not to be found not to be found cried the squire starting from his chair zounds and damnation blood and fury where when how what not to be found where law brother said mrs western with true political coldness you are always throwing yourself into such violent passions for nothing my niece i suppose is only walked out into the garden i protest you are grown so unreasonable that it is impossible to live in the house with you nay nay answered the squire returning as suddenly to himself as he had gone from himself if that be all the matter it signifies not much but upon my soul my mind misgave me when the fellow said she was not to be found he then gave orders for the bell to be rung in the garden and sat himself contentedly down no two things could be more the reverse of each other than were the brother and sister in most instances particularly in this that as the brother never foresaw anything at a distance but was most sagacious in immediately seeing everything the moment it had happened so the sister eternally foresaw at a distance but was not so quick-sighted to objects before her eyes of both these the reader may have observed examples and indeed both their several talents were excessive for as the sister often foresaw what never came to pass so the brother often saw much more than was actually the truth this was not however the case at present the same report was brought from the garden as before had been brought from the chamber that madame sophia was not to be found the squire himself now sallied forth and began to roar forth the name of sophia as loudly and in as hoarse a voice as wylam did hercules that of hylas and as the poet tells us that the whole shore echoed back the name of that beautiful youth so did the house the garden and all the neighbouring fields resound nothing but the name of sophia in the hoarse voices of the men and in the shrill pipes of the women while echo seemed so pleased to repeat the beloved sound that if there is really such a person i believe ovid hath belied her sex nothing reigned for a long time but confusion till at last the squire having sufficiently spent his breath returned to the parlour where he found mrs western and mr bliffle and threw himself with the utmost dejection in his countenance into a great chair here mrs western began to apply the following consolation 
Brother, I am sorry for what hath happened, and that my niece should have behaved herself in a manner so unbecoming her family. But it is all your own doings, and you have nobody to thank but yourself. You know she hath been educated always in a manner directly contrary to my advice, and now you see the consequence. Have I not a thousand times argued with you about giving my niece her own will? But you know I never could prevail upon you, and when I had taken so much pains to eradicate her headstrong opinions, and to rectify your errors in policy, you know she was taken out of my hands, so that I have nothing to answer for. Had I been trusted entirely with the care of her education, no such accident as this had ever befallen you, so that you must comfort yourself by thinking it was all your own doing, and indeed what else could be expected from such indulgence. Zounds, sister, answered he, you are enough to make one mad. Have I indulged her? Have I given her her will? It was no longer ago than last night that I threatened, if she disobeyed me, to confine her to her chamber upon bread and water as long as she lived. You would provoke the patience of Job. Did ever mortal hear the like, replied she. Brother, if I had not the patience of fifty jobs, you would make me forget all decency and decorum. Why would you interfere? Did I not beg you, did I not entreat you, to leave the whole conduct to me? You have defeated all the operations of the campaign by one false step. Would any man in his senses have provoked a daughter by such threats as these? How often have I told you that English women are not to be treated like Saracian slaves? We have the protection of the world. We are to be won by gentle means only, and not to be hectored and bullied and beat into compliance. I thank heaven no sleek law governs here. Brother, you have a roughness in your manner which no woman but myself would bear. I do not wonder my niece was frightened and terrified into taking this measure, and to speak honestly, I think my niece will be justified to the world for what she hath done. I repeat it to you again, brother, you must comfort yourself by remembering that it is all your own fault. How often have I advised? Here Western rose hastily from his chair, and venting two or three horrid imprecations, ran out of the room. When he was departed, his sister expressed more bitterness, if possible, against him than she had done while he was present, for the truth of which she appealed to Mr. Bliffle, who, with great complacence, acquiesced entirely in all she said, but excused all the faults of Mr. Western as they must be considered, he said, to have proceeded from the too inordinate fondness of a father, which must be allowed the name of an amiable weakness. So much the more inexcusable, answered the lady, for whom doth he ruin by his fondness but his own child? to which Bliffle immediately agreed. Mistress Western then began to express great confusion on the account of Mr. Bliffle, and of the usage which he had received from a family to which he intended so much honour. On this subject she treated the folly of her niece with great severity, but concluded with throwing the whole on her brother, who, she said, was inexcusable to have proceeded so far without better assurances of his daughter's consent. But he was, says she, always of a violent headstrong temper, and I can scarce forgive myself for all the advice I have thrown away upon him. After much of this kind of conversation, which perhaps would not greatly entertain the reader, was it here particularly related, Mr. Bliffle took his leave and returned home, not highly pleased with his disappointment, which, however, the philosophy which he had acquired from Square, and the religion infused into him by Thwackham, together with somewhat else, taught him to bear rather better than more passionate lovers bear these kinds of evils. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 The Escape of Sophia it is now time to look after Sophia, whom the reader, if he loves her half so well as I do, will rejoice to find escape from the clutches of her passionate father and from those of her dispassionate lover. Twelve times did the iron register of time beat on the sonorous bell metal, summoning the ghosts to rise and walk their nightly round. In plainer language, it was twelve o'clock, and all the family, as we have said, lay buried in drink and sleep, except only Mrs. Western, who was deeply engaged in reading a political pamphlet, and except our heroine, who now softly stole downstairs, and having unbarred and unlocked one of the house doors, sallied forth and hastened to the place of appointment. Notwithstanding the many pretty arts which ladies sometimes practice to display their fears on every little occasion, almost as many as the other sex uses to conceal theirs. Certainly there is a degree of courage which not only becomes a woman, but is often necessary to enable her to discharge her duty. 
it is indeed the idea of fierceness and not of bravery which destroys the female character for who can read the story of the justly celebrated aria without conceiving as high an opinion of her gentleness and tenderness as of her fortitude at the same time perhaps many a woman who shrieks at a mouse or a rat may be capable of poisoning a husband or what is worse of driving him to poison himself sophia with all the gentleness which a woman can have had all the spirit which she ought to have when therefore she came to the place of appointment and instead of meeting her maid as was agreed saw a man ride directly up to her she neither screamed out nor fainted away not that her pulse then beat with its usual regularity for she was at first under some surprise and apprehension but these were relieved almost as soon as raised when the man pulling off his hat asked her in a very submissive manner if her ladyship did not expect to meet another lady and then proceeded to inform her that he was sent to conduct her to that lady sophia could have no possible suspicion of any falsehood in this account she therefore mounted resolutely behind the fellow who conveyed her safe to a town about five miles distant where she had the satisfaction of finding the good mrs honour they now debated what course to take in order to avoid the pursuit of mr western who they knew would send after them in a few hours the london road had such charms for honour that she was desirous of going on directly alleging that as sophia could not be missed till eight or nine the next morning her pursuers would not be able to overtake her even though they knew which way she had gone but sophia had too much at stake to venture anything to chance nor did she dare trust too much to her tender limbs in a contest which was to be decided only by swiftness she resolved therefore to travel across the country for at least twenty or thirty miles and then to take the direct road to london so having hired horses to go twenty miles one way when she intended to go twenty miles the other she set forward with the same guide behind whom she had ridden from her father's house the guide having now taken up behind him in the room of sophia a much heavier as well as much less lovely burden being indeed a huge portmanteau well stuffed with those outside ornaments by means of which the fair honour hoped to gain many conquests and finally to make her fortune in london city when they had gone about two hundred paces from the inn on the london road sophia rode up to the guide and with a voice much fuller of honey than was ever that of plato though his mouth is supposed to have been a beehive begged him to take the first turning which led towards bristol reader i am not superstitious nor any great believer of modern miracles i do not therefore deliver the following as a certain truth for indeed i can scarce credit it myself but the fidelity of a historian obliges me to relate what hath been confidently asserted the horse then on which the guide rode is reported to have been so charmed by sophia's voice that he made a full stop and expressed an unwillingness to proceed any farther perhaps however the fact may be true and less miraculous than it hath been represented since the natural cause seems adequate to the effect for as the guide at that moment desisted from a constant application of his armed right heel for like cuterbras he wore but one spur it is more than possible that this omission alone might occasion the beast to stop especially as this was very frequent with him at other times but if the voice of sophia had really an effect on the horse it had very little on the rider he answered somewhat surlily that meester had ordered him to go a different way and that he should lose his place if he went any other than that he was ordered sophia finding all her persuasions had no effect began now to add irresistible charms to her voice charms which according to the proverb makes the old mare trot instead of standing still charms to which modern ages have attributed all that irresistible force which the ancients imputed to perfect oratory in a word she promised she would reward him to his utmost expectation the lad was not totally deaf to these promises but he disliked their being indefinite for though perhaps he had never heard that word yet that in fact was his objection he said gentlefolks did not consider the case of poor volks that he had liked to have been turned away the other day for riding about the country with a gentleman from squire allworthy's who did not reward him as he should have done with whom says sophia eagerly with a gentleman from squire allworthy's repeated the lad the squire's son i think they call him whither which way did he go says sophia why a little o one side of bristol about twenty miles off answered the lad guide me says sophia to the same place and i'll give thee a guinea or two if one is not sufficient to be certain said the boy it is honestly worth two when your ladyship considers what a risk i run but however if your ladyship will promise me the two guineas i'll e'en venture to be certain it is a sinful thing to ride about my meester's horses but one comfort is i can only be turned away and two guineas will partly make me amends 
The bargain being thus struck, the lad turned aside into the Bristol road, and Sophia set forward in pursuit of Jones, highly contrary to the remonstrances of Mrs. Honour, who had much more desire to see London than to see Mr. Jones, for indeed she was not his friend with her mistress, as he had been guilty of some neglect in certain pecuniary civilities which are by custom due to the waiting gentlewoman in all love affairs, and more especially in those of a clandestine kind. This we impute rather to the carelessness of his temper than to any want of generosity, but perhaps she derived it from the latter motive. Certain it is that she hated him very bitterly on that account, and resolved to take every opportunity of injuring him with her mistress. It was therefore highly unlucky for her that she had gone to the very same town and inn whence Jones had started, and still more unlucky was she in having stumbled on the same guide and on this accidental discovery which Sophia had made. Our travellers arrived at Hambrook at the break of day, where Honour was against her will charged to inquire the route which Mr. Jones had taken. Of this, indeed, the guide himself could have informed them, but Sophia, I know not for what reason, never asked him the question. This was the village where Jones met the Quaker. When Mrs. Honour had made her report from the landlord, Sophia, with much difficulty, procured some indifferent horses, which brought her to the inn where Jones had been confined, rather by the misfortune of meeting with a surgeon than by having met with a broken head. Here, Honour, being again charged with a commission of inquiry, had no sooner applied herself to the landlady, and had described the person of Mr. Jones, than that sagacious woman began, in the vulgar phrase, to smell a rat. When Sophia, therefore, entered the room, instead of answering the maid, the landlady, addressing herself to the mistress, began the following speech. "'Good lack-a-day! Why, there now, who would have thought it? I protest the loveliest couple that ever I beheld. I fackens, madam, it is no wonder the squire run on so about your ladyship. He told me, indeed, you was the finest lady in the world, and to be sure so you be. Mercy on him, poor heart, I be pitied him so I did, when he used to hug his pillow and call it his dear madam Sophia. I did all I could to dissuade him from going to the wars. I told him there were men now that were good for nothing else but to be killed, that had not the love of such fine ladies. Sure, said Sophia, the good woman is distracted. No, no, cries the landlady. I am not distracted. What doth your ladyship think I don't know then? I assure you he told me all. What saucy fellow, cries Honour, told you anything of my lady? No saucy fellow, answered the landlady, but the young gentleman you inquired after, and a very pretty young gentleman he is, and he loves Madame Sophia Western to the bottom of his soul. He love my lady. I'd have you to know, woman, she is meat for his master. Nay, Honour, said Sophia, interrupting her, don't be angry with the good woman. She intends no harm. No, Mary, don't I, answered the landlady, emboldened by the soft accents of Sophia and then launched into a long narrative too tedious to be here set down, in which some passages dropped that gave a little offence to Sophia, and much more to her waiting woman, who hence took occasion to abuse poor Jones to her mistress the moment they were alone together, saying, that he must be a very pitiful fellow, and could have no love for a lady whose name he could thus prostitute in an alehouse. Sophia did not see his behaviour in so very disadvantageous a light, and was perhaps more pleased with the violent raptures of his love, which the landlady exaggerated as much as she had done every other circumstance, than she was offended with the rest, and indeed she imputed the whole to the extravagance, or rather ebullience, of his passion, and to the openness of his heart. This incident, however, being afterwards revived in her mind, and placed in the most odious colours by honour, served to heighten and give credit to those unlucky occurrences at Upton, and assisted the waiting woman in her endeavours to make her mistress depart from that inn without seeing Jones. The landlady, finding Sophia intended to stay no longer than till her horses were ready, and that without either eating or drinking, soon withdrew. When Honour began to take her mistress to task, for indeed she used great freedom, and after a long harangue in which she reminded her of her intention to go to London, and gave frequent hints of the impropriety of pursuing a young fellow, she at last concluded with this serious exhortation, "'For heaven's sake, madam, consider what you are about, and whither you are going.' This advice to a lady who had already rode near forty miles, and in no very agreeable season, may seem foolish enough. It may be supposed she had well considered and resolved this already. Nay, Mrs. Honour, by the hint she threw out, seemed to think so, and this, I doubt not, is the opinion of many readers, who have, I make no doubt, been long since well convinced of the purpose of our heroine, and have heartily condemned her for it as a wanton baggage. 
but in reality this was not the case sophia had been lately so distracted between hope and fear her duty and love to her father her hatred to blifil her compassion and why should we not confess the truth her love for jones which last the behaviour of her father of her aunt of every one else and more particularly of jones himself had blown into a flame that her mind was in that confused state which may be truly said to make us ignorant of what we do or whither we go or rather indeed indifferent as to the consequence of either the prudent and sage advice of her maid produced however some cool reflection and she at length determined to go to gloucester and thence to proceed directly to london but unluckily a few miles before she entered that town she met the hack attorney who as is before mentioned had dined there with mr jones this fellow being well known to mrs honour stopped and spoke to her of which sophia at that time took little notice more than to inquire who he was but having had a more particular account from honour of this man afterwards at gloucester and hearing of the great expedition he usually made in travelling for which as hath been before observed he was particularly famous recollecting likewise that she had overheard mrs honour inform him that they were going to gloucester she began to fear lest her father might by this fellow's means be able to trace her to that city wherefore if she should there strike into the london road she apprehended he would certainly be able to overtake her she therefore altered her resolution and having hired horses to go a week's journey away which she did not intend to travel she again set forward after a light refreshment contrary to the desire and earnest entreaties of her maid and to the no less vehement remonstrances of mrs whitefield who from good breeding or perhaps from good nature for the poor young lady appeared much fatigued pressed her very hardly to stay that evening at gloucester having refreshed herself only with some tea and with lying about two hours on the bed while her horses were getting ready she resolutely left mrs whitefield's about eleven at night and striking directly into the worcester road within less than four hours arrived at that very inn where we last saw her having thus traced our heroine very particularly back from her departure till her arrival at upton we shall in a very few words bring her father to the same place who having received the first scent from the post-boy who conducted his daughter to hambrook very easily traced her afterwards to gloucester whence he pursued her to upton as he had learned mr jones had taken that route for partridge to use the squire's expression left everywhere a strong scent behind him and he doubted not in the least but sophia travelled or as he phrased it ran the same way he used indeed a very coarse expression which need not be here inserted as fox-hunters who alone will understand it will easily suggest it to themselves end of chapter nine end of section thirty seven recording by amanda hindman england mississippi www.livinginbooks.blogspot.com Section thirty eight of Tom Jones. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Tom Jones by Henry Fielding. Book eleven. Containing about three days. Chapter one. A quest for the critics. In our last initial chapter, we may be supposed to have treated that formidable set of men who are called critics with more freedom than becomes us, since they exact, and indeed generally receive, great condescension from authors. We shall in this, therefore, give the reasons of our conduct to this august body, and here we shall, perhaps, place them in a light in which they have not hitherto been seen. This word critic is of Greek derivation, and signifies judgment hence i presume some persons who have not understood the original and have seen the english translation of the primitive have concluded that it meant judgment in the legal sense in which it is frequently used as equivalent to condemnation i am the rather inclined to be of that opinion as the greatest number of critics hath of late years been found amongst the lawyers many of these gentlemen from despair perhaps of ever rising to the bench in westminster hall have placed themselves on the benches at the playhouse where they have exerted their judicial capacity and have given judgment that is condemned without mercy the gentlemen would perhaps be well enough pleased if we were to leave them thus compared to one of the most important and honourable officers in the commonwealth and if we intended to apply to their favour we would do so 
but as we design to deal very sincerely and plainly too with them we must remind them of another officer of justice of a much lower rank to whom as they not only pronounce but execute their own judgment they bear likewise some remote resemblance but in reality there is another light in which these modern critics may with great justice and propriety be seen and this is that of a common slanderer if a person who pries into the characters of others with no other design but to discover their faults and to publish them to the world deserves the title of a slanderer of the reputations of men why should not a critic who reads with the same malevolent view be as properly styled the slanderer of the reputation of books vice hath not i believe a more abject slave society produces not a more odious vermin nor can the devil receive a guest more worthy of him nor possibly more welcome to him than a slanderer the world i am afraid regards not this monster with half the abhorrence which he deserves and i am more afraid to assign the reason of this criminal lenity shown towards him yet it is certain that the thief looks innocent in the comparison nay the murderer himself can seldom stand in competition with his guilt for slander is a more cruel weapon than a sword as the wounds which the former gives are always incurable one method indeed there is of killing and that the basest and most execrable of all which bears an exact analogy to the vice here disclaimed against and that is poison a means of revenge so base and yet so horrible that it was once wisely distinguished by our laws from all other murders in the peculiar severity of the punishment besides the dreadful mischiefs done by slander and the baseness of the means by which they are affected there are other circumstances that highly aggravate its atrocious quality for it often proceeds from no provocation and seldom promises itself any reward unless some black and infernal mind may propose a reward in the thoughts of having procured the ruin and misery of another shakespeare hath nobly touched this vice when he says who steals my purse steals the trash tis something nothing twas mine tis his and hath been slave to thousands but he that filches from me my good name robs me of that which not enriches him but makes me poor indeed with all this my good reader will doubtless agree but much of it will probably seem too severe when applied to the slanderer of books but let it here be considered that both proceed from the same wicked disposition of mind and are alike void of the excuse of temptation nor shall we conclude the injury done this way to be very slight when we consider a book as the author's offspring and indeed as a child of his brain the reader who hath suffered his muse to continue hitherto in a virgin state can have but a very inadequate idea of this kind of paternal fondness to such we may parody the tender exclamation of macduff alas thou hast written no book but the author whose muse hath brought forth will feel the pathetic strain perhaps will accompany me with tears especially if his darling be already no more while i mention the uneasiness with which the big muse bears about her burden the painful labour with which she produces it and lastly the care the fondness with which the tender father nourishes his favourite till it be brought to maturity and produced into the world nor is there any paternal fondness which seems less to savour of absolute instinct and which may so well be reconciled to worldly wisdom as this these children may most truly be called the riches of their father and many of them have with true filial piety fed their parent in his old age so that not only the affection but the interest of the author may be highly injured by these slanderers whose poisonous breath brings his book to an untimely end lastly the slander of a book is in truth the slander of the author for as no one can call another bastard without calling the mother a whore so neither can any one give the names of sad stuff horrid nonsense etc to a book without calling the author a blockhead which though in a moral sense it is a preferable appellation to that of villain is perhaps rather more injurious to his worldly interest now however ludicrous all this may appear to some others i doubt not will feel and acknowledge the truth of it nay may perhaps think i have not treated the subject with decent solemnity but surely a man may speak truth with a smiling countenance in reality to depreciate a book maliciously or even wantonly is at least a very ill-natured office and a morose snarling critic may i believe be suspected to be a bad man i will therefore endeavour in the remaining part of this chapter to explain the marks of this character and to show what criticism i here intend to obviate 
for I can never be understood, unless by the very persons here meant, to insinuate that there are no proper judges of writing, or to endeavour to exclude from the commonwealth of literature any of those noble critics to whose labours the learned world are so greatly indebted. Such were Aristotle, Horace, and Longinus among the ancients, Daché and Bossu among the French, and some perhaps among us, who have certainly been duly authorised to execute at least a judicial authority in foro literario. But without ascertaining all the proper qualifications of a critic, which I have touched on elsewhere, I think I may very boldly object to the censures of any one past upon works which he hath not himself read. Such censures as these, whether they speak from their own guess or suspicion, or from the report and opinion of others, may properly be said to slander the reputation of the book they condemn. Such may likewise be suspected of deserving this character, who, without assigning any particular faults, condemn the whole in general defamatory terms, such as vile, dull, damned stuff, etc., and particularly by the use of the monosyllable low, a word which becomes the mouth of no critic who is not right honourable. Again, though there may be some faults justly assigned in the work, yet if those are not in the most essential parts, or if they are compensated by greater beauties, it will savour rather of the malice of a slanderer than of the judgment of a true critic to pass a severe sentence upon the whole, merely on account of some vicious part. This is directly contrary to the sentiments of Horace. Verum ubi plura nitent in carmine, non ego paucis, offendor maculus, quas aut incuria fudit aut humana parum cavit natura. But where the beauties more in number shine, I am not angry when a casual line that with some trivial faults unequal flows, a careless hand or human frailty shows. Mr. Francis. For, as Marshall says, aliter non fit avite liber. No book can be otherwise composed. All beauty of character as well as of countenance, and indeed of everything human, is to be tried in this manner. Cruel indeed would it be if such a work as this history, which hath employed some thousands of hours in the composing, should be liable to be condemned, because some particular chapter, or perhaps chapters, may be obnoxious to very just and sensible objections, and yet nothing is more common than the most rigorous sentence upon books supported by such objections, which, if they were rightly taken, and that they are not always, do by no means go to the merit of the whole. In the theatre especially, a single expression which doth not coincide with the taste of the audience, or with any individual critic of that audience, is sure to be hissed, and one scene which should be disapproved would hazard the whole piece. To write within such severe rules as these is as impossible as to live up to some splenetic opinions, and if we judge according to the sentiments of some critics, and of some Christians, no author will be saved in this world, and no man in the next. CHAPTER Two. THE ADVENTURES WHICH SOPHIA MET WITH AFTER HER LEAVING UPTON Our history, just before it was obliged to turn about and travel backwards, had mentioned the departure of Sophia and her maid from the inn. We shall now therefore pursue the steps of that lovely creature, and leave her unworthy lover a little longer to bemoan his ill-luck, or rather his ill-conduct. Sophia, having directed her guide to travel through by-roads across the country, they now passed the Severn, and had scarce got a mile from the inn, when the young lady, looking behind her, saw several horses coming after on full speed. This greatly alarmed her fears, and she called to the guide to put on as fast as possible. He immediately obeyed her, and away they rode a full gallop. But the faster they went, the faster were they followed, and as the horses behind were somewhat swifter than those before, so the former were at length overtaken. A happy circumstance for poor Sophia, whose fears, joined to her fatigue, had almost overpowered her spirits, but she was now instantly relieved by a female voice that greeted her in the softest manner and with the utmost civility. This greeting Sophia, as soon as she could recover her breath, with like civility and with the highest satisfaction to herself, returned. The travellers who joined Sophia, and who had given her such terror, consisted, like her own company, of two females and a guide. The two parties proceeded three full miles together before any one offered again to open their mouths, when our heroine, having pretty well got the better of her fear, but yet being somewhat surprised that the other still continued to attend her, as she pursued no great road, and had already passed through several turnings, accosted the strange lady in a most obliging tone, and said, she was very happy to find they were both travelling the same way. The other, who, like a ghost, only wanted to be spoke to, readily answered, 
that the happiness was entirely hers, that she was a perfect stranger in that country, and was so overjoyed at meeting a companion of her own sex that she had perhaps been guilty of an impertinence, which required great apology in keeping pace with her. More civilities passed between these two ladies, for Mrs. Honour had now given place to the fine habit of the stranger, and had fallen into the rear. But, though Sophia had great curiosity to know why the other lady continued to travel on through the same by-roads with herself, nay, though this gave her some uneasiness, yet fear or modesty or some other consideration restrained her from asking the question. The strange lady now laboured under a difficulty which appears almost below the dignity of a history to mention. Her bonnet had been blown from her head not less than five times within the last mile, nor could she come at any ribbon or handkerchief to tie it under her chin. When Sophia was informed of this, she immediately supplied her with a handkerchief for this purpose, which, while she was pulling from her pocket, she perhaps too much neglected the management of her horse, for the beast, now unluckily making a false step, fell upon his forelegs and threw his fair rider from his back. Though Sophia came head foremost to the ground, she happily received not the least damage, and the same circumstances which had perhaps contributed to her fall now preserved her from confusion for the lane which they were then passing was narrow, and very much overgrown with trees, so that the moon could here afford very little light, and was moreover at present so obscured in a cloud that it was almost perfectly dark. By these means the young lady's modesty, which was extremely delicate, escaped as free from injury as her limbs, and she was once more reinstated in her saddle, having received no other harm than a little fright by her fall. Daylight at length appeared in its full lustre, and now the two ladies, who were riding over a common side by side, looking steadfastly at each other, at the same moment both their eyes became fixed, both their horses stopped, and both speaking together, with equal joy pronounced, the one the name of Sophia, the other that of Harriet. This unexpected encounter surprised the ladies much more than I believe it will the sagacious reader, who must have imagined that the strange lady could be no other than Mrs. Fitzpatrick, the cousin of Miss Weston, whom we before mentioned to have sallied from the inn a few minutes after her. So great was the surprise and joy which these two cousins conceived at this meeting, for they had formerly been most intimate acquaintance and friends, and had long lived together with their aunt Western, that it is impossible to recount half the congratulations which passed between them before either asked a very natural question of the other, namely, whither she was going. This at last, however, came first from Mrs. Fitzpatrick, but, easy and natural as the question may seem, Sophia found it difficult to give it a very ready and certain answer. She begged her cousin, therefore, to suspend all curiosity till they arrived at some inn, which I suppose, says she, can hardly be far distant, and, believe me, Harriet, I suspend as much curiosity on my side, for, indeed, I believe our astonishment is pretty equal. The conversation which passed between these ladies on the road was, I apprehend, little worth relating and less certainly was that between the two waiting-women, for they likewise began to pay their compliments to each other. As for the guides, they were debarred from the pleasure of this course, the one being placed in the van, and the other obliged to bring up the rear. In this posture they travelled many hours, till they came into a wide and well-beaten road, which, as they turned to the right, soon brought them to a very fair promising inn, where they all alighted but so fatigued was Sophia that, as she had set her horse during the last five or six miles with great difficulties, so was she now incapable of dismounting from him without assistance. This the landlord, who had hold of her horse, presently perceiving, offered to lift her in his arms from her saddle, and she too readily accepted the tender of this service. Indeed, fortune seems to have resolved to put Sophia to the blush that day, and the second malicious attempt succeeded better than the first, for my landlord had no sooner received the young lady in his arms than his feet, which the gout had lately very severely handled, gave way, and down he tumbled. But, at the same time, with no less dexterity than gallantry, contrived to throw himself under his charming burden, so that he alone received any bruise from the fall. For the great injury which happened to Sophia was a violent shock given to her modesty by an immoderate grin, which, at her rising from the ground, she observed in the countenances of most of the bystanders. This made her suspect what had really happened, and what we shall not here relate, for the indulgence of those readers who are capable of laughing at the offence given to a young lady's delicacy. Accidents of this kind we have never regarded in a comical light, nor will we scruple to say that he must have a very inadequate idea of the modesty of a beautiful young woman, who would wish to sacrifice it to so paltry a satisfaction as can arise from laughter. This fright and shock 
joined to the violent fatigue which both her mind and body had undergone, almost overcame the excellent constitution of Sophia, and she had scarce strength sufficient to totter into the inn, leaning on the arm of her maid. Here she was no sooner seated than she called for a glass of water. But Mrs. Honour, very judiciously in my opinion, changed it into a glass of wine. Mrs. Fitzpatrick, hearing from Mrs. Honour that Sophia had not been in bed during the last two nights, and observing her to look very pale and wan with her fatigue, earnestly entreated her to refresh herself with some sleep. She was yet a stranger to her history or her apprehensions, but had she known both she would have given the same advice, for rest was visibly necessary for her, and their long journey through by-roads so entirely removed all danger of pursuit that she was herself perfectly easy on that account. Sophia was easily prevailed on to follow the counsel of a friend, which was hardly seconded by her maid. Mrs. Fitzpatrick likewise offered to bear her cousin company, which Sophia, with much complacence, accepted. The mistress was no sooner in bed than the maid prepared to follow her example. She began to make many apologies to her sister Abigail for leaving her alone in so horrid a place as an inn, but the other stopped her short, being as well inclined to a nap as herself, and desired the honour of being her bedfellow. Sophia's maid agreed to give her a share of her bed, but put in her claim to all the honour. So, after many curtsies and compliments, to bed together went the waiting-women, as their mistresses had done before them. It was usual with my landlord, as indeed it is with the whole fraternity, to inquire particularly of all coachmen, footmen, postboys, and others, into the names of all his guests, what their estate was and where it lay. It cannot therefore be wondered at that the many particular circumstances which attended our travellers, and especially their retiring all to sleep at so extraordinary and unusual an hour as ten in the morning, should excite his curiosity. As soon, therefore, as the guides entered the kitchen, he began to examine who the ladies were, and whence they came. But the guides, though they faithfully related all they knew, gave him very little satisfaction. On the contrary, they rather inflamed his curiosity than extinguished it. This landlord had the character, among all his neighbours, of being a very sagacious fellow. He was thought to see farther and deeper into things than any man in the parish, the parson himself not excepted. Perhaps his look had contributed not a little to procure him this reputation, for there was in this something wonderfully wise and significant, especially when he had a pipe in his mouth, which, indeed, he seldom was without. His behaviour, likewise, greatly assisted in promoting the opinion of his wisdom. In his deportment he was solemn, if not sullen, and when he spoke, which was seldom, he always delivered himself in a slow voice, and, though his sentences were short, they were still interrupted with many hums and ha's, ay ay's, and other expletives, so that, though he accompanied his words with certain explanatory gestures, such as shaking or nodding the head, or pointing with his forefinger, he generally left his hearers to understand more than he expressed. Nay, he commonly gave them a hint that he knew much more than he thought proper to disclose. This last circumstance alone may, indeed, very well account for his character of wisdom, since men are strangely inclined to worship what they do not understand. A grand secret, upon which several imposers on mankind have totally relied for the success of their frauds. This polite person, now taking his wife aside, asked her what she thought of the ladies lately arrived think of them said the wife why what should i think of them i know answered he what i think the guides tell strange stories one pretends to be come from gloucester and the other from upton and neither of them for what i can find can tell whither they are going but what people ever travel across the country from upton hither especially to london and one of the maid-servants before she alighted from her horse asked if this was not the london road now I have put all these circumstances together, and whom do you think I have found them out to be? Nay, answered she, you know I never pretend to guess at your discoveries. It is a good girl, replied he, chucking her under the chin. I must own you have always submitted to my knowledge of these matters. Why, then, depend upon it, mind what I say, depend upon it, they are certainly some of the rebel ladies, who, they say, travel with the young chevalier, and have taken a roundabout way to escape the duke's army. "'Husband,' quoth the wife, "'you have certainly hit it, for one of them is dressed as fine as any princess, and, to be sure, she looks for all the world like one. But yet, when I consider one thing—' "'When you consider,' cries the landlord contemptuously, "'come, pray let's hear what you consider.' "'Why, it is,' answered the wife, "'that she is too humble to be any very great lady, for, while our Betty was warming the bed, she called her nothing but child, and my dear, and sweetheart, 
and when betty offered to pull off her shoes and stockings she would not suffer her saying she would not give her the trouble pah answered the husband that is nothing dost think because you have seen some great ladies rude and uncivil to persons below them that none of them know how to behave themselves when they come before their inferiors i think i know people of fashion when i see them i think i do did not she call for a glass of water when she came in another sort of women would have called for a dram you know they would if she be not a woman of very great quality sell me for a fool and i believe those who buy me will have a bad bargain now would a woman of her quality travel without a footman unless upon some such extraordinary occasion nay to be sure husband cries she you know these matters better than i or most folk i think i do know something said he to be sure answered the wife the poor little heart looked so piteous when she sat down in the chair i protest i could not help having a compassion for her almost as much as if she had been a poor body but what's to be done husband even she be in a rebel i suppose you intend to betray her up to the court well she is a sweet-tempered good-humoured lady be she what she will and i shall hardly refrain from crying when i hear she is hanged or beheaded pooh answered the husband but as to what's to be done it is not so easy a matter to determine i hope before she goes away we shall have the news of a battle for if the chevalier should get the better she may gain us interest at court and make our fortunes without betraying her why that is true replied the wife and i heartily hope she will have it in her power certainly she is a sweet good lady it would go horribly against me to have her come to any harm pooh cries the landlord women are always so tender-hearted why you would not harbour rebels would you no certainly answered the wife and as for betraying her come what will on it nobody can blame us it is what anybody would do in our case while our prolific landlord who had not we see undeservedly the reputation of great wisdom among his neighbours was engaged in debating this matter with himself for he paid little attention to the opinion of his wife news arrived that the rebels had given the duke the slip and had got a day's march towards london and soon after arrived a famous jacobite squire who with great joy in his countenance shook the landlord by the hand saying all's our own boy ten thousand honest frenchmen are landed in suffolk old england for ever ten thousand french my brave lad i am going to tap away directly this news determined the opinion of the wise man and he resolved to make his court to the young lady when she arose for he had now he said discovered that she was no other than madame jenny cameron herself chapter three a very short chapter in which however is a sun a moon a star and an angel the sun for he keeps very good hours at this time of the year had been some time retired to rest when sophia arose greatly refreshed by her sleep which short as it was nothing but her extreme fatigue could have occasioned for though she had told her maid and perhaps herself too that she was perfectly easy when she left upton yet it is certain her mind was a little affected with that malady which is attended with all the restless symptoms of a fever and is perhaps the very distemper which physicians mean if they mean anything by the fever on the spirits mrs fitzpatrick likewise left her bed at the same time and having summoned her maid immediately dressed herself she was really a very pretty woman and had she been in any other company but that of sophia might have been thought beautiful but when mrs honour of her own accord attended for her mistress would not suffer her to be waked and had equipped our heroine the charms of mrs fitzpatrick who had performed the office of the morning star and had preceded greater glories shared the fate of that star and were totally eclipsed the moment those glories shone forth perhaps sophia never looked more beautiful than she did at this instant we ought not therefore to condemn the maid of the inn for her hyperbole who when she descended after having lighted the fire declared and ratified it with an oath that if ever there was an angel upon earth she was now above stairs sophia had acquainted her cousin with her design to go to london and mrs fitzpatrick had agreed to accompany her for the arrival of her husband at upton had put an end to her design of going to bath or to her aunt weston they had therefore no sooner finished their tea than sophia proposed to set out the moon then shining extremely bright and as for the frost she defied it nor had she any of those apprehensions which many young ladies would have felt at travelling by night for she had as we have before observed some little degree of natural courage and this her present sensations which bordered somewhat on despair greatly increased besides as she had already travelled twice with safety by the light of the moon she was the better emboldened to trust to it a third time 
The disposition of Mrs. Fitzpatrick was more timorous, for, though the greater terrors had conquered the less, and the presence of her husband had driven her away at so unseasonable an hour from Upton, yet, being now arrived at a place where she thought herself safe from his pursuit, these lesser terrors of I know not what operated so strongly that she earnestly entreated her cousin to stay till the next morning, and not expose herself to the dangers of travelling by night. Sophia, who was yielding to an excess, when she could neither laugh nor reason her cousin out of these apprehensions, at last gave way to them. Perhaps, indeed, had she known of her father's arrival at Upton, it might have been more difficult to have persuaded her. For, as to Jones, she had, I am afraid, no great horror at the thoughts of being overtaken by him. Nay, to confess the truth, I believe she rather wished than feared it, though I might honestly enough have concealed this wish from the reader, as it was one of those secret spontaneous emotions of the soul to which the reason is often a stranger. When our young ladies had determined to remain all that evening in their inn, they were attended by the landlady, who desired to know what their ladyships would be pleased to eat. Such charms were there in the voice, in the manner, and in the affable deportment of Sophia, that she ravished the landlady to the highest degree, and that good woman, concluding that she had attended Jenny Cameron, became in a moment a staunch Jacobite, and wished heartily well to the young pretender's cause, from the great sweetness and affability with which she had been treated by his supposed mistress. The two cousins began now to impart to each other their reciprocal curiosity to know what extraordinary accidents on both sides occasioned this so strange and unexpected meeting. At last Mrs. Fitzpatrick, having obtained of Sophia a promise of communicating likewise in her turn, began to relate what the reader, if he is desirous to know her history, may read in the ensuing chapter. End of section 38 of Tom Jones Section 39 of Tom Jones. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tom Jones by Henry Fielding. Book 11. Chapter 4. The History of Mrs. Fitzpatrick. Mrs. Fitzpatrick, after a silence of a few moments, fetching a deep sigh, thus began. It is natural to the unhappy to feel a secret concern in recollecting those periods of their lives which have been most delightful to them. The remembrance of past pleasures affects us with a kind of tender grief, like what we suffer for departed friends, and the ideas of both may be said to haunt our imaginations. For this reason I never reflect without sorrow on those days, the happiest far of my life, which we spent together when both were under the care of my aunt Western. Alas, why are Miss Grave Airs and Miss Giddy no more? You remember, I am sure, when we knew each other by no other names. Indeed, you gave the latter appellation with too much cause. I have since experienced how much I deserved it. You, my Sophia, was always my superior in everything, and I heartily hope you will be so in your fortune. I shall never forget the wise and matronly advice you once gave me, when I lamented being disappointed of a ball, though you could not be then fourteen years old. Oh, my Sophie, how blessed must have been my situation, when I could think such a disappointment a misfortune, and when indeed it was the greatest I had ever known. And yet, my dear Harriet, answered Sophia, it was then a serious matter with you. Comfort yourself, therefore, with thinking, that whatever you now lament may hereafter appear as trifling and contemptible as a ball would at this time. Alas, my Sophia, replied the other lady, you yourself will think otherwise of my present situation, for greatly must that tender heart be altered if my misfortunes do not draw many a sigh, nay, many a tear, from you. The knowledge of this should perhaps deter me from relating what I am convinced will so much affect you. Here Mrs. Fitzpatrick stopped, till, at the repeated entreaties of Sophia, she thus proceeded. Though you must have heard much of my marriage, Yet, as matters may probably have been misrepresented, I will set out from the very commencement of my unfortunate acquaintance with my present husband, which was at Bath, soon after you left my aunt and returned home to your father. Among the gay young fellows who were at this season at Bath, Mr. Fitzpatrick was one. He was handsome, dégagé, extremely gallant, and in his dress exceeded most others. In short, my dear, if you was unluckily to see him now, I could describe him no better than by telling you he was the very reverse of everything which he is, for he hath rusticated himself so long that he has become an absolute wild Irishman. But to proceed in my story, 
The qualifications which he then possessed so well recommended him that, though the people of quality at that time lived separate from the rest of the company, and excluded them from all their parties, Mr. Fitzpatrick found means to gain admittance. It was perhaps no easy matter to avoid him, for he required very little or no invitation, and as, being handsome and genteel, he found it no very difficult matter to ingratiate himself with the ladies, so, he having frequently drawn his sword, the men did not care publicly to affront him. Had it not been for some such reason, I believe he would have been soon expelled by his own sex, for surely he had no strict title to be preferred to the English gentry, nor did they seem inclined to show him any extraordinary favor. They all abused him behind his back, which might probably proceed from envy, for by the women he was well received, and very particularly distinguished by them. My aunt, though no person of quality herself, as she had always lived about the court, was enrolled in that party, for by whatever means you get into the polite circle when you are once there, it is sufficient merit for you that you are there. This observation, young as you was, you could scarce avoid making for my aunt who was free or reserved, with all people just as they had more or less of this merit. And this merit, I believe, it was, which principally recommended Mr. Fitzpatrick to her favor, in which he so well succeeded that he was always one of her private parties. Nor was he backward in returning such distinction, for he soon grew so very particular in his behavior to her that the scandal club first began to take notice of it, and the better disposed persons made a match between them. For my own part, I confess, I made no doubt but that his designs were strictly honorable, as the phrase is, that is, to rob a lady of her fortune by way of marriage. My aunt was, I conceive, neither young enough nor handsome enough to attract much wicked inclination, but she had matrimonial charms in great abundance. I was the more confirmed in this opinion from the extraordinary respect which he showed to myself from the first moment of our acquaintance. This I understood as an attempt to lessen, if possible, that disinclination which my interest might be supposed to give me towards the match. And I know not, but in some measure it had that effect. For, as I was well contented with my own fortune, and of all people the least a slave to interested views, so I could not be violently the enemy of a man with whose behavior to me I was greatly pleased. And the more so, as I was the only object of such respect, for he behaved at the same time to many women of quality without any respect at all. Agreeable as this was to me, he soon changed it into another kind of behavior, which was perhaps more so. He now put on much softness and tenderness, and languished and sighed abundantly. At times, indeed, whether from art or nature I will not determine, he gave his usual loose to gaiety and mirth. But this was always in general company and with other women. For even in a country dance, when he was not my partner, he became grave, and put on the softest look imaginable the moment he approached me. Indeed, he was in all things so very particular towards me, that I must have been blind not to have discovered it. And, 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 and you was more pleased still, my dear Harriet, cries Sophia. You need not be ashamed, added she, sighing. For sure there are irresistible charms and tenderness, which too many men are able to affect. True, answered her cousin. Men, who in all other instances want common sense, are very Machiavels in the art of loving. I wish I did not know an instance. Well, scandal now began to be as busy with me as it had before been with my aunt, and some good ladies did not scruple to affirm that Mr. Fitzpatrick had an intrigue with us both. But what may seem astonishing, my aunt never saw, nor in the least seemed to suspect, that which was visible enough, I believe, from both our behaviors. One would indeed think that love quite puts out the eyes of an old woman. In fact, they so greedily swallow the addresses which are made to them that, like an outrageous glutton, they are not at leisure to observe what passes amongst others at the same table. This I have observed in more cases than my own, and this was so strongly verified by my aunt that, though she often found us together at her return from the pump, the least canting word of his, pretending impatience at her absence, effectually smothered all suspicion. One artifice succeeded with her to admiration. This was his treating me like a little child, and never calling me by any other name in her presence but that of pretty miss. This indeed did him some disservice with your humble servant, but I soon saw through it, especially as in her absence he behaved to me, as I have said, in a different manner. However, if I was not greatly disobliged by a conduct of which I had discovered the design, I smarted very severely for it, for my aunt really conceived me to be what her lover, as she thought him, called me, and treated me in all respects as a perfect infant. To say the truth, I wonder she had not insisted on my again wearing leading strings. 
At last, my lover, for so he was, thought proper, in a most solemn manner, to disclose a secret which I had known long before. He now placed all the love which he had pretended to my aunt to my account. He lamented, in very pathetic terms, the encouragement she had given him, and made a high merit of the tedious hours in which he had undergone her conversation. "'What shall I tell you, my dear Sophia?' "'Then I will confess the truth. I was pleased with my man. I was pleased with my conquest. To rival my aunt delighted me. To rival so many other women charmed me. In short, I am afraid I did not behave as I should do, even upon the very first declaration. I wish I did not almost give him positive encouragement before we parted.' The bath now talked loudly. I might almost say roared against me. Several young women affected to shun my acquaintance, not so much perhaps from any real suspicion as from a desire of banishing me from a company in which I too much engrossed their favorite man. And here I cannot omit expressing my gratitude to the kindness intended me by Mr. Nash, who took me one day aside and gave me advice, which if I had followed, I had been a happy woman. Child, says he. I am sorry to see the familiarity which subsists between you and a fellow who is altogether unworthy of you, and I am afraid will prove your ruin. As for your old stinking aunt, if it was to be no injury to you and my pretty Sophie Western, I assure you I repeat his words, I should be heartily glad that the fellow was in possession of all that belongs to her. I never advise old women, for if they take it into their heads to go to the devil, it is no more possible than worthwhile to keep them from him. Innocence and youth and beauty are worthy a better fate, and I would save them from his clutches. Let me advise you, therefore, dear child, never suffer this fellow to be particular with you again. Many more things he said to me, which I have now forgotten, and indeed I attended very little to them at the time, for inclination contradicted all he said, and besides I could not be persuaded that women of quality would condescend to familiarity with such a person as he described. But I am afraid, my dear, I shall tire you with a detail of so many minute circumstances. To be concise, therefore, imagine me married. Imagine me with my husband at the feet of my aunt. And then imagine the maddest woman in Bedlam in a raving fit, and your imagination will suggest to you no more than what really happened. The very next day my aunt left the place, partly to avoid seeing Mr. Fitzpatrick or myself, and as much perhaps to avoid seeing anyone else. For, though I am told she hath since denied everything stoutly, I believe she was then a little confounded at her disappointment. Since that time I have written to her many letters, but never could obtain an answer, which I must own sits somewhat the heavier, as she herself was, though undesignedly, the occasion of all my sufferings. For, had it not been under the color of paying his addresses to her, Mr. Fitzpatrick would never have found sufficient opportunities to have engaged my heart, which, in other circumstances, I still flatter myself would not have been an easy conquest of such a person." Indeed, I believe I should not have erred so grossly in my choice if I had relied on my own judgment. But I trusted totally to the opinion of others, and very foolishly took the merit of a man for granted, whom I saw so universally well received by the women. What is the reason, my dear, that we, who have understandings equal to the wisest and greatest of the other sex, so often make choice of the silliest fellows for companions and favorites? It raises my indignation to the highest pitch to reflect on the numbers of women of sense who have been undone by fools." Here she paused a moment, but, Sophia making no answer, she proceeded as in the next chapter. Chapter 5. In which the history of Mrs. Fitzpatrick is continued. We remained at Bath no longer than a fortnight after our wedding, for as to any reconciliation with my aunt there were no hopes, and of my fortune not one farthing could be touched till I was of age, of which I now wanted more than two years. My husband, therefore, was resolved to set out for Ireland, against which I remonstrated very earnestly, and insisted on a promise which he had made me before our marriage that I should never take this journey against my consent, and indeed I never intended to consent to it, nor will anybody, I believe, blame me for that resolution. But this, however, I never mentioned to my husband, and petitioned only for the reprieve of a month, but he had fixed the day, and to that day he obstinately adhered. The evening before our departure, as we were disputing this point with great eagerness on both sides, he started suddenly from his chair, and left me abruptly, saying he was going to the rooms. He was hardly out of the house when I saw a paper lying on the floor, which I suppose he had carelessly pulled from his pocket, together with his handkerchief. This paper I took up, and, finding it to be a letter, I made no scruple to open and read it. And indeed I read it so often that I can repeat it to you almost word for word. This, then, was the letter. To Mr. Brian Fitzpatrick. Sir, 
yours received and am surprised you should use me in this manner as have never seen any of your cash unless for one linsey woolsey coat and your bill now is upwards of a hundred and fifty pounds consider sir how often you have fobbed me off with your being shortly to be married to this lady and to other lady but i can neither live on hopes or promises nor will my woolen draper take any such in payment you tell me you are secure of having either the aunt or the niece, and that you might have married the aunt before this, whose jointure you say is immense, but that you prefer the niece on account of her ready money. Pray, sir, take a fool's advice for once, and marry the first you can get. You will pardon my offering my advice, as you know I sincerely wish you well. Shall draw on you per next post in favor of Messrs. John Drugget and Company, at fourteen days, which doubt not your honoring, and am, sir, your humble servant, Sam Cosgrave. This was the letter word for word. Guess, my dear girl, guess how this letter affected me. You prefer the niece on account of her ready money. If every one of these words had been a dagger, I could with pleasure have stabbed them into his heart. But I will not recount my frantic behavior on the occasion. I had pretty well spent my tears before his return home, but sufficient remains of them appeared in my swollen eyes. He threw himself sullenly into his chair, and for a long time we were both silent. At length, in a haughty tone, he said, I hope, madam, your servants have packed up all your things, for the coach will be ready by six in the morning. My patience was totally subdued by this provocation, and I answered, No, sir, there is a letter still remains unpacked, and then throwing it on the table I fell to upbraiding him with the most bitter language I could invent. Whether guilt or shame or prudence restrained him, I cannot say. But— Though he is the most passionate of men, he exerted no rage on this occasion. He endeavored, on the contrary, to pacify me by the most gentle means. He swore the phrase in the letter to which I principally objected was not his, nor had he ever written any such. He owned, indeed, the having mentioned his marriage, and that preference which he had given to myself, but denied with many oaths the having mentioned any such matter at all on account of the straits he was in for money, arising, he said, from his having too long neglected his estate in Ireland." And this, he said, which he could not bear to discover to me, was the only reason of his having so strenuously insisted on our journey. He then used several very endearing expressions, and concluded by a very fond caress and many violent protestations of love. There was one circumstance which, though he did not appeal to it, had much weight with me in his favor, and that was the word jointure in the tailor's letter, whereas my aunt never had been married, and this Mr. Fitzpatrick well knew. As I imagined, therefore, that the fellow might have inserted this of his own head, or from hearsay, I persuaded myself he might have ventured likewise on that odious line on no better authority. What reasoning was this, my dear? Was I not an advocate rather than a judge? But why do I mention such a circumstance as this, or appeal to it for the justification of my forgiveness? In short, had he been guilty of twenty times as much, half the tenderness and fondness which he used would have prevailed on me to have forgiven him. I now made no farther objections to our setting out, which we did the next morning, and in a little more than a week arrived at the seat of Mr. Fitzpatrick. Your curiosity will excuse me from relating any occurrences which passed during our journey, for it would indeed be highly disagreeable to travel it over again, and no less so to you to travel it over with me. This seat, then, is an ancient mansion house. If I was in one of those merry humors in which you have so often seen me, I could describe it to you ridiculously enough. It looked as if it had been formerly inhabited by a gentleman. Here was room enough, and not the less room on account of the furniture, for indeed there is very little in it. An old woman, who seemed coeval with the building, and greatly resembled her whom Chamont mentions in The Orphan, received us at the gate, and in a house scarce human, and to me unintelligible, welcomed her master home. In short, the whole scene was so gloomy and melancholy that it threw my spirits into the lowest dejection, which my husband discerning, instead of relieving, increased by two or three malicious observations. "'There are good houses, madam,' says he, as you find in other places besides England, but perhaps you would rather be in a dirty lodgings at Bath. Happy, my dear, is the woman who, in any state of life, hath a cheerful, good-natured companion to support and comfort her. But why do I reflect on happy situations only to aggravate my own misery? My companion, far from clearing up the gloom of solitude, soon convinced me that I must have been wretched with him in any place, and in any condition. In a word, he was a surly fellow, 
a character perhaps you have never seen, for indeed no woman ever sees it exemplified but in a father, a brother, or a husband. And though you have a father, he is not of that character. This surly fellow had formerly appeared to me the very reverse, and so he did still to every other person. Good heaven, how is it possible for a man to maintain a constant lie in his appearance abroad and in company, and to content himself with showing disagreeable truth only at home? Here, my dear, they make themselves amends for the uneasy restraint which they put on their tempers in the world. For I have observed, the more merry and gay and good-humoured my husband hath at any time been in company, the more sullen and morose he was sure to become at our next private meeting. How shall I describe his barbarity? To my fondness he was cold and insensible. My little comical ways, which you, my Sophie, and which others have called so agreeable, he treated with contempt. In my most serious moments he sung and whistled, and whenever I was thoroughly dejected and miserable he was angry and abused me, for though he was never pleased with my good humour, nor ascribed it to my satisfaction in him, yet my low spirits always offended him, and those he imputed to my repentance of having, as he said, married an Irishman. You will easily conceive, my dear Graveairs, I ask your pardon, I really forgot myself, that when a woman makes an imprudent match in the sense of the world, that is, when she is not an errant prostitute to pecuniary interest, she must necessarily have some inclination and affection for her man. You will as easily believe that this affection may possibly be lessened. Nay, I do assure you, contempt will wholly eradicate it. This contempt I now began to entertain for my husband, whom I now discovered to be, I must use the expression, an errant blockhead. Perhaps you will wonder I did not make this discovery long before, but women will suggest a thousand excuses to themselves for the folly of those they like. Besides, give me leave to tell you, it requires a most penetrating eye to discern a fool through the disguises of gaiety and good breeding. It will be easily imagined that, when I once despised my husband, as I confess to you I soon did, I must consequently dislike his company, and indeed I had the happiness of being very little troubled with it, for our house was now most elegantly furnished, our cellars well stocked, and dogs and horses provided in great abundance. As my gentleman therefore entertained his neighbors with great hospitality, so his neighbors resorted to him with great alacrity, and sports and drinking consumed so much of his time that a small part of his conversation, that is to say, of his ill humors, fell to my share. Happy would it have been for me if I could as easily have avoided all other disagreeable company, but, alas, I was confined to some which constantly tormented me, and the more as I saw no prospect of being relieved from them. These companions were my own rocking thoughts, which plagued and in a manner haunted me night and day. In this situation I passed through a scene, the horrors of which can neither be painted nor imagined. Think, my dear, figure if you can to yourself, what I must have undergone. I became a mother by the man I scorned, hated, and detested. I went through all the agonies and miseries of a lying in, ten times more painful in such a circumstance than the worst labor can be when one endures it for a man one loves in a desert, or rather, indeed, a scene of riot and revel, without a friend, without a companion, or without any of those agreeable circumstances which often alleviate, and perhaps sometimes more than compensate, the sufferings of our sex at that season. Chapter 6. In which the mistake of the landlord throws Sophia into a dreadful consternation. Mrs. Fitzpatrick was proceeding in her narrative when she was interrupted by the entrance of dinner, greatly to the concern of Sophia, for the misfortunes of her friend had raised her anxiety, and left her no appetite but what Mrs. Fitzpatrick was to satisfy by her relation. The landlord now intended with a plate under his arm, and with the same respect in his countenance and address which he would have put on had the ladies arrived in a coach and six. The married lady seemed less affected with her own misfortunes than was her cousin, for the former eat very heartily, whereas the latter could hardly swallow a morsel. Sophia likewise showed more concern and sorrow in her countenance than appeared in the other lady, who, having observed these symptoms in her friend, begged her to be comforted, saying, "'Perhaps all may yet end better than either you or I expect.' Our landlord thought he had now an opportunity to open his mouth, and was resolved not to omit it. "'I am sorry, madam,' cries he, that your ladyship can't eat, for to be sure you must be hungry after so long fasting. I hope your ladyship is not uneasy at anything, for, as madam there says, all may end better than anybody expects. A gentleman who was here just now brought excellent news, and perhaps some folks who have given other folks the slip may get to London before they are overtaken, and if they do, I make no doubt but they will find people who will be very ready to receive them. 
All persons under the apprehension of danger convert whatever they see and hear into the objects of that apprehension. Sophia, therefore, immediately concluded from the foregoing speech that she was known and pursued by her father. She was now struck with the utmost consternation, and for a few minutes deprived of the power of speech, which she no sooner recovered than she desired the landlord to send his servants out of the room, and then, addressing herself to him, said, I perceive, sir, you know who we are, but I beseech you, nay, I am convinced if you have any compassion or goodness, you will not betray us. I betray your ladyship, quoth the landlord. No, and then he swore several very hearty oaths. I would sooner be cut into ten thousand pieces. I hate all treachery. I, I never betrayed any one in my life yet, and I am sure I shall not begin with so sweet a lady as your ladyship. All the world would very much blame me if I should, since it will be in your ladyship's power so shortly to reward me. My wife can witness for me. I knew your ladyship the moment you came into the house. I said it was your honor before I lifted you from your horse, and I shall carry the bruises I got in your ladyship's service to the grave. But what signified that, as long as I saved your ladyship? To be sure, some people this morning would have thought of getting a reward, but no such thought ever entered into my head. I would sooner starve than take any reward for betraying your ladyship. I promise you, sir, says Sophia. If it be ever in my power to reward you, you shall not lose by your generosity. Alack a day, madam, answered the landlord, in your ladyship's power, heaven put it as much into your will. I am only afraid your honor will forget such a poor man as an innkeeper, but if your ladyship should not, I hope you will remember what reward I refused. Refused! That is, I would have refused, and to be sure it may be called refusing, for I might have had it certainly, and to be sure you might have been in some houses. But for my part would not methinks for the world have your ladyship wronged me so much as to imagine I ever thought of betraying you, even before I heard the good news. What news, pray? says Sophia, something eagerly. Hath not your ladyship heard it, then? cries the landlord. Nay, like enough, for I heard it only a few minutes ago, and if I had never heard it, may the devil fly away with me this instant if I would have betrayed your honor. No, if I would, may I. Here he subjoined several dreadful imprecations, which Sophia at last interrupted, and begged to know what he meant by the news. He was going to answer when Mrs. Honor came running into the room, all pale and breathless, and cried out, Madam, we are all undone, all ruined, they are come, they are come. These words almost froze up the blood of Sophia, but Mrs. Fitzpatrick asked Honor who were come. Who, answered she, why the French? Several hundred thousands of them are landed, and we shall all be murdered and ravished. As a miser, who hath in some well-built city a cottage, value twenty shillings, when at a distance he is alarmed with the news of a fire, turns pale and trembles at his loss. But when he finds the beautiful palaces only are burnt, and his own cottage remains safe, he comes instantly to himself, and smiles at his good fortunes. Or as, for we dislike something in the former simile, the tender mother, when terrified with the apprehension that her darling boy is drowned, is struck senseless and almost dead with consternation. But when she is told the little master is safe, and the victory only, with twelve hundred brave men gone to the bottom, Life and sense again return, maternal fondness enjoys the sudden relief from all its fears, and the general benevolence which at another time would have deeply felt the dreadful catastrophe lies fast asleep in her mind. So Sophia, than whom none was more capable of tenderly feeling the general calamity of her country, found such immediate satisfaction from the relief of those terrors she had of being overtaken by her father, that the arrival of the French scarce made any impression on her. She gently chid her maid for the fright into which she had thrown her, and said she was glad it was no worse, for that she had feared somebody else was come. Ay, ay, quoth the landlord, smiling, her ladyship knows better things. She knows the French are our very best friends, and come over hither only for our good. They are the people who are to make old England flourish again. I warrant her honor thought the duke was coming, and that was enough to put her into a fright. I was going to tell your ladyship the news. His honor's majesty, heaven bless him, hath given the duke the slip, and is marching as fast as he can to London, and ten thousand French are landed to join him on the road. Sophia was not greatly pleased with this news, nor with the gentlemen who related it, but, as she still imagined he knew her, for she could not possibly have any suspicion of the real truth, she durst not show any dislike. And now the landlord, having removed the cloth from the table, withdrew, but at his departure frequently repeated his hopes of being remembered hereafter. The mind of Sophia was not at all easy under the supposition of being known at this house. 
for she still applied to herself many things which the landlord had addressed to Jenny Cameron. She therefore ordered her maid to pump out of him by what means he had become acquainted with her person, and who had offered him the reward for betraying her. She likewise ordered the horses to be in readiness by four in the morning, at which hour Mrs. Fitzpatrick promised to bear her company, and then, composing herself as well as she could, she desired that lady to continue her story. End of section 39《Section 40 of Tom Jones》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Renee Bell Tom Jones by Henry Fielding Book 11, Chapter 7 In which Mrs. Fitzpatrick concludes her history. While Mrs. Honor, in pursuance of the commands of her mistress, ordered a bowl of punch, and invited my landlord and landlady to partake of it, Mrs. Fitzpatrick thus went on with her relation. Most of the officers who were quartered at a town in our neighborhood were of my husband's acquaintance. Among these there was a lieutenant, a very pretty sort of man, and who was married to a woman, so agreeable both in her temper and conversation, that from our first knowing each other, which was soon after my lying in, we were almost inseparable companions, for I had the good fortune to make myself equally agreeable to her. The lieutenant, who was neither a sot nor a sportsman, was frequently of our parties. Indeed, he was very little with my husband, and no more than good breeding constrained him to be, as he lived almost constantly at our house. My husband often expressed much dissatisfaction at the lieutenant's preferring my company to his. He was very angry with me on that account and gave me many a hearty curse for drawing away his companion, saying, I ought to be damned for having spoiled one of the prettiest fellows in the world by making a milksop of him. You will be mistaken, my dear Sophia, if you imagine that the anger of my husband arose from my depriving him of a companion, for the lieutenant was not a person with whose society a fool could be pleased. And if I should admit the possibility of this, so little right had my husband to place the loss of his companion to me, that I am convinced it was my conversation alone which induced him ever to come to the house. No, child, it was envy. The worst and most rancorous kind of envy. The envy of superiority of understanding. The wretch could not bear to see my conversation preferred to his, by a man of whom he could not entertain the least jealousy. Oh, my dear Sophie, you are a woman of sense. If you marry a man, is as most probable you will, of less capacity than yourself, make frequent trials of his temper before marriage, and see whether he can bear to submit to such a superiority. Promise me, Sophie, you will take this advice, for you will hereafter find its importance. It is very likely I shall never marry at all, answered Sophia. I think, at least, I shall never marry a man in whose understanding I see any defects before marriage, and I promise you, I would rather give up my own than see any such afterwards. Give up your understanding, replied Mrs. Fitzpatrick. Oh, fly, child, I will not believe so meanly of you. Everything else I might myself be brought to give up, but never this. Nature would not have allotted this superiority to the wife in so many instances, if she had intended we should all of us have surrendered it to the husband. This, indeed, men of sense never expect of us, of which the lieutenant I have just mentioned was one notable example, for though he had a very good understanding, he always acknowledged, as was really true, that his wife had a better. And this, perhaps, was one reason of the hatred my tyrant bore her before he would be so governed by a wife, he said, especially such an ugly bit, for indeed she was not a regular beauty, but very agreeable and extremely genteel. He would see all the women upon earth at the devil, which was a very usual phrase with him. He said he wondered what I could see in her to be so charmed with her company, since this woman, says he, had come among us, there is an end of your beloved reading which you pretended to like so much that you could not afford time to return the visits of the ladies in this country. And I must confess I had been guilty of a little rudeness this way, for the ladies there are at least no better than the mere country ladies here, and I think I need make no other excuse to you for declining any intimacy with them. 
this correspondence however continued a whole year even all the while the lieutenant was quartered in that town for which i was contented to pay the tax of being constantly abused in the manner above mentioned by my husband i mean when he was at home for he was frequently absent a month at a time at dublin and once made a journey of two months to london in all which journeys i thought it a very singular happiness that he never once desired my company nay by his frequent censures on men who could not travel as he phrased it without a wife tied up to their tail he sufficiently intimated that had i been never so desirous of accompanying him my wishes would have been in vain but heaven knows such wishes were very far from my thoughts at length my friend was removed from me and i was again left to my solitude to the tormenting conversation with my own reflections and to apply to books for my only comfort i now read almost all day long how many books do you think i read in three months i can't guess indeed cousin answered sophia perhaps half a score half a score half a thousand child answered the other i read a good deal in daniel's english history of france a great deal in plutarch's lives the atalantis pope's homer dryden's plays shillingworth the countess d'aulnois and locke's human understanding during this interval i wrote three very supplicating and i thought moving letters to my aunt but as i received no answer to any of them my disdain would not suffer me to continue my application here she stopped and looking earnestly at sophia said methinks my dear i read something in your eyes which reproaches me of a neglect in another place where i should have met with a kinder return indeed dear harriet answered sophia your story is an apology for any neglect but indeed i feel that i have been guilty of a remissness without so good an excuse yet pray proceed for i long though i tremble to hear the end thus then mrs fitzpatrick resumed her narrator my husband now took a second journey to england where he continued upwards of three months during the greater part of this time i led a life which nothing but having led a worse could make me think tolerable for perfect solitude can never be reconciled to a social mind like mine but when it relieves you from the company of those you hate but added to my wretchedness was the loss of my little infant not that i pretend to have had for it that extravagant tenderness of which i believe i might have been capable under other circumstances but i resolved in every instance to discharge the duty of the tenderest mother and this care prevented me from feeling the weight of that heaviest of all things when it can be at all said to lie heavy on our hands i had spent full ten weeks almost entirely by myself having seen nobody all that time except my servants and a very few visitors when a young lady a relation to my husband came from a distant part of ireland to visit me she had stayed once before a week at my house and then i gave her a pressing invitation to return for she was a very agreeable woman and had improved good natural parts by a proper education indeed she was to me a welcome guest a few days after her arrival perceiving me in very low spirits without inquiring the cause which indeed she very well knew the young lady fell to compassionating my case she said though politeness had prevented me from complaining to my husband's relations of his behaviour yet they all were very sensible of it and felt great concern upon that account but none more than herself and after some more general discourse on this head which i own i could not forbear countenancing at last after much previous precaution and enjoined concealment she communicated to me as a profound secret that my husband kept a mistress you will certainly imagine i heard this news with the utmost insensibility upon my word if you do your imagination will mislead you contempt had not so kept down my anger to my husband but that hatred rose again on this occasion what can be the reason of this are we so abominably selfish that we can be concerned at others having possession even of what we despise or are we not rather abominably vain and is not this the greatest injury done to our vanity what think you sophia i don't know indeed answered sophia i have never troubled myself with any of these deep contemplations but i think the lady did very ill in communicating to you such a secret and yet my dear this conduct is natural replied mrs fitzpatrick 
and when you have seen me read as much as myself, you will acknowledge it to be so. I am sorry to hear it is natural, returned Sophia, for I want neither reading nor experience to convince me that it is very dishonorable and very ill-natured. Nay, it is surely as ill-bred to tell a husband or wife of the faults of each other as to tell them of their own. Well, continued Mrs. Fitzpatrick, my husband at last returned, and if I am thoroughly acquainted with my own thoughts, I hated him now more than ever, but I despised him rather less, for certainly nothing so much weakens our contempt as an injury done to our pride or our vanity. He now assumed a carriage to me so very different from what he had lately worn, and so nearly resembling his behavior the first week of our marriage, that had I now had any spark of love remaining, he might possibly have rekindled my fondness for him. But though hatred may succeed to contempt, and may perhaps get the better of it, love, I believe, cannot. The truth is, the passion of love is too restless to remain contented without the gratification which it receives from its object, and one can no more be inclined to love without loving than we can have eyes without seeing. When a husband, therefore, ceases to be the object of this passion, it is most probable some other man. I say, my dear, if your husband grows indifferent to you, if you once come to despise him, I say, that is, if you have the passion of love in you, let, I have bewildered myself so, but one is apt in these abstracted considerations to lose the concatenation of ideas, as Mr. Locke says. In short, the truth is, in short, I scarce know what it is, but as I was saying, my husband returned, and his behavior at first greatly surprised me, but he soon acquainted me with the motive and taught me to account for it. In a word, then, he had spent and lost all the ready money of my fortune, and as he could mortgage his own estate no deeper, he was now desirous to supply himself with cash for his extravagance by selling a little estate of mine, which he could not do without my assistance and to obtain this favor was the whole and sole motive of all the fondness which he now put on. With this I peremptorily refused to comply. I told him, and I told him truly, that had I been possessed of the Indies at our first marriage, he might have commanded it all, for it had been a constant maxim with me that where a woman disposes of her heart, she should always deposit her fortune. But, as he had been so kind long ago to restore the former into my possession, I was resolved likewise to retain what little remained of the latter. I will not describe to you the passion into which these words and the resolute air in which they were spoken through him, nor will I trouble you with the whole scene which succeeded between us. Out came, you may be well assured, the story of the mistress, and out it did come, with all the embellishments which anger and disdain could bestow upon it. Mr. Fitzpatrick seemed a little thunderstruck with this, and more confused than I had seen him, though his ideas are always confused enough, heaven knows. He did not, however, endeavor to exculpate himself, but took a method which almost equally confounded me. What was this but recrimination? He affected to be jealous. He may, for aught I know, be inclined enough to jealousy in his natural temper. Nay, he must have had it from nature, or the devil must have put it into his head, for I defy all the world to cast a just aspersion on my character. Nay, the most scandalous tongues have never dared censure my reputation. My fame, I thank heaven, hath always been as spotless as my life, and let falsehood itself accuse that if it dare. No, my dear grave heirs, however provoked, however ill-treated, however injured in my love, I have firmly resolved never to give the least room for censure on this account. And yet, my dear, there are some people so malicious, some tongues so venomous that no innocence can escape them. The most undesigned word, the most accidental look, the least familiarity, the most innocent freedom, will be misconstrued and magnified into I know not what by some people. But I despise my dear grave heirs. I despise all such slander. No such malice, I assure you, ever gave me an uneasy moment. No, no, I promise you I am above all that. But where was I? Oh, let me see. I told you my husband was jealous. And of whom, I pray? Why, of whom but the lieutenant I mentioned to you before? He was obliged to resort above a year and more back to find any object for this unaccountable passion, if indeed he really felt any such, 
and was not an arid counterfeit in order to abuse me. But I have tired you already with too many particulars. I will now bring my story to a very speedy conclusion. In short, then, after many scenes very unworthy to be repeated, in which my cousin engaged so heartily on my side, that Mr. Fitzpatrick at last turned her out of doors, when he found I was neither to be soothed nor bullied into compliance, he took a very violent method indeed. Perhaps you will conclude he beat me, but this, though he hath approached very near to it, he never actually did. He confined me to my room, without suffering me to have either pen, ink, paper, or book, and the servant every day made my bed and brought me my food. When I had remained a week under this imprisonment, he made me a visit, and with the voice of a schoolmaster, or what is often much the same, of a tyrant, asked me if I would yet comply. I answered very stoutly that I would die first. Then so you shall, and be damned, cries he, for you shall never go alive out of this room. Here I remained a fortnight longer, and, to say the truth, my constancy was almost subdued, and I began to think of submission, when one day, in the absence of my husband, who was gone abroad for some short time, by the greatest good fortune in the world, an accident happened. I, at a time when I began to give way to the utmost despair, everything would be excusable at such a time. At that very time I received, but it would take up an hour to tell you all particulars, in one word, then, for I will not tire you with circumstances, gold, the common key to all padlocks, opened my door and set me at liberty. I now made haste to Dublin, where I immediately procured a passage to England, and was proceeding to Bath in order to throw myself into the protection of my aunt or of your father, or of any relation who would afford it me. My husband overtook me last night at the inn where I lay, in which you left a few minutes before me, but I had the good luck to escape him and to follow you. And thus, my dear, ends my history. A tragical one, I am sure, it is to myself, but perhaps I ought rather to apologize to you for its dullness. Sophia heaved a deep sigh and answered, Indeed, Harriet, I pity you from my soul, but what could you expect? Why? Why would you marry an Irishman? Upon my word, replied her cousin, your censure is unjust. There are among the Irish men of as much worth and honor as any among the English. Nay, to speak the truth, generosity of spirit is rather more common among them. I have known some examples there, too, of good husbands, and I believe these are not very plenty in England. Ask me, rather, what I could expect when I married a fool, and I will tell you a solemn truth. I did not know him to be so. Can no man, said Sophia, in a very low and altered voice, do you think, make a bad husband who is not a fool? That, answered the other, is too general a negative, but none, I believe, is so likely as a fool to prove so. Among my acquaintance, the silliest fellows are the worst husbands, and I will venture to assert as a fact that a man of sense rarely behaves very ill to a wife who deserves very well. Chapter 8. A dreadful alarm in the inn, with the arrival of an unexpected friend of Mrs. Fitzpatrick. Sophia now, at the desire of her cousin, related not what follows, but what hath gone before in this history, for which reason the reader will, I suppose, excuse me for not repeating it over again. One remark, however, I cannot forbear making on her narrative, namely, that she made no more mention of Jones, from the beginning to the end, than if there had been no such person alive. This I will neither endeavor to account for nor to excuse. Indeed, if this may be called a kind of dishonesty, it seems the more inexcusable from the apparent openness and explicit sincerity of the other lady. But so it was. Just as Sophia arrived at the conclusion of her story, there arrived in the room where the two ladies were sitting a noise, not unlike in loudness, to that of a pack of hounds just let out from their kennel, nor in shrillness to cats when caterwauling, or to screech owls, or indeed more like, for what animal can resemble a human voice, to those sounds which, in the pleasant mansions of that gate which seems to derive its name from a duplicity of tongues, issue from the mouths and sometimes from the nostrils of those fair river nymphs, yclepid of old the Naiades, 
in the vulgar tongue translated oyster wenches for when instead of the antient libations of milk and honey and oil the rich distillation from the juniper berry or perhaps from malt hath by the early devotion of their votaries been poured forth in great abundance should any daring tongue with unhallowed license profane i e depreciate the delicate fat milton oyster the place sounded firm the flounder as much alive as when in the water the shrimp as big as a prawn the fine cod alive but a few hours ago or any other of the various treasures which those water deities who fish the sea and rivers have committed to the care of the nymphs the angry naiades lift up their immortal voices and the profane wretches struck deaf for his impiety such was the noise which now burst from one of the rooms below and soon the thunder which long had rattled at a distance began to approach nearer and nearer till having ascended by degrees upstairs it at last entered the apartment where the ladies were in short to drop all metaphor and figure mrs honour having scolded violently below stairs and continued the same all the way up came in to her mistress in a most outrageous passion crying out what doth your ladyship think would you imagine that this impudent villain the master of this house hath the impudence to tell me nay to stand it out to my face that your ladyship is that nasty stinking whore jenny cameron the caller that runs about the country with the pretender nay the lying saucy villain had the assurance to tell me that your ladyship had owned yourself to be so but i have clawed the rascal i have left the marks of my nails in his impudent face my lady says i you saucy scoundrel my lady is meet for no pretenders she is a young lady of as good fashion and family and fortune as any in somersetshire did you never hear of the great squire weston sirrah she is his only daughter she is and heiress to all his great estate my lady to be called a nasty scotch whore by such a varlet to be sure i wish i had knocked his brains out with a punch bowl the principal uneasiness with which sophia was affected on this occasion honour had herself caused by having in her passion discovered who she was however as this mistake of the landlord sufficiently accounted for those passages which sophia had before mistaken she acquired some ease on that account nor could she upon the whole forbear smiling this enraged honour and she cried indeed madam i did not think your ladyship would have made a laughing matter of it to be called whore by such an impudent low rascal your ladyship may be angry with me for aught i know for taking your part since proffered service they say stings but to be sure i could never bear to hear a lady of mine called whore nor will i bear it i am sure your ladyship is as virtuous a lady as ever set foot on english ground and i will claw any villain's eyes out who dares for to offer to presume for to say the least word to the contrary nobody ever could say the least ill of the character of any lady that ever i waited upon hinkele lecrone in plain truth honour had as much love for her mistress as most servants have that is to say but besides this her pride obliged her to support the character of the lady she waited on for she thought her own was in a very close manner connected with it in proportion as the character of her mistress was raised hers likewise as she conceived was raised with it and on the contrary she thought the one could not be lowered without the other on this subject reader i must stop a moment to tell thee a story the famous nell gwynn stepping one day from a house where she had made a short visit into her coach saw a great mob assembled and her footmen all bloody and dirty the fellow being asked by his mistress the reason of his being in that condition answered i have been fighting madam with an impudent rascal who called your ladyship a whore you blockhead replied mrs gwynn at this rate you must fight every day of your life why you fool all the world knows it do they cries the fellow in a muttering voice after he had shut the coach door they shan't call me a horse footman for all that thus the passion of mrs honour appears natural enough even if it were to be no otherwise accounted for but in reality there was another cause of her anger for which we must beg leave to remind our reader of a circumstance mentioned in the above simile 
there are indeed certain liquors which being applied to our passions or to fire produce effects the very reverse of those produced by water as they serve to kindle and inflame rather than to extinguish among these the generous liquor called punch is one it was not therefore without reason that the learned dr cheney used to call drinking punch pouring liquid fire down your throat now mrs honour had unluckily poured so much of this liquid fire down her throat that the smoke of it began to ascend into her pericranium and blinded the eyes of reason which is there supposed to keep her residence while the fire itself from the stomach easily reached the heart and there inflamed the noble passion of pride so that upon the whole we shall cease to wonder at the violent rage of the waiting one though at first sight we must confess the cause seems inadequate to the effect sophia and her cousin both did all in their power to extinguish these flames which had roared so loudly all over the house they at length prevailed or to carry the metaphor one step farther the fire having consumed all the fuel which the language affords to wit every reproachful term in it at last went out of its own accord but though tranquillity was restored above stairs it was not so below where my landlady highly resenting the injury done to the beauty of her husband by the flesh spades of mrs honour called aloud for revenge and justice as to the poor man who had principally suffered in the engagement he was perfectly quiet perhaps the blood which he lost might have cooled his anger for the enemy had not only applied her nails to his cheeks but likewise her fist to his nostrils which lamented the blow with tears of blood in great abundance to this we may add reflections on his mistake but indeed nothing so effectually silenced his resentment as the manner in which he now discovered his error for as to the behaviour of mrs honour it had the more confirmed him in his opinion but he was now assured by a person of great figure and who was attended by a great equipage that one of the ladies was a woman of fashion and his intimate acquaintance by the orders of this person the landlord now ascended and acquainted our fair travellers that a great gentleman below desired to do them the honour of waiting on them sophia turned pale and trembled at this message though the reader will conclude it was too civil notwithstanding the landlord's blunder to have come from her father but fear hath the common fault of a justice of peace and is apt to conclude hastily from every slight circumstance without examining the evidence on both sides to ease the reader's curiosity therefore rather than his apprehensions we proceed to inform him that an irish peer had arrived very late that evening at the inn in his way to london this nobleman having sallied from his supper at the hurricane before commemorated had seen the attendant of mrs fitzpatrick and upon a short inquiry was informed that her lady with whom he was very particularly acquainted was above this information he had no sooner received than he addressed himself to the landlord pacified him and sent him upstairs with compliments rather civiler than those which were delivered it may perhaps be wondered at that the waiting woman herself was not the messenger employed on this occasion but we are sorry to say she was not at present qualified for that or indeed for any other office the rum for so the landlord chose to call the distillation from malt had basely taken the advantage of the fatigue which the poor woman had undergone and had made terrible depredations on her noble faculties at a time when they were very unable to resist the attack we shall not describe this tragical scene too fully but we thought ourselves obliged by that historic integrity which we profess shortly to hint a matter which we would otherwise have been glad to have spared many historians indeed for want of this integrity or diligence to say no worse often lead the reader to find out these little circumstances in the dark and sometimes to his great confusion and perplexity sophia was very soon eased of her causeless fright by the entry of the noble peer who was not only an intimate acquaintance of mrs fitzpatrick but in reality a very particular friend of that lady to say truth it was by his assistance that she had been enabled to escape from her husband for this nobleman had the same gallant disposition with those renowned knights of whom we read in heroic story and had delivered many an imprisoned nymph from durance 
he was indeed as bitter an enemy to the savage authority too often exercised by husbands and fathers over the young and lovely of the other sex as ever knight errant was to the barbarous power of enchanters nay to say truth i have often suspected that those very enchanters with which romance everywhere abounds were in reality no other than the husbands of those days and matrimony itself was perhaps the enchanted castle in which the nymphs were said to be confined this nobleman had an estate in the neighbourhood of fitzpatrick and had been for some time acquainted with the lady no sooner therefore did he hear of her confinement than he earnestly applied himself to procure her liberty which he presently effected not by storming the castle according to the example of antient heroes but by corrupting the governor in conformity with the modern art of war in which craft is held to be preferable to valour and gold is found to be more irresistible than either lead or steel this circumstance however as the lady did not think it material enough to relate to her friend we would not at that time impart it to the reader we rather chose to leave him a while under a supposition that she had found or coined or by some very extraordinary perhaps supernatural means had possessed herself of the money with which she had brought her keeper than to interrupt her narrative by giving a hint of what seemed to her of too little importance to be mentioned the peer after a short conversation could not forbear expressing some surprise at meeting the lady in that place nor could he refrain from telling her he imagined she had been gone to bath mrs fitzpatrick very freely answered that she had been prevented in her purpose by the arrival of a person she need not mention in short says she i was overtaken by my husband for i need not affect to conceal what the world knows too well already i had the good fortune to escape in a most surprising manner and am now going to london with this young lady who is a near relation of mine and who hath escaped from as great a tyrant as my own his lordship concluding that this tyrant was likewise a husband made a speech full of compliments to both the ladies and as full of invectives against his own sex nor indeed did he avoid some oblique glances at the matrimonial institution itself and at the unjust powers given by it to man over the more sensible and more meritorious part of the species he ended his oration with an offer of his protection and of his coach and six which was instantly accepted by mrs fitzpatrick and at last upon her persuasions by sophia matters being thus adjusted his lordship took his leave and the ladies retired to rest where mrs fitzpatrick entertained her cousin with many high encomiums on the character of the noble peer and enlarged very particularly on his great fondness for his wife saying she believed he was almost the only person of high rank who was entirely constant to the marriage bed indeed added she my dear sophie that is a very rare virtue amongst men of condition never expect it when you marry for believe me if you do you will certainly be deceived a gentle sigh stole from sophia at these words which perhaps contributed to form a dream of no very pleasant kind but as she never revealed this dream to any one so the reader cannot expect to see it related here chapter nine the morning introduced in some pretty riding a stage-coach the civility of chambermaids the heroic temper of sophia her generosity the return to it the departure of the company and their arrival at london with some remarks for the use of travellers those members of society who are born to furnish the blessings of life now began to light their candles in order to pursue their daily labours for the use of those who are born to enjoy these blessings the sturdy hind now attends the levee of his fellow labourer the ox the cunning artificer the diligent mechanic spring from their hard mattress and now the bonny housemaid begins to repair the disordered drum-room while the riotous authors of that disorder in broken interrupted slumbers tumble and toss as if the hardness of down disquieted their repose in simple phrase the clock had no sooner struck seven than the ladies were ready for their journey and at their desire his lordship and his equipage were prepared to attend them and now a matter of some difficulty arose and this was how his lordship himself should be conveyed for though in stage-coaches where passengers are properly considered as so much luggage the ingenious coachman stows half a dozen with perfect ease into the place of four 
for well he contrives that the fat hostess or well-fed alderman may take up no more room than the slim miss or take her master it being the nature of guts when well squeezed to give way and to lie in a narrow compass yet in these vehicles which are called for distinction's sake gentlemen's coaches though they are often larger than the others this method of packing is never attempted his lordship would have put a short end to the difficulty by very gallantly desiring to mount his horse but mrs fitzpatrick would by no means consent to it it was therefore concluded that the abigail should by turns relieve each other on one of his lordship's horses which was presently equipped with a side saddle for that purpose everything being settled at the inn the ladies discharged their former guides and sophia made a present to the landlord partly to repair the bruise which he had received under herself and partly on account of what he had suffered under the hands of her enraged waiting woman and now sophia first discovered a loss which gave her some uneasiness and this was of the hundred pound bank bill which her father had given her at their last meeting and which within a very inconsiderable trifle was all the treasure she was at present worth she searched everywhere and shook and tumbled all her things to no purpose the bill was not to be found and she was at last fully persuaded that she had lost it from her pocket when she had the misfortune of tumbling from her horse in the dark lane as before recorded a fact that seemed the more probable as she now recollected some discomposure in her pockets which had happened at that time and the great difficulty with which she had drawn forth her handkerchief the very instant before her fall in order to relieve the distress of mrs fitzpatrick misfortunes of this kind whatever inconveniences they may be attended with are incapable of subduing a mind in which there is any strength without the assistance of avarice sophia therefore though nothing could be worse timed than this accident at such a season immediately got the better of her concern and with her wonted serenity and cheerfulness of countenance returned to her company his lordship conducted the ladies into the vehicle as he did likewise mrs honour who after many civilities and more dear madams at last yielded to the well-bred importunities of her sister abigail and submitted to be complimented with the first ride in the coach in which indeed she would afterwards have been contented to have pursued her whole journey had not her mistress after several fruitless intimations at length forced her to take her turn on horseback the coach now having received its company began to move forwards attended by many servants and led by two captains who had before rode with his lordship and who would have been dismissed from the vehicle upon a much less worthy occasion than was this of accommodating two ladies in this they acted only as gentlemen but they were ready at any time to have performed the office of a footman or indeed would have condescended lower for the honour of his lordship's company and for the convenience of his table my landlord was so pleased with the present he had received from sophia that he rather rejoiced in than regretted his bruise or his scratches the reader will perhaps be curious to know the quantum of this present but we cannot satisfy his curiosity whatever it was it satisfied the landlord for his bodily hurt but he lamented he had not known before how little the lady valued her money for to be sure says he one might have charged every article double and she would have made no cavil at the reckoning his wife however was far from drawing this conclusion whether she really felt any injury done to her husband more than he did himself i will not say certain it is she was much less satisfied with the generosity of sophia indeed cries she my dear the lady knows better how to dispose of her money than you imagine she might very well think we should not put up such a business without some satisfaction and the law would have cost her an infinite deal more than this poor little matter which i wonder you would take you are always so bloodily wise quoth the husband it would have cost her more would it dost fancy i don't know that as well as thee but would any of that more or so much have come into our pockets indeed if son tom the lawyer had been alive i could have been glad to have put such a pretty business into his hands he would have got a good picking out of it but i have no relation now who is a lawyer and why should i go to law for the benefit of strangers nay to be sure answered she you must know best i believe i do replied he 
i fancy when money is to be got i can smell it out as well as another everybody let me tell you would not have talked people out of this mind that i say everybody would not have cajoled this out of her mind that the wife then joined in the applause of her husband's sagacity and thus ended the short dialogue between them on this occasion we will therefore take our leave of these good people and attend his lordship and his fair companions who made such good expedition that they performed a journey of ninety miles in two days and on the second evening arrived in london without having encountered any one adventure on the road worth the dignity of this history to relate our pen therefore shall imitate the expedition which it describes and our history shall keep pace with the travellers who are its subject good writers will indeed do well to imitate the ingenious traveller in this instance who always proportions his stay at any place to the beauties elegancies and curiosities which it affords at Esher, at stowe at wilton at eastbury and at friars park days are too short for the ravished imagination while we admire the wondrous power of art in improving nature in some of these art chiefly engages our admiration in others nature and art contend for our applause but in the last the former seems to triumph here nature appears in her richest attire and art dressed with the modestest simplicity attends her benignant mistress here nature indeed pours forth the choicest treasures which she hath lavished on this world and here human nature presents you with an object which can be exceeded only in the other the same taste the same imagination which luxuriously riots in these elegant scenes can be amused with objects of far inferior note the woods the rivers the lawns of devon and of dorset attract the eye of the ingenious traveller and retard his pace which delay he afterwards compensates by swiftly scouring over the gloomy heath of bagshot or that pleasant plain which extends itself westward from stockbridge where no other object than one single tree only in sixteen miles presents itself to the view unless the clouds in compassion to our tired spirits kindly open their variegated mansions to our prospect not so travels the money meditating tradesman the sagacious justice the dignified doctor the warm-clad grazier with all the numerous offspring of wealth and dullness on they jog with equal pace through the verdant meadows or over the barren heath their horses measuring four miles and a half per hour with the utmost exactness the eyes of the beast and of his master being alike directed forwards and employed in contemplating the same objects in the same manner with equal rapture the good rider surveys the proudest boast of the architect and those fair buildings with which some unknown name hath adorned the rich clothing town where heaps of bricks are piled up as a kind of monument to show that heaps of money have been piled there before and now reader as we are in haste to attend our heroine we will leave to thy sagacity to apply all this to the bow ocean writers and to those authors who are their opposites this thou wilt be abundantly able to perform without our aid bestir thyself therefore on this occasion for though we will always lend thee proper assistance in difficult places as we do not like some others expect thee to use the arts of divination to discover our meaning yet we shall not indulge thy laziness where nothing but thy own attention is required for thou art highly mistaken if thou dost imagine that we intended when we began this great work to leave thy sagacity nothing to do or that without sometimes exercising this talent thou wilt be able to travel through our pages with any pleasure or profit to thyself and now reader as we are in haste to attend our heroine we will leave to thy sagacity to apply all this to the boeotian writers and to those authors who are their opposites this thou wilt have, this thou wilt be abundantly able to perform without our aid bestir thyself therefore on this occasion for though we will always lend thee proper assistance in difficult places as we do not like some others expect thee to use the arts of divination to discover our meaning yet we shall not indulge thy laziness where nothing but thy own attention is required for thou art highly mistaken if thou dost imagine that we intended when we began this great work to leave thy sagacity nothing to do or that without sometimes exercising this talent 
thou wilt be able to travel through our pages with any pleasure or profit to thyself. Chapter 10 Containing a hint or two concerning virtue and a few more concerning suspicion. Our company, being arrived at London, were sat down at his lordship's house, where, while they refreshed themselves after the fatigue of their journey, servants were dispatched to provide a lodging for the two ladies, for, as her ladyship was not then in town, Mrs. Fitzpatrick would by no means consent to accept a bed in the mansion of the peer. Some readers will, perhaps, condemn this extraordinary delicacy, as I may call it, of virtue, as too nice and scrupulous, but we must make allowances for her situation, which must be owned to have been very ticklish, and when we consider the malice of censorious tongues, we must allow, if it was a fault, the fault was an excess on the right side, in which every woman who is in the self-same situation will do well to imitate the most formal appearance of virtue when it is only an appearance may perhaps in very abstractive considerations seem to be rather less commendable than virtue itself without this formality but it will however be always more commended and this i believe will be granted by all that it is necessary unless in some very particular cases for every woman to support either the one or the other a lodging being prepared, Sophia accompanied her cousin for that evening, but resolved early in the morning to inquire after the lady into whose protection, as we have formerly mentioned, she had determined to throw herself when she quitted her father's house. And this she was the more eager in doing from some observations she had made during her journey in the coach. Now, as we would by no means fix the odious character of suspicion on Sophia, we are almost afraid to open to our reader the conceits which filled her mind concerning Mrs. Fitzpatrick, of whom she certainly entertained at present some doubts, which as they are very apt to enter into the bosoms of the worst of people. We think proper not to mention more plainly till we have first suggested a word or two to our reader touching suspicion in general. Of this there have always appeared to me to be two degrees. The first of these I choose to derive from the heart, as the extreme velocity of its discernment seems to denote some previous inward impulse, and the rather as this superlative degree often forms its own objects, sees what is not, and always more than really exists. This is that quick-sighted penetration whose hawk's eyes no symptom of evil can escape, which observes not only upon the actions, but upon the words and looks of men and as it proceeds from the heart of the observer so it dives into the heart of the observed and there spies evil as it were in the first embryo nay sometimes before it can be said to be conceived an admirable faculty if it were infallible but as this degree of perfection is not even claimed by more than one mortal being so from the fallibility of such acute discernment have arisen many sad mischiefs and most grievous heartaches to innocence and virtue I cannot help, therefore, regarding this vast quick-sightedness into evil as a vicious excess, and as a very pernicious evil in itself. And I am the more inclined to this opinion, as I am afraid it always proceeds from a bad heart, for the reasons I have above mentioned, and for one more, namely because I never knew it the property of a good one. Now, from this degree of suspicion, I entirely and absolutely acquit Sophia. A second degree of this quality seems to arise from the head. This is indeed no other than the faculty of seeing what is before your eyes, and of drawing conclusions from what you see. The former of these is unavoidable by those who have any eyes, and the latter is perhaps no less certain and necessary a consequence of our having any brains. This is altogether as bitter an enemy to guilt as the former is to innocence nor can I see it in an unamiable light, even though, through human fallibility, it should be sometimes mistaken. For instance, if a husband should accidentally surprise his wife in the lap or in the embraces of some of those pretty young gentlemen who profess the art of cuckold making, I should not highly, I think, blame him for concluding something more than what he saw from the familiarities which he really had seen, and which we are at least favourable enough to when we call them innocent freedoms. 
the reader will easily suggest great plenty of instances to himself i shall add but one more which however unchristian it may be thought by some i cannot help esteeming to be strictly justifiable and this is a suspicion that a man is capable of doing what he hath done already and that it is possible for one who has been a villain once to act the same part again and to confess the truth of this degree of suspicion i believe sophia was guilty from this degree of suspicion she had in fact conceived an opinion that her cousin was really not better than she should be the case it seems was this mrs fitzpatrick wisely considered that the virtue of a young lady is in the world in the same situation with a poor hare which is certain whenever it ventures abroad to meet its enemies for it can hardly meet any other no sooner therefore was she determined to take the first opportunity of quitting the protection of her husband than she resolved to cast herself under the protection of some other man and whom could she so properly choose to be her guardian as a person of quality of fortune of honour and who besides a gallant disposition which inclines men to knight errantry that is to be the champions of ladies in distress had often declared a violent attachment to herself and had already given her all the instances of it in his power but as the law hath foolishly omitted this office of vice-husband or guardian to an eloped lady and as malice is apt to denominate him by a more disagreeable appellation it was concluded that his lordship should perform all such kind offices to the lady in secret and without publicly assuming the character of her protector nay to prevent any other person from seeing him in this light it was agreed that the lady should proceed directly to bath and that his lordship should first go to london and then should go down to that place by the advice of his physicians now all this sophia very plainly understood not from the lips or behaviour of mrs fitzpatrick but from the peer who was infinitely less expert at retaining a secret than was the good lady and perhaps the exact secrecy which mrs fitzpatrick had observed on this head in her narrative served not a little to heighten those suspicions which were now risen in the mind of her cousin sophia very easily found out the lady she sought for indeed there was not a chairman in town to whom her house was not perfectly well known and as she received in return of her first message a most pressing invitation she immediately accepted it mrs fitzpatrick indeed did not desire her cousin to stay with her with more earnestness than civility required whether she had discerned and resented the suspicion above mentioned or from what other motive it arose i cannot say but certain it is she was full as desirous of parting with sophia as sophia herself could be of going the young lady when she came to take leave of her cousin could not avoid giving her a short hint of advice she begged her for heaven's sake to take care of herself and to consider in how dangerous a situation she stood adding she hoped some method would be found of reconciling her to her husband you must remember my dear says she the maxim which my aunt western had so often repeated to us both that whenever the matrimonial alliance is broke and war declared between husband and wife she can hardly make a disadvantageous peace for herself on any conditions these are my aunt's very words and she hath had a great deal of experience in the world mrs fitzpatrick answered with a contemptuous smile never fear me child take care of yourself for you are younger than i i will come and visit you in a few days but dear sophie let me give you one piece of advice leave the character of grave heirs in the country for believe me it will sit very awkwardly upon you in this town thus the two cousins parted and sophia repaired directly to lady bellaston where she found a most hearty as well as a most polite welcome the lady had taken a great fancy to her when she had seen her formerly with her aunt western she was indeed extremely glad to see her and was no sooner acquainted with the reasons which induced her to leave the squire and to fly to london that she highly applauded her sense and resolution and after expressing the highest satisfaction in the opinion which sophia had declared she entertained of her ladyship by choosing her house for an asylum she promised her all the protection which it was in her power to give as we have now brought sophia into safe hands the reader will i apprehend be contented to deposit her there a while and to look a little after other personages 
particularly poor Jones, whom we have left long enough to do penance for his past offences, which, as is the nature of vice, brought sufficient punishment upon him themselves. End of section 40